It can't be that horrendous. Surely it can't. One eternity later. Now there is no hope. I mean, I knew it was going to be bad. Everyone knew, ever since the first teaser. You didn't have to be a genius or read between the lines. The omens of disaster were blatantly on show, center stage, with a huge neon sign just screaming stay the hell away, with legendary lines such as these. It's a very modern reflection of the world. Our characters are really diverse, our cast is really diverse, and that's one of the things that excited me the most about it. We are 50% female in all the creative roles, and our writer's room is 100% female. Placing identity and representation over the story, so we know the priorities are catastrophic. The fact that Crunchyroll Originals is doing this as a 2D animated series, it's giving us an opportunity to do things artistically, that a lot of other shows and other studios really have forgotten how to do. Yes, this show is going to save the animation industry single-handedly. They are going to bring back the ancient forgotten knowledge and amaze us all with unmatched artistic vision. Look at it! Look at it! I want all of you to look at it! It's not like the entirety of anime is a thing that exists. And all those indie games with fantastic art direction? Forget about those, this crew will show everyone how it's done. But even after all that, I still went into this with temper temper. I assumed it would be good for a laugh or few. A lame cringe fest. Ultimately harmless. Nothing more, nothing less. My expectations were as low as one can realistically go. Something like this is impossible to mess up all too badly. It's just some girls going to a fantasy school. However, it turned out to be so much... So much less than I expected. It will never cease to amaze me how much money and opportunities get thrown down the well by these large companies. Each year, consistently, given to people with no vision nor voice to bring their half-baked ideas and derivative OCs to life. The story with this one goes that the creator had already pitched this thing around years back, and got rejected, and for good reason, there is nothing here. Every idea in this show is as bland and generic as they come. The person who is supposed to be the gushing heart and soul behind this story had no inspiration making this, Something that's been cooking for several years should inherently have vastly more substance, even without the aid of a full writing staff. That should have been the first warning sign to anyone in charge of the money. This creative has no passion for creating. At best they have a passion for the status of seeming passionate. They get off from having a product to their name, Rather than placing themselves under any kind of scrutiny, improving, actually creating something, everyone who ever rejected this show dodged a bullet. And yet, it somehow finally got greenlit. I cannot fathom how. This entire thing was an embarrassment to Crunchyroll from the start, and it should have been axed, since clearly no one involved in the production had any clue what they were doing. But as the teaser proudly proclaimed, the staff wasn't hired for merit, but rather a selection of other, more pressing qualities in our day and age. As it is, High Guardian Spice is one of the most abysmal stories to ever be gifted a budget. It's got some stiff competition, no doubt. I'm an expert. A lot of shit, because I do it infinitely more than you. But it sits firmly, and dishonorably among the worst of the worst. Far as I see it, a simple way to examine the worth of any story is to pinpoint what it's aiming to do, and then assess how well it fares in that regard. Obviously, this varies from product to product, but there are a few fundamental, universal points every storyteller is aiming to nail. Namely, 
Comedy is trying to make us laugh. Dramatic story elements are supposed to be taken seriously. Facts about the world should be consistent between scenes. And the cast of characters ought to be people we wish to spend time learning about and getting invested in. Or to put it plainly, you might present a rhetorical question to the author. Is your story supposed to be retarded? And when they answer, because they do not in fact know how rhetorical questions work, no, of course not, then we have a problem, because the obvious follow-up question is, then why is your story being retarded every chance it gets? You see, it's not just one thing, or two things, or even a dozen things, it is all of the things. This show fails at everything a story possibly can. It is a miserable experience to sit through. You may be looking at the runtime of this video and thinking to yourself, really? Is that truly warranted? Yes, very much so. And the reason is twofold. First of all, no matter how horrid a product may end up being, no matter how many brain cells it has collectively killed from the audience so lacking in self-preservation to endure it to the end, it can still be turned into something of value. Seeing a person express their distaste for subpar stories is entertaining, it offers catharsis, knowing that you are not alone, it's okay, you weren't imagining things, we all see it, it is actually that bad. And it can also act as a potent example for anyone out there aiming to improve their own craft. So consider this equal parts a reenactment of my personal spiral into insanity watching this show, as well as an extremely long lesson about everything a storyteller should avoid doing. Now the second reason is much more straightforward as is the case with every single pop culture product ever produced, the show does have its defenders, and it's alright if you like it, I question your taste, but whatever you personally enjoy is your business, I just hope you'll be able to keep your standards consistent, but the show is a failure, it is awful, it is a horrid story, told badly, nothing about it functions, it is not good by any objective metric. So, when this show inevitably gets its second wind, so to speak, in the counterculture of opinion, people saying that it was judged too harshly, or that it is underrated, let this massive compilation of evidence act as a crushing counter to any such notion, if anyone tries to tell you that High Guardian Spice is anything above an abject abomination of storytelling, point them here. The conversation about this show is not over, no story will ever enjoy that status. Even at this colossal length, this is not the end, this video is not exhaustive, I would never claim something so pompous, it is simply massive and the most detailed examination of the show's failings, at least for the time being. Also, something to clarify before we dive in, in case you are a new viewer and have just stumbled into this madness by the graces of the algorithm, first of all, welcome, it's wonderful to have you, and this massive critique is actually a compilation of several bite-sized videos I made across a little over a year, it's the culmination of countless hours of writing, redrafting, and editing, effort that was made actually bearable by the constant feedback and support from you, the viewers. So whether you are a veteran or new to the channel, thank you for lending an ear, and I hope you enjoy your stay. Please do share your own thoughts down in the comments section, about everything and anything, that's what it's there for. I happen to be in the happy position of being a small crustacean in a large pond, so I'm able to read every comment I receive. But that's enough preamble, we got a long way ahead of us, let's get to it. So what is this fake anime actually about? 
Well, the premise is that there's a group of girls and other adjacent creatures who enroll to a magical school where they'll train to be quote-unquote guardians. Which means they'll be guarding something, I guess. It's never truly explained. The premise itself is already as hackneyed as it comes, devoid of any flavor or vision of its own. Just like 90% of anime. But in any case, we open on a golden sunrise, as the primary protag duo of our tale, Rosemary and Sage, are about to set out from their humble quiet hometown to the bustling capital of the land, where they'll attend the esteemed academy of the magical guardians for confusing and never fully explained reasons. Character introductions are a pivotal point of any story, especially when it comes to your protags. You only get to make first impressions once. So let's see how the show decides to sell their most essential characters to us. Sage, it's finally here! Can you believe it? I almost can't. We've been preparing our, oh. our whole lives for this day. Did you pack your teeth? Tooth? Your toothpaste. Ooh, I'm nervous. We'll scale mountains and fight mermaids and explore precipices and crevices and... and... We'll be totally fearsome dudes. <laughs> <laughs> totally fearsome dudes. Hi, Guardian! Whoa! <sighs> Putting aside the fact that our protag just fell down after bumping into a ghost... The dialogue is absolutely dreadful right from the beginning. The first seconds of the show, and it's just pure auditory diarrhea. The entire attempted premise is painfully clear. Oh hee hee, look at us. Aren't we silly and quirky and unassuming and likable when we say nonsensical stuff? Yeah, the problem comes from the fact that I believed none of it. It's so clearly written to be quirky for the sake of being quirky. There's no natural flow between the remarks. It's just one stupid non sequitur comment after the other. No one talks like this. And furthermore, why the hell are you having this conversation now? You have already met up earlier, walked from your homes for who knows how long side by side, and are just now suddenly declaring your excitement for the journey to come? In the most boring obvious way possible? And the forced dialogue is only the first half of this shit introduction Sunday. As you surely noticed, our fearless main heroine is so retarded that she managed to trip over herself whilst walking down a smooth, clean dirt road with no kind of obstacle in sight. Now there is an easy explanation for this. You see, it has been widely accepted in the anime pillow-humping troglodyte community that girls being clumsy and silly and all-around derp makes them totally... <coughs> kawaii desune. You'll excuse my lacking fluidity in weep linguistics. It basically means dumb girls are cute. I have personally never subscribed to this mentality, partly due to the fact that my brain chemistry is in fact in working order, and as such I only get annoyed when people act retarded. And also from the general why sensation it gives off. There's something off about the whole thing. In a well-written scenario, giving a character the attribute of clumsy can work. If it is truly a core aspect of their being, it should inform future scenarios as well, lead into conflict, be a hindrance to the character when trying to achieve their goals, and so forth. However, that is not the case here. Rosemary's alleged clumsiness, as seen in her introduction, is only placed there in a superficial attempt to gather titters and goodwill from the audience. Oh, well isn't she a humble fun bundle of joy? As the series progresses, Rosemary showcases clumsiness only when the show requires it, which is always some lame and tired slapstick routine with no relevance to the story. Whenever there's anything important to be done to progress the narrative, Rosemary is always perfectly capable and never fails because of her alleged derpness. The introduction of the character is in direct opposition to her actual portrayal in the rest of the show. So to put it simply, the creators of the show make Rosemary fall to the ground only to make her seem more funny and happy-go-lucky and all-around appealing. Stolen from the show's an aesthetic they try to emulate, executed as shallow as it can be. 
and it's not helped by the fact that the main heroine of the show sounds like her balls are about to drop. <gasps> no! Why on earth would you give your lady protagonist the voice of Ash motherfucking Ketchum? Do you realize that I'm forced to listen to that ear raping shit for the next four hours? Four hours of this. Wanna go see the market? And the gardens. And the castle. We don't need seats. We're future guardians. Wah! I like being surprised. Wah! I like being surprised. Wah! We're guardians in training. Wanna go see the I market? Sit on each other's Wah! Wah! And the castle. At the same time. My friend. <laughs> <laughs> you. From the very beginning, the show tips its hand as being utterly derivative, lacking any genuine heart or vision. It's just incompetence throughout. This is the standard we are going with. Strap in for a painful ride. Oh, 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 and Sage? She has the personality of a hanky that's been blown into. By Joe Biden. So the girls say goodbye to their loving and supporting families and set out on their journey. And I hope you've got your fill of these wonderfully fully fledged characters, such as Man 1, Woman 1, Man 2, and whatever the hell Tumblr thinks counts as a teenage boy, cause none of them will contribute to the story in any way further down the line. It is such a sweet sorrow to depart from a place and people I know absolutely nothing about. Something of note is Rosemary's father pointing out the locket she carries, which sets up the... conflict of the opening episode. He also brings up Rosemary's mother, who is... somewhere? More on all that later. So the girls hop on a cart and wave their goodbyes and... Are you kidding me with that shit? This is as good of a time as any to go over the visual side of things. Put it simply, the show is well below industry standard. Everyone knows it, everyone sees it, it's the first thing anyone points out about the show. However, there is a bit of nuance to be noted. First of all, I'm gonna separate the terms art direction and animation into two categories of discussion. The reason for this is twofold. One, that's actually how this works. The duty of designing characters and the environments and the creatures and what have you is a different job from actually making everything fit together and animate smoothly. The second reason is that on one of these fields the series does decently slash not awful all the time while utterly failing in the other. Can you guess which is which? Well, let's look at the art direction of the series first and foremost. On a conceptual level, the character designs as a whole range from okay to serviceable to Tumblr art self-parody shit tier. It's a mixed bag. There is a whole can full of subjectivity worms to be opened when discussing preferences in visual forms of art. For me, some designs are fine, others make me puke. <laughs> However, for a good chunk of the time, it's easy to read what each character is supposed to be about from a glance. Which is the main reason to populate a show with exaggerated designs, rather than generic looking guys and gals. Visual medium, so we are gonna communicate parts of the characterization via visuals. Obvious, entry level stuff. So here's where I'm gonna offer my one and only compliment for the show. It's a backhanded one, but a compliment nonetheless. The background art, environments, the towns, the world design, stuff like that. That's all perfectly acceptable. Ignore everything else, just look at the backgrounds. No one in their right mind would call this bad. It's not like it'll set your world on fire, the inspiration behind it is as generic as it comes. But it all looks nice. What it's supposed to look like. It's solid, and in a show like this, that is a rare solace. So here's the backhanded part. The fact that the background art is actually decent makes it criminal that you'd ever smear the rest of your shit all over it. You just wasted someone's effort by associating them with the rest of this fuckness. You wasted someone's time. These people here. All of them. You wasted all of their time. You should be ashamed of yourselves. And as for the other half of the visual equation, yeah, the animation is stiff and crude and amateurish, and any other insult you may think of. 
it's not even about the missing frames or the multitude of animation errors. It's the style itself. There's no energy, no elasticity to any of the movements. The shots are flat and boring, and everything just has this sterile feel to it. It's just going through the motions, pun very much intended, while adding as little effort and flair as humanly possible to barely qualify as an animated show. It lacks the heart that makes animation a worthwhile medium in the first place. Not that visuals and pristine animation are what makes a show good or bad. Far from it. Some of the movies and shows with the most painstakingly detailed and meticulous animation are utterly hollow story-wise. I would even go so far as to say many of them are utter shit. On the other hand, in a different timeline, if High Guardian Spice was an indie project premiering on YouTube or some such, I am absolutely certain it would have gotten a much kinder reception. That's just how the gingerbread crumbles. But returning back to the actual Spice, there is no justification for a commercially published product released in 2021 with a huge evil corporation funding it to be looking so lackluster. The wonky animation lifts its ugly head often enough to be distracting, absolutely. Even if the story wasn't shit as it is. But that's what you get when your creative team consists of mentally challenged feminist land whales and money-grubbing spinsters. And that's no joke. Do you know who this dustbag is? Do you know who that is? That's Margaret Flippin' Dean. The president of WIA. You know, the women's advocacy organization focusing on spewing empty words and swindling money from its members while offering no actual help or support of any kind. Just like all workers' unions. Forget Anita Sarkeesian, this is the main cunt sitting on a throne of stolen money. And now she's heading this clusterfuck project. I'm utterly convinced that High Guardian Spice is some kind of money laundering scheme, like in the movie The Producers. All the money intended for animation was probably used on cocaine and fucking kitty litter and dildos shaped like Kamala Harris's nose. Anyway, that's the long and short of it. The creators are talentless charlatans, the animation is horrid, the art is so-so at best, and none of that can make or break the series, because you cannot save a story with visuals. That's the important takeaway. I cannot emphasize that enough. I honestly do not care about visuals if the story is good. I do, however, care if the story is garbage, no matter how pretty the veneer is. Animation is a beautiful and fantastic medium. It allows us to realize basically anything, no matter how otherworldly or down to earth. It's inherently the medium of absolute creative freedom. Some of my favorite stories ever come from this art form. Yet, each of my favorite stories adhere to a singular truth. Beauty comes from the power of the story itself, not a sleek presentation. These are my standards. I don't care to live by any others. I won't mention the visuals again, you can all see them plainly yourself. What I will do is squeeze all the enjoyment I can get from this waste of space on my hard drive! line? Are you like gonna spend the rest of your life in school? I thought it was only for a year. The show said so not a minute ago. A whole year away from old Pebble, Rosemary. Then again, this is a wannabe anime. And the anime industry seems to have this undying notion that life begins and ends at high school. So I guess that sounds about right. And speaking of wannabe anime, 
we've reached the end of our cold opening and are treated to the gloriously pedestrian opening theme song. This series wishes so fiercely that it was a proper anime from the land of the rising sun, it's just puke inducing. All the overused cliches that should have already become fucking memes are jammed into this one opening. You could make a drinking game out of it. There's random running with your friends, establishing shots of said friends, showcasing their one and only defining character trait, roll call shots of people showcasing their skills, half of which don't matter in the story, an absolute truckload of random NPC characters, villains looming all menacing like, as if they are some kind of serious threat, even though they get trashed immediately after they are introduced. You get the idea. I actually wish I had recorded me and my girlfriend watching this shite for the first time. There's this one part, this shot right here, and my girl was all, Oh wow, they actually got some handsome prince guy in this show? And I was like, that's the Protax mom. And I swear, her face just fucking melted. It was the funniest shit ever. Oh yeah, and by the by, that is Rosemary's mom. That's a lady. Whatever you say, show. Whatever you say. And on top of all of that, we also have one of the most hilariously awful opening songs I have ever heard in an animated series. Just listen to these lyrics. All of the dreams will still come true if we only try. All of our hopes come shining through. Just look into my eyes. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, okay, okay, okay. I get that you're trying to be all cutesy and bubbly and shit, but give it a fucking rest. Try hard doesn't even come close to describing this shit. It's utter trash. The only thing I can think of in recent memory that tops this in pure suffering would be that goddamn ear cancer from Smash Ultimate. But why? Why would you do that? Why would you do any of that? But back to the main dish at hand. The opening is utterly devoid of its own vision or identity. It's just imitating the most obvious and boring visual cues of anime, while somehow managing to make everything even more bland than its inspiration already is. It's an apt microcosm of the entire series we are about to suffer through. So, in a way, they actually did an excellent job. Slow claps all around. Might as well mention the rest of the music while I'm at it. Well, it's... certainly music. Not bad, not great, just music. The soundtrack is exactly what you would expect imagining. Generic high fantasy noise. It's perfectly forgettable. The only barely notable tune would be... The one tune they lifted from somewhere else. Parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. Because of our names. Not carrying any kind of meaning, just existing. A reference towards something that came before, and people enjoy. Again, fitting. Anyway. The first episode is titled Journey to Lingarf. Ah, I see. The opening chapter is all about the journey to the capital and the academy. We get an entire episode exploring the wider realm the show takes place in, meet different characters, get to see how they live, maybe there's some kind of trouble like a monster attack or some such, and the heroes get to showcase just how heroic and capable they are. It's gonna be something like that, right? Well, no. The journey lasts a whopping 3 minutes and 30 seconds out of a 20 minute episode. And what happens on this stretch of minutes? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. 
The bulk of the episode is spent at Lingarf. So why the fuck is the episode called Journey to Lingarf? It should be called at Lingarf. Or the city of Lingarf. Or what the fuck, who the fuck funded this fucking fuckness to Lingarf? Or something like that. Even the tiniest, most insignificant details of this show are decided by drool brains. But let's rewind a bit. Is there anything actually worth discussing from the journey portion of this journey? Yes, in the sense that every second of this show fails utterly at what it aims to do, and I wish to document it all and make fun of it. It's almost fascinating how much lameness can be shoved on screen at such consistent rate. We don't need seats. We're future guardians. Most guardians can afford seats. We're guardians in training. We're gonna sit on each other's laps at the same time. Oh ha 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 ha. Aren't you funny and precious when you say nonsensical things? Saying random things is the pinnacle of comedy. Just ask Sizu. Impressed, huh? Oh wait till you see my backstroke. I'm a wicked when I hit that liquid. I got water skills that kill. I slaughter when I hit the water. My little pony fuck. Hurry! We can be first on the train. <laughs> huh? Let's cut the line. Rosemary, that would be wrong. <laughs> Sorry! I'm thinking we should cut the line. Okay, so the execution of this joke is rather confusing. The premise is fine. Rosemary wants to cut the line and get on the train fast because she's impatient. Sure, makes sense. But Sage doesn't want to cut the line because she's a nice and relatively timid girl compared to her rambunctious friend. Again, this part makes sense. We got a contrasting pair of travelers dealing with a common dilemma. There's some material for actual comedy here. The confusing part comes from the inciting incident leading into the actual punchline. Why does the troll making people wait for Sage to fold on her principles that quickly? It makes no sense. She was already primed to wait in line, but she's not willing to wait for a few moments extra? However long it takes to get the fat ass unstuck? It doesn't follow any kind of logic or characterization through line. The key to character-based comedy is to be consistent with how these specific people would realistically act in a given situation. Here, let me fix this joke for you. The setup is exactly the same, Rosemary wants to cut, Sage is like nah. What I would do is switch the event leading into the punchline. Instead of being forced to wait in line slightly longer, I would add some kind of unpleasant element into the waiting itself. Something like an annoying person, a drunken loudmouth, a bad troubadour, some kind of horrific monster just creepily staring at them, someone farting at their faces, it could be anything. Just something that drives Sage over the edge and makes her no longer wish to wait in the line. That's an effective heel turn. I can't guarantee that it would make everyone in the audience titter, but at least it would be functional as comedy. You might not have thought about it, but the best comedy always has an element of relatability to it. And the most effective way to make the audience relate to the scenario is to make it follow a clear cause and effect. Oftentimes, this includes the component of unpleasantness. Or to put it more simplistically, pain. Because every sane person wants to avoid pain. When we see someone in an unpleasant scenario, their drive to free themselves from that scenario is what creates drama and investment. That's why slapstick comedy is so popular and effective. It's the most blunt execution of comedy fundamentals. And it's also why racist jokes are so damn funny. You know, because they are all true. Ah, oh, derka derka derka. Okie doke, lesson over. Back to this shit. So aside from bland jokes that don't land because the writers clearly do not know what they're doing, we get bland and basic world building that still manages to make no sense because the writers clearly do not know what they're doing. We get endless shots of the most basic JRPG starter map designs as we travel the land in cart, in another cart, on a train, on a train, still on a train, 
And a... Wait, 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 wait. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Hold the fuck up. What the hell is that? Why the fuck would you build a troll-operated, hand-cranked, elevator gondola thing when you've clearly passed the technological threshold to be able to build steam engines? And you have flying brooms! You can fly in this universe! Not to mention the fact that the magic system of this show is utterly broken and allows anyone to do absolutely anything they wish with no restrictions, but that's a topic for later. The point is there should be no need for manual jobs like this. There's this scene where Rosemary and Sage gaze back on their hometown and share a small somber moment as their new life is about to unfold. Pebble looks so... small. I guess it was small the whole time. And we just didn't know. Now in a better written show, something like this could work. It could even be quite a powerful moment. The problem comes from the fact that we as audience don't know anything about the town of Pebble. We don't know what the girl's life was like growing up there, we don't know any of the townsfolk, we have no context for what exactly the girls are leaving behind. It's just the most generic, goodbye, now sad, moment you could ever conceive. A fantastic example of something like this done right is found from none other than the grandest fantasy story ever put on paper, Lord of the Rings. As Sam and Frodo leave the comforts of home behind and embark on their quest, we get this marvelous bit. This is it. This is what? If I take one more step, it'll be the farthest away from home I've ever been. The reason a moment like this resonates with the audience is that we know exactly what this milestone means to the characters. In the first movie of the trilogy, we get a full half an hour establishing Shire and the life there as idyllic and wonderful. Friends, family, possible love, a promise of a long and happy life, it's as close to a paradise as you can realistically get. There is weight when the heroes are forced to leave it behind and step into the unknown. And there's of course also the fact that they are hunted by bloodthirsty wraiths, and the fate of the entire realm rests on their shoulders, making the journey even more harrowing. Meanwhile the Spice Girls are leaving an undefined existence behind, so that they can go to school. Who the hell cares? If you are beginning your story with low stakes, then you better make damn sure we are at least empathizing with the characters from the start. Otherwise, moments like this will ring out hollow. You can't just say the characters feel solemn, you have to show why that would be the case. Place the motivations of the heroes on screen. This is the most basic show don't tell scenario there is. The final bit I'll touch upon, which happens along the journey to Lingarf, is not really a critique, more of an observation. At least for now. At the end of that whole waiting in the line fiasco, Sage is revealed to be a skilled handler of her flying broomstick. Even with Rosemary as a backseat driver, she zooms around with no trouble whatsoever. I'll just leave it at that. That is now an established fact. I just hope nothing comes to muddle this fact further down the line. Oh and yes, the clumsy Rosemary is just perfectly fine balancing on the flying thin strip of wood. Consistency! Also, this guy has the worst job in all existence, staring down a reindeer's anus all day long. So the girls arrive at the big city, where they are met by Sage's cousin and wife with whom the girls will be staying before attending school. Well, ain't that nice? Question. Something the show doesn't make clear right away, while being extremely vital detail, is the fact that the school actually offers accommodation for the students. The girls will be staying at the school campus for the majority of the show. So why write this story beat in the first place? The staying at relatives part, I mean. Why not just streamline things and make it so that the girls arrive at the school at the appropriate hour, get their housing sorted out, and just attend the academy straight away? 
there's nothing of importance that happens before. And it's not like introducing the butch lesbian and her scissoring partner has any significance. These two have absolutely no bearing on the story. They don't add anything to the narrative, they got no story or arc of their own, even their personality starts and ends on the fact that they are indeed a lesbian couple. They are utterly superfluous characters. Why waste time on all this? Well, I just answered my own question, didn't I? It's representation. And by the logic of untalented piece of shit hack writers, that in and of itself is meaningful. It's a very modern reflection of the world. Our characters are really diverse, our cast is really diverse, and that's one of the things that excited me the most about it. According to them, apparently, the point of characters isn't telling stories, but simply having them. I for one would never tokenize my characters like this. Seriously, free advice. If your characters can be dusted from existence, and your story remains exactly the same, then you should definitely do it. Give the screen time to characters and events that actually deserve it. A dozen 20 minute episodes is not really all that much time, especially when juggling a wide cast of characters and trying to introduce a brand new world. So it's better to get the story going fast. As we'll discover going forth, this show wastes so much time on lame useless crap, that at the end of the day nothing will be accomplished. All the characters have the complexity and charisma of a moldy piece of toast, and the world building is non-existent. Whenever it's not contradictory and perplexing, that is. The time spent with the useless dykes, for example, is time that could have been spent fleshing out anything else. So while we are on the roll of introducing every single problem the series drowns in throughout its run, bad characterization, insipid jokes, horrid animation, and a general feeling of oh god why am I watching this, the first episode also decides to utterly decimate the world building in one fell swoop. There is a spell that manifests a portal, which allows the caster to break the laws of space and time, and just hop anywhere they wish to be. It activates in a second, takes no energy to wield, and is all around just a casual thing. And yet, this is the only instance we ever see it used. As a teleporter in this one house. What? The actual... FUCK! Do these other gutter brains making this shit realize at all what they are doing? You cannot have something like this be a casual thing that just exists. Do you have any idea how useful something like this would be? Instantly leaping from one place to another? If people can just conjure up these doors at will, they would be used for everything. There would never be need for trains and wagons and fucking troll operated gondola lifts ever again. Facilities like schools would be riddled with these. Think how much more compact everything would be built if there was no longer need for hallways or staircases or elevators. Entire fucking towns would be nothing but interdimensional doors in endless rows. The world would be unrecognizable after this kind of discovery. And that's just the beginning. People would absolutely weaponize this shit. They would throw doors at each other and have them lead into rooms filled with blades or dynamite or sharks or laser beams or pedophiles or anything else to fuck your enemies up. Or better yet, just drop your enemies on top of an active volcano. And if you can create something like this with no penalty, no incantation, no materials, no toll of any kind, then what else can you do? Stitching distant points of space together is already as complex as it comes, but there's also flying, lightning casting, conjuring weapons, pyromancy, hydrokinesis, and growing dicks out of thin air! Oh yes, we'll get to that! The magic in this universe is boundless, which is a horrid decision when creating any story. Just think about it. Magic is not rare, it's everywhere. These civilians are able to craft portals which they use casually in place of the stairs for fuck's sake. By all logic, 
Veteran Archmages should be exponentially more powerful. Whenever there's a problem in this show, and it's not immediately fixed by professional mages with a simple flick of the wrist, it makes it so that every character in the show is utterly retarded for not thinking of it. It's like if you had a character with toothache, and yet they refuse to go fix it in a setting where every single rando on the street is a fucking dentist! Spoilers, that's exactly what happens in every single episode of this show. You cannot do this shit! There has to be rules and severe limitations to your magic system, otherwise you kill the investment of anyone with even half a brain. And no, it's not like this is the only show that tries to get away with this horse shit. Everything from fucking Harry Potter to the whole genre of light novel battle school anime harem bollocks has the same fuck up. The author just throws in all this shit that sounds and looks cool without putting even a second of thought into how it would impact the world. Anything can happen, yet the most obvious logical thing never happens, because nobody cares. Except for me. How the fuck is it possible that Full Metal Alchemist is the only show in existence that even tries to have a magic system with actual rules? And even that has some issues. This is yet another derivative element High Guardian shite steals from all the stories that have come before it, while creating a new gold standard in sucking. Congratulations! Oh, and these two dyke fucks are real assholes. They make Rosemary and Sage purposefully climb to the topmost floor of their million dollar fantasy Hollywood fuck grip, only to use a fucking portal to send them to their guest room. Why? Just use the spell on the ground floor, you miserable cunts! And why the fuck do you have a wedding portrait of you two decorating a guest room? Who the fuck does that? Oh yeah, we are lesbians, and don't you fucking forget it even for a second! God, I fucking hate this fucking show! We are still in the first episode! Fuck! You know what? I don't have to do this. I really don't. I could just put this here, right over here. And every time this show makes me want to kill myself, I'll just add one massive groan to the counter. Here goes. <sighs> there. That's all the review this show deserves. Cause it's not gonna get any better. I know it won't. And yet, I'll keep going. Why? Because even at the face of the most grueling of tasks, a true champion of the people never backs down. No matter how much I wish to boil myself alive, I won't abandon my quest, my calling, to see this massive monstrosity of monetization with its multitude of members and malicious malarkey utterly slain. And even if it costs me my sanity, the generations that'll come after will surely remember my name. As a self-destructive cynical asshole, but still. Never give up. Never surrender. Embrace your dreams. And no matter what happens, protect your honor. As a reviewer. That's what heroes do. Oh my word! What is that? <laughs> Maybe it's got rabies! LOL fuck my life. On the first night away from home, Rosemary has a dream about her mummy dearest. It's one of those awkward writing tropes where it's painfully clear the nightmare is just a plot exposition dump. One moment it's disgustingly literal, before suddenly turning all abstract, while still retaining its symbolism on a level that even a toddler can decipher. 
Rosemary's mom used to be a guardian, then disappeared all of a sudden, to where nobody knows. So we get our heroine's motive, her driving desire, to hold up her mother's legacy as a guardian for confusing and never fully explained jurisdiction, while also hoping to one day reunite with her. As character motives go, this is as basic as you can get. Not bad per se, it's understandable, but it's still just a big bland nothing burger, since there really isn't anything special or interesting about Rosemary's relationship to her mother. For what little we get to see, the two of them are just a basic loving caring mother and daughter, and Rosemary wishes to be just like her mother, and never even struggles to measure up to her. There's nothing to chew, nothing to ponder, and aside from the droplets in Rosemary's eyes, there's really not even any sense of palpable loss. Rosemary is the same girl with or without her mother. The alleged loss has clearly not affected her persona in any way, which is just laziness on top of laziness. The mother is more of a MacGuffin, rather than an actual person we should care about. We as audience should be yearning for the reunion alongside the characters, but it's impossible to summon any investment when I can already picture the event, and all there can realistically be is a hug and a sup. And the enigmatic disappearance itself is just mystery box bait, and just like we've already learned from the ever-reliable Juju Abrams, mystery boxes are always filled with wonderful story developments, and never amount to pure shit in your ears, eyes and mouth. Yes, Star Wars was so bad I could taste the filth. I swear, every story element feels like the author didn't even want to write an actual story, but rather just find an excuse to shove as many female characters on screen as physically possible. Oh, wait! Wah! We're in Lingarth! Huh. What's that? We're here. Ah, okay, so that's where the animation budget went. Into this Pantene commercial. Nice. Too bad you couldn't save any for the Keebler cookies. Look at that shit. Infinite cookies. Gives me ruby flashbacks. Okay, okay, last time I rag on the visuals, I swear. Pincer on chest. After a bite of breakfast, the girls head out to explore Lingarf, looking for trouble. Finally. Perhaps the episode can begin now. Maybe we can get some actual content for a change. Some kind of stakes. Conflict. Anything. What, what? What? Why? Why are you so impressed by grapes? Do you not have grapes in Pebble? But if you don't have grapes, then you don't have wine. And if you don't have wine, then what the hell did your dad use to get drunk enough to be able to stick his dick in that? Twice! Seriously, why are you acting like this is the grandest sight since the Northern Lights in the Dead of Winter? It's just a market. There's like five people. What is so impressive here? I do not understand. What kind of shithole is your hometown if this is awe-inspiring to you? Okay, so finally, finally, finally we get something that resembles an actual conflict. Rosemary passes out with her sword and nearly decapitates this random passerby. Only it's not a random passerby, but the third member of our to-be quartet of protags, Fime. What a wacky go dig to be running into the one person who's gonna be your most vital schoolmate a day before in this huge city. What are the odds? As one might assume, Fime doesn't take kindly to the attempted manslaughter and she instantly becomes my favorite character if only for the simple fact that she tells both Rosemary and Sage off for being the dim with pumpkins that they are. Might want to watch where you swing that thing because of how it's a giant sword. It's not a giant sword. She's just shorter than you. Good job, baby crone. They say the best way to win an argument is pedantically. Now this scene fizzles out in an instant and only serves to set up some lukewarm antagonism between the girls come school bell. The hostility never evolves into anything significant and just eventually fades as the series progresses, as if it was never there. So once again, all of this is a big fat waste of time. 
Fym could have been just as easily introduced in the following episode, and nothing would change main narrative-wise. All the scene accomplishes is to make Rosemary even more unlikable than she already is. She should be rueful to the 10th degree, but instead she ends up getting all pissy because Fym called her out on her bullshit. And while we are on the subject, let's take a closer gander at Rosemary. Her character, that is. I already know that the bad taste Rosemary leaves in your mouth at first encounter. Get it? Bad taste? It's a spice joke. Anyway, she's lame and annoying at the beginning, but I don't think I've made it clear yet just how obnoxious she truly is. She's loud, she's foolish, she's quick to annoy, she lacks focus, her table manners are horrid, and she acts with this constant demand for attention. She's like a hyperactive puppy. And none of that is presented as character flaws for her to work on. She's just a quirky, constantly hyper girl to an infuriating degree. Not to mention dangerous. I know the sword swatting is supposed to be all hee hee, I'm so quirky, funny funny, but it's a dumb joke without a punchline. Weapon safety is not to be taken lightly. A sword is not a toy. It's a tool designed for killing. If you respect your weapon, you'll never handle it like this. Your mother should have taught you this first thing. Just imagine if Rosemary's weapon of choice was something like, let's say a handgun, and she just decided to suddenly let loose and bust some caps all around. Yeah, not so funny anymore. Nothing Rosemary does is ever wrong, not truly as far as it is presented in the show. She never gets her comeuppance, no one truly reprimands her for her flaws, and even when some slight conflict develops between her and Sage late in the series, it's just forced drama that comes out of nowhere and makes Sage to be an overreacting bitch if anything. I know I'm jumping ahead, but take my word for it for the time being. If I tried to boil Rosemary's personality down to a single word, I would call her artificial. Nothing she does, nothing she says, nothing about her is genuine. She has no interesting philosophy or goals to differentiate her from the actual brain sludge that created her. She has no memorable lines, she's not funny, and her quote-unquote energy is utterly forced. She's just hyper, all the time. Because that's how this type of shonen action adventure pro tag is supposed to be like, right? It's just bargain bin shite. Even her desire to become a guardian doesn't stem from any kind of true sense of duty or justice. But rather from the fact that her mummy was a hashtag strong independent woman. And she wishes to be just like her. She clearly doesn't concern herself with the safety of others, that's for sure. There's no true vision, nothing the writer wishes to actually say with their character. There's no story. There's not really even an idea for a story. The setup for Rosemary's character, for her journey, is non-existent. And you may say that I'm being harsh, it's only the first episode after all, but I'm looking at this with the hindsight of having already seen the entire show. Nothing about Rosemary develops anywhere, not her persona, nor her quest to find her mummy dearest. There is nothing endearing about her. She is an utterly derivative, lame, empty shell of a protagonist. She is in the shit tier as far as heroines go, falling just short from the very bottom, if only by the fact that she manages to contain her self-centered existence from developing into criminal behavior. At least she isn't outright sociopathic, or psychopathic or hasn't actually raped anyone. Oh, but they made sure to sneak in the most important quality of any modern female heroine. Everybody likes her instantly, and all those who don't are seen as antagonistic. Because that's how the world works, ladies. You are perfect, and if someone doesn't think so, they are evil. Great, I'll get your stuff. I like her. A line that has been never uttered in any situation by any human being in the history of ever. You can trust me, I checked.
And now, at last, with the final 10 minutes of the episode still to go, we enter the true conflict of this opening chapter of lameness. This random Pokemon creature snatches Rosemary's precious locket, and the girls give chase. What is that thing? A Trixie! It's a thief! Yes, Rosemary. It took something that belongs to you. Therefore, it is indeed a thief. Thank you for sharing this vital info, Rosemary. Thank you so much. To make long story short, long in terms of time wasted, not things actually happening, the girls hunt the critter across town and witness it wooing itself a mate with the help of Rosemary's trinket. Rosemary takes back what is hers, or rather the locket just drops back into her palm, and that's that. Riveting adventure. You know what's funny? In a sad, pathetic way. This creature and its mating ceremony is the best part of the episode. Think about it. The Pokemon rodent had a goal, a quest for love. It ventured out, risked its life, took the treasure it needed from a giant rampaging Lummox, found a mate, and fulfilled its destiny in the end. This little scamp is more of a hero than the Protax of the show thus far. I'm more invested in these critters and their steamy Pokemon sex than I'm in the alleged heroines. But back to the sludge. Rose, sorry. I just... I didn't want to lose it. Rose, why didn't you tell me? It's just a cheap necklace. You know what? I think I managed to find the hidden subtext here. I had to use all my analytical mojo, but I cracked the code. Gather closer, and I'll tell ya. Closer. Closer. Rosemary misses her mom. I know. Shocking. I wouldn't blame anyone for missing this subtle detail. The show only mentions it six times in this one episode. Okay, but if I were to try this once more without the sarcasm... The emotional punch this whole thing is going for is painfully obvious. Originally, Rosemary tells Sage that the locket has a random picture of cake inside it, which is admittedly weird. But then... GASP! It turns out that the picture is actually of her entire family smiling happily together. Rosemary's missing mother included. Oh, poor Rosemary is the intended result from the viewer. Now as it is, this moment stumbles on its ass. Because the information offered is nothing we don't already know. Rosemary has already shed tears and sulked about her mother not once, but twice during the first episode. What is intended to be a reveal is not a reveal. We already know how she feels. The emotional resonance is equal to that of a wet fart. Now, I hate to do the writer's job for them, especially when the story has already been botched and published. But here goes anyway, for all of us, for future reference. Imagine this episode with no overt mentions to Rosemary's mother, Axe the Nightmare especially. Now, think how much better this reveal would be if this was the first time we learned of Rosemary's motivation to become a guardian, so that she can find her mother. It wouldn't be great, but it would achieve the intended effect at the very least. What would be even better is if the story actually did allude to the mother more subtly beforehand, and had Rosemary act aloof or abrasive about the whole matter. Paint the relationship between the two as complicated. Maybe they had an argument just before the disappearance or some such. You know, actual drama. And ta-da! Now you got much more effective way to cap off the first episode. Mistake of the past? Haunting the protagonist. But I'm describing a whole different story at this point. Anyway, we are almost at the end, so let's rush this. Rosemary's locket got mangled by the Pokemon, so now the girls gotta fix it. Sage just knows the exact location of this one random blacksmith shop in a city she's never been to before. How? Shut the fuck up, that's how! The girls meet Parsley, the fourth and final member of the Protag Foursome. She has a hammer, she bangs things with it, whatever. And she has a million siblings, sure, more on that later. There's absolutely no reason to introduce Parsley here, same as Fime. 
the girls will meet and mingle in school in the following episode, so this is just wasted screen time. And speaking of time, Rosemary and Sage literally bump into her for an exact repeat of the scene from before. Nothing is added, nothing new is learned, Sage is lame, Rosemary is pissy, Fime roasts them both for being dumbasses, same as before. What even is this episode? Why do the writers feel the need to repeat useless story beats ad nauseum, instead of using the time on world building or getting the story actually going? I'm being serious here, why do they keep doing this? <coughs> just smash the Trixie, even though I was ready to. <laughs> Sage got me to be patient, like she always usually does. Yeah, I do that a lot. <laughs> Who knew their courtship cycles would coincide with our arrival? That's uh, beautiful, Sage. A little clinical, but still. And you got to see the Trixie's entire dance. We saw it find its soulmate. You got to be a guardian, in a way. You protected a precious creature, and that let it find its perfect partner. And that matters so much. Aww. I wouldn't say protected, exactly. It was more that we didn't cut it in half with swords! <laughs> and with that, we are finally at the end of the opening episode. Sage and Rosemary march past the gates to the esteemed Guardian Academy with poise in their steps and smiles in their hearts and yada yada yada. Adventure and whimsy awaits next time. Holy fuck this is garbage. Not one thing, not a single solitary aspect of this show functions. The story to come is built upon a quagmire of shit. All the characters are obnoxious, the world makes no sense, the dialogue is written by absolute cunts with the mental maturity of preteens, there's no conflict, the presentation is dreadful, every second is pure concentrated cringe. What a horrid opening act. My only solace is that I'm done with this crap. And now I just have to do it again. 11 more times. Wish me luck. Now in the interest of fairness, and just to break up the pace a bit, how about hearing from the creator themselves? Surely they must have some insight to offer as to how things ended up in this catastrophic state. Hi Guardian Spies had a very small budget. We were the first show of a non-union studio. If you're mad at the animation quality, it was the budget. Background art? Budget. Writing? Budget. We literally started storyboarding the first episode before the first script was finished. This is how a coward tries to defend their art. Sure, there was also the usual pivoting of arguments. Everyone who doesn't like my art is a hater, sexist, racist, homophobe, transphobe, pineapple on pizza phobe. You know the song and dance. It's the same thing every time a diversity quota hire gets called out for their shit. Everything is someone else's fault, nothing is on me, no introspection, no reason for me to grow. Aha. Uh -huh. But this tweet here is the part that actually matters. This is the crux of the argument. So let's give it a nice big slap on the face with a newspaper. I already had my say about the visuals, animation and the like, and amidst my cynicism and snark, I was being very charitable to this clusterfuck production. I even pointed out that money must have been a factor, to where it was squandered is anyone's guess, and I went out of my way to highlight and compliment the background art, so if anyone wishes to call me a hater, you are making a fool out of yourself. I didn't have to be fair, no one would call me out if I went full unbridled berserk and ripped this show apart purely for the lackluster production. But that's not what I did. For the sake of intellectual honesty. For honesty is the greatest virtue a man can have. Now as for money being an issue, and the sole reason for the messy visuals, that is a load of bull. Animation is one thing, but we also got this. This here. Constantly. Just a face, not animated, a drawing. And it's fucked. 
She looks like she's just been molested by Satan. There is no financial reason why a still drawing of a character is supposed to look like this. That is not a money issue. That is purely the artist fucked up issue. And if it was only that, if the childish, winching defense was purely about money equating time and manpower for production, then I would nod, leave it at that, and move on. But then, the creature known as Rodriguez just had to type this. The writing is bad because money? No. Just no. I'm gonna make this real simple. If you truly care about your story, if you have a tale that needs to be told, if you have true inspiration, if you love your characters, then there's no excuse for your script to be this utterly broken in every way. You should already have a solid plan for your story once you pitch it. Otherwise, piss off and make way for someone who actually knows what the hell they are doing. There is no pre-production short enough to justify this level of problems. Narrative redline? Non-existent. Characterization? Horrid. World building? Nonsensical. Pacing? Half the episodes are filler. Message and theme? When it's not laughable, it's pedestrian. And when it's not pedestrian, it's outright harmful and disgusting. The story is rotten to the core. Everything in this show is ripped off from other better stories that have come before, with no true vision of its own. I would call it basic bitch, but that would be an insult towards female canines. No one responsible for the script, not the writers, not the directors, not the editors, no one cared to do their actual job. The entire show is just a vanity project for progressive ideologues and Tumblr dwellers. Storytelling doesn't matter to them. All they care about is having diverse characters, which is just code for shitty self-inserts, unattractive females, and castrated males. This is blatant. The creators already outed themselves and got deservedly ridiculed for their absurdity since the show was first announced. Now after all the righteous vitriol the original teaser caused, the only right thing to do by the creators would have been to buckle up and show the people what they can do. Prove everyone wrong, at least tell a functioning story. But no. This story is a prime example of art done by people with zero talent. Anyone with even a shred of aptitude for storytelling would have never allowed something this half-baked to escape their brains and onto the page. The problems in the narrative are so fundamental and devastating that I'm comfortable calling the entire writing staff a bunch of retards in the fullest sense of the word. This is not an issue of money. This is not an issue of time. This is simply an issue of utter incompetence. No matter how much money and time you'd have at your disposal, High Guardian shite would still have turned out as meritless garbage bordering on plagiarism. Because the story is everything. It is the soul. And you cannot buy a soul. As for me, my brain is constantly overflowing with ideas and story concepts. Regrettably, I have no time to pursue them fully. Because you know, boring everyday responsibilities and all. But if someone walked up to me and said, Hey, listen, we want you to create a dozen episode fantasy adventure story. Here's some money. And then threw a sack of dough at me. Not a lot. I'd take the geek for a minimum. You know what I would do? I would take my partner. We would lock ourselves in a cabin somewhere for a fortnight. And we would storm the shit out of it. We wouldn't sleep. We would hardly eat. We would just write and redraft and redraft until the text is the best it can be. Four hours of content is not that much, honestly. We could easily crunch that in no time. And we would love it, because we love our characters, we love their world, they are pieces of our soul. 
We want to see heroes facing challenges and overcoming them. We want to create something that's new and entertaining and actually means something to the people kind enough to sit down and listen to us ramble. We fucking obsess about our characters in our free time. We constantly bounce ideas and talk about what we are gonna do next. We have so much planned out, it's practically a second life for us, because we care that much. That is true inspiration. Money does not equate good writing. First, you have to give a shit. This utterly asinine statement. As someone who loves writing, who loves storytelling, someone who actually cares and wishes to keep on evolving, I'm taking this as a personal insult. And you know what truly grinds my gears about all this? It's that I know for a fact that there are thousands of people all over the world who have their stuff up on DeviantArt or YouTube or Wattpad or whatever or just tucked away in their drawer. And I know that any one of them could potentially one day create something great. Something worthy of everyone's attention. Maybe even good enough to be adapted into an official animated show with an actual budget. Many of them will be discouraged from trying their best, from evolving, or even sharing their stuff, because they think nobody will care. After all, the attention of the masses and the studios is aimed consistently on the types of creators who have nothing to say, talentless hacks, who have only been given money and a chance to create by the virtue of them ticking a fucking diversity box. Courtesy of either a scalpel or the Skittles company. Yes, shots fired. The fuck are you gonna do about it? There are so many talented people in the world who actually deserve to be heard. There are so many wonderful stories that'll never see the light of day. Because the industry is clogged by filth like this. And I know that among those stories that'll never get published, there is that one story that I would consider brilliant. Maybe even one of my new favorites. I will never get to experience that story. And it's all thanks to these whiny, self-absorbed pieces of shit. Who refuse to learn, refuse to grow, refuse to take responsibility for their own fuck-ups. And still dare call themselves creators. These kinds of people are the ones taking away valuable space and opportunities from all the artists with actual talent. Fuck every last one responsible for this cultural devastation. Not just these fucks, but everyone who made it so that we ended up here. Imagine a place. A place of learning. Academy, if you will. Now in this academy, the greatest warriors and the most distinguished mages in all the land train the next generation to become armed protectors of the people. Children, literal children, are trained how to swing a sword, to handle a bow, to cast elemental death from their wands. Now imagine if this institute of deadly warrior training had certain quirks in the way of conducting itself. Imagine if the faculty elders took glee in the failure of their students, berating past students publicly long since they've left the campus, effectively dragging their name through the manure of history. Imagine if the same teacher mocked the first day students for their inadequacy even before they have a chance to prove themselves while cackling like a villainous crone. Imagine if at potions class, the first lesson includes the teacher poisoning their students without offering any kind of actual tutoring on the properties of poisons beforehand and then just left the fresh newbies to panic and scramble about like headless chickens as their life slowly ticks away. Imagine if first year students were sent to venture into this dangerous cave of wonders place where everything wants to kill them with no teacher involvement, no safety net no way to escape if things go awry. Trial by fire, am I right? Imagine if at ethics class, the ideas, or rather the ideals discussed, 
were equal to that of a common champagne socialist's dribble whilst high on fart gas. Imagine if the things presented as truth were actually harmful naivety at best and dangerous propaganda at worst. Imagine if one of the teachers purposefully and insidiously led the conversation with one of their students into an out of nowhere explanation of their chosen gender identity in order to introduce them to the concept of transgenderism in the veneer of offering life advice. Reminder, all of the students in the academy are under age and the teacher in question is not the licensed guidance counselor of the academy. Imagine if an epidemic of clear as day bullying received no interference from any of the teachers. We are talking verbal abuse, belittling of one's heritage, evolving into full-on physical violence in the span of a single day. Nobody cares. Now imagine if the teachers suddenly took interest in a case of roughhousing right before their eyes and took the side of the aggressor instead of the victim, due to the fact that the victim in question said some mean words and the violent person just so happens to be part of the alphabet community, so the violence was clearly deserved. Imagine if this institution at once encouraged their students to find their own path, to cultivate their individual strengths, to become the best version of themselves that they could be, while at the same time telling them that their individual aspirations and philosophies are outright wrong and that all of them must adhere to a predetermined oath. Now imagine if this oath, emphasizing the virtues of self-sacrifice and shielding of others from harm, was entirely contradictory to everything this academy and their faculty stand for as is clear from their absolute lack of care for the lives of their students, not to mention their utter blind disregard for the looming magical calamity about to engulf the entire world. I said imagine, but you don't have to imagine, because that's exactly the kind of place High Guardian Academy is. Out of all the students unfortunate enough to be taught here, I'd be surprised if any of them could emerge into society as anything other than an emotionally disturbed, sociopathic, violent, morally crooked, absolute wreck of a human being. The only just fate for this kind of horrible corrupt institute would be for someone to burn it to the ground. Oh, well I guess that's taken care of. I shall use my agility. <laughs> Anyway, episode 2, Disorientation Day. <laughs> the girls begin their first semester at the esteemed High Guardian Academy. First day of school, a brand new environment, new people, new challenges. It's a prime opportunity for characterization, world building and setting up the journeys of each of our four main heroines. Now at its core, as a setting, any type of school is the most basic, boring and lame place you can possibly pick. And that's exactly why it's used so often, especially in the medium High Guardian Spice is trying to emulate. Everybody has gone to school at some point, so everyone can relate to the characters at least on that level. Everybody knows how things work, from the classes to the administration, it's just immediately clear what the setting is all about and what's happening without need for excess exposition. If you pick school as the main stage for your story, as a writer, you've already placed half your workload on autopilot. It is impossible to fuck up something so well established as this. And yet, somehow, in classic High Guardian Spice fashion, this show manages to make even the simplest thing needlessly confusing. Today I've got metal smithing first, and then something called the everything hours. Oh, I've got everything hours too. Where's uh ethics class? It's in the Wait, are you sure you're in it with me? I'm sure we Oh, no, we're not. My schedule says I have ethics on Wednesdays. I'm not sure why I thought we Well, it makes sense that we're in different classes since we're on different tracks. 
Sage is here to master magic. So cool, Sage. You're gonna break some hearts. Thank you. And Rosemary, you're on the warrior track, like me. And Time's on both tracks, and she's got that fairy woods background, so, you know, no two guardians have the same schedule. So it turns out that, for some baffling reason, all the students in the academy have a unique schedule from one another. It's the first day, and everyone is just doing whatever. Why would the school decide to hold separate classes for different students in the subjects that they all have in common? That's just blatant mismanagement of resources and time. Why are the first year, or rather first day, students even having any kind of diverging schedules in the first place? Keep in mind, this is already a very specialized, focused academy. Everyone is training to become guardians. As such, it would make more sense to begin with the unified studies. Ethics, basic combat training, history, biology of monsters and the like and then later on specialize the students into their chosen fields, or tracks, as they are commonly known. So the two tracks are basically the warrior and the mage. But then, why does Sage attend the same warrior combat class alongside everyone else later on in the show? Episode 6 to be specific. They gave an excuse for Fime, since she is apparently both a warrior and magically inclined. So she attends spell classes together with Sage as well. But they specifically stated that Sage is purely a mage. Did the writers forget? Both episodes are written by the same people, so there's no excuse. And why doesn't Rosemary also study smithing alongside Parsley? After all, she is on the warrior track too. So even if two people are on the same specialized track, they still have further specialization within that track, since the first day of school. Both Rosemary and Sage seem utterly baffled by all this, so they clearly haven't chosen any of their classes. Judging by the show's scattershot explanation, it seems like Parsley is the only one who actually knows how the curriculum works, and the only one who has chosen to specialize in smithing beforehand. When did she do that? How did she even do that? Why are the rest of the girls so out of the loop? Why does the academy even teach smithing? That's like if a modern military academy taught cadets how to craft assault rifles, instead of how to handle them. None of this makes any sense. To be fair, the writing reason for all this convoluted hand wavy crap is quite simple. The show wants to justify why all the main characters are attending separate classes and aren't there to support each other, so that the writers can easily craft separate A and B plots for each of the characters in the episodes going forth. For this particular end, in this particular scene, Parsley acts as the expo dump machine and Rosemary and Sage are the lobotomized ask men. It's actually a classic setup in fish out of water stories, the local person explains the details of the world and the newbies and we as the audience get to hear these details by proxy. The problem here comes from the fact that Parsley shouldn't know anything the other two don't. She can't. There is no way. They are all first day students. An easy fix for this would have been to make Parsley into an upperclassman, a senpai if you will, who would show her new friends the ropes. That would have actually been some neat characterization for Parsley. She's already the most mentally stable out of the four heroines, so it would only make sense if she was also older than the rest. It's actually so obvious I cannot believe the writers didn't think of it. In fact, all the named characters in the story are first year students. Which is weird, for obvious reasons. I mean, whenever there's trouble, it would only make sense that the more experienced, and more powerful, third year students were the ones taking care of the heavy lifting. Alas, the show has other ideas. Lazy ideas. But that's a rant for later. The exposition in this show is so crude, forced, and so poorly thought out, that it ends up raising more questions than it answers. Moreover, it also compromises the already flimsy characterization of the cast. Let's take Rosemary for example.
Should we start? I think we should give the students a minute to settle in. Waiting gives me hives. We, we know. know. Who are they? It's the Triad. They run this place. Ah, so the crone one is the headmistress. No, they all are. Sage has to explain to Rosemary how the school is governed. How does Sage know this? Heck, why doesn't Rosemary know this? It's apparently common knowledge. Is Rosemary just honestly that dumb and ignorant? She, if anyone, should be the one most in the know about the academy and the structure of the studies there. Seeing as her mother was a guardian, did Rosemary never ask her any questions about the academy? Did she not care? I'd think she would wish to know everything there is to know about the place she's been hoping to attend since forever. Especially after her mother disappeared. For Rosemary, this place is the key to finding her mother. That is her driving passion. This academy is her final link to her lost relative, who she loves with all her heart. She should be obsessed about this place. She should know its history, all the key figures, how the place operates, everything. She should have been planning her studies vigorously long before stepping foot there, and apparently not. I guess the whole swinging a sword all willy-nilly thing really is enough for her. when your face is rabies. I think I've made it abundantly clear just how much I despise the main protagonist of this show. Her attitudes, her characterization, her voice, her simultaneous aimlessness combined with self-entitlement. Reprehensible is the fitting term. I've had less to say about the other members of the main quartet, but that's because there hasn't been much focus on them as of yet but suffice to say they aren't much better. In fact, while I have already thoroughly expressed just how much I absolutely loathe the writing of this show, especially the character work, especially the pro tag, and I'll naturally keep doing so, there's still a long way to go. I feel like, before we move any further, there is a single burning question that needs to be answered. Can we use the most offensive of slurs to describe the characters of this show? Is the script truly that awful? Have the writers committed the gravest of sins? Have they summoned the dark eldritch abomination that should never be invoked? The character type I'm talking about is naturally the dreaded, the awful, the lamest of the lame, Mary Sue. Now usually, the Mary Sue or Gary Stu archetype is used as a shorthand to describe characters who embody many if not all of the classic mistakes of amateurish character writing, the hilarious fanfiction-y, self-insert-esque qualities. Notably, these characters are the best at what they do, usually with no realistic justification, they never struggle, they have no flaws, everyone loves them, the narrative is vehemently and artificially focused on them, the entire world revolves around them, and absolutely nothing gets done narrative-wise without their direct input. They are beautiful, powerful, the coolest, the smartest, absolutely perfect in every way. And even if they end up having any flaws at all, it's always some variety of bullshit fake non-flaws. These include things like clumsiness, fear of their own overwhelming strength, or tepid self-doubt, which is just silly, considering their godly skill. The author basically creates a wish-fulfillment fantasy in the most shallow, boring, and obnoxious way possible. The problem with these types of characters is obvious. Struggle is conflict, conflict is stakes, stakes are drama, and drama is the one thing that makes the audience give a damn about your story. Flawless characters carry no drama, and hence, no investment. Why should I care about any alleged dramatic turn of events? 
when I know that the pro tag has zero chance of failure. The Marisu title is an effective way to compress the audience's disdain towards shite character work. It's a useful term, e tad of a misnomer. There are a bunch of qualities often associated with the Marisu, some of them more prominent than others. I actually made a handy bingo card of it. However, it is important to note that none of these attributes automatically make a character into a Su, nor does the lack of any of these automatically abolish a character from being a Su. It's a malleable term. It's more effective in expressing the audience's views on a given character rather than an objective assessment of their qualities on a rigid good-bad scale. It all depends on what kind of story is being told and how prominent the Marisu-ness is. Example, many rule of cool stories definitely have an overpowered, omnicapable lead character, someone who just steamrolls the competition, but in the context of such stories, that can be entertaining in its own right. Dumb fun. It's not deep or complex, but it's also not bad per se. Far as I see it, the truest trait of a Marisu story is the total lack of self-awareness. The author creates a perfect being into a universe where nothing can truly hurt them, and then pretends like the story is filled with high stakes and drama, as if their wish-fulfillment character is actually just another relatable average person. As a fast rule of thumb, you cannot tell a serious story with an overly capable slash flawless character. All of that being said, how does High Guardian Spice fare on this front? The characters suck, no use pretending otherwise. But are any of them truly Marisus? Well, let's take a closer look at the girl's first day of school, and maybe we can find an answer to this question. First up, Sage. So at this point, the show introduces the central aspect of Sage's character, namely, the inadequacy she feels related to her magical abilities. In short, the magic in the show's universe is categorized into two groups, old magic and new magic. The current reigning style of sorcery is new magic, which is activated by using these magical doohickeys known as terraspheres. These allow the wielder to do basically anything at no cost whatsoever, which is utterly broken, as I have already discussed. God, I fucking hate this fucking show! They are never properly explained by the show, which is ironic, considering the entire story takes place in a freaking school. Something that is also never explained is the relation of old magic to the new. What's the cost of old magic? What are the rules? How did it lead into the creation of the new system? The show claims that the old is the basis for the new system, so how did that come about? A dozen episodes, and I have no idea. The conflict here is supposed to be the following. Sage has never been able to wield new magic before, because her parents are devoted traditionalists, I guess? And only tolerate the old magic. For some reason. So she is supposedly at a disadvantage in an environment where the primary field of study is new magic. She is even made fun of for this by Amaryllis, her very own Draco Malfoy if you will. This is supposed to be Sage's primary conflict in the show. Her relation to her parents, their traditional ways, coming to terms with her own attitudes towards magic, overcoming her status as an underdog, all the while studying to be the best mate she can be. The way I've laid it out is already giving the show too much credit, because the story actually explores none of that. The whole premise itself makes absolutely no sense for several obvious reasons. Firstly, why the hell would anyone in this world scoff at new magic, and insist on using the old? New magic can literally do anything with no cost. Think of it like this. Why would anyone in modern society insist on using typewriters instead of a computer in their day-to-day -day work? That would be absolutely retarded. The benefits of modern technology are too cost-effective to ignore. The show never elaborates on the whole traditionalist aspect of Sage's parents. There's no philosophy, no religious doctrine to justify it, 
so the only way anyone can view them is a couple of drooling morons. Secondly, why should anyone feel inadequate for not being already learned in a subject that they have just begun studying? The purpose of school is to learn, not to show off how much you already know. This is basic stuff. All of this is completely backwards. And thirdly, despite Sage never having wielded new magic before, she is already extremely powerful. She can literally fly. That is not a small thing. That is already amazing beyond all comprehension. The average person can't even dream of flying, even in this fantastical world. Sage is good enough for her age and level of study. More than good enough. She should know that as well. You can never convince me otherwise. In any case, the episode desperately tries to create an arc of sorts for Sage. She gets picked on for being lame, even though there has yet to be any practical tests of skill, just introductions to courses, but whatever. So she goes crying to Rosemary, <laughs> I cannot do it. And Rosemary gives her a big ol' serving of validation. Sage, listen, okay? You're a hundred thousand times better than all of those jerks. You belong here so much that... that... that I heard the triad talk about making doppelgangers of you just so they could have more of you. And guess what? I'm not letting you go until you agree, so nyeh! <laughs> okay, okay. You're just so great. And when you don't think you're great, it makes me so sad. Well, I can't make you sad. Exactly. <laughs> this whole thing in itself is a prime Marisu trait. Constant validation, even when the character has done nothing to deserve it. The sprinklings of victimization are important too. I mean, how else is the audience supposed to relate to the character and root for them? Making them likable and interesting? <laughs> what a joke. Everyone knows something like that is far too much for this show's budget. So after the codling pep talk, Sage buckles up and showcases her skills in the coming potions class. The teacher poisons the entire class and leaves them to struggle for survival with zero instructions. While everyone else is just screaming and dashing about like the newbies that they are, Sage is the only one who even tries to fix up the potion needed for everyone not to die. This school fucking sucks by the by. So the new magic of Amaryllis and the other students amounts to nothing. Is that what we are supposed to gather here? No, it's never painted in that light. Even though it's hideously obvious. Sage did better with her quote-unquote old-fashioned and obsolete magic compared to the modern wizards with practically infinite power. In the context new magic is described, everyone here should be able to simply wish the poison away or something like that. None of this makes sense. Sage was supposed to be the underdog here, and yet she leaves everyone in her class to bite her dust within the first day of school. This is the defining moment, this is the thing that solidifies Sage's status in the story. First day of school, top of her class. She has no growth ahead of her, she is already better than everyone else. Moreover, everyone who teases her are made to look like idiots, and everyone the show deems as nice and good are constantly praising her, so that she and the audience knows for absolute certainty just how special she is. Sounds like a Marisu to me. <laughs> Moving on to Parsley. Zinya. Here. Parsley. Hmm. Parsley. Uh, 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 here. I am here. Parsley. I am here. Mm. Okay. Good. Um, you can start by sitting down. I can do that! Okay, this is the point where this show's sense of humor is really starting to piss me off. This gag makes no sense. In the scene prior to this one, Parsley is the one on the level. She is the one in the know about all the goings on in the school, 
And now she is suddenly late from class. How? How come no one else is late? Everyone here is a first day student. So in this huge school, where no one is apparently guiding the students into their classrooms, on the first day, everyone else managed to find the classroom on time, except Parsley. That doesn't follow any kind of logic. Ugh. And the punchline isn't even that amusing. Effective comedy is a surefire way to win the audience to your side. Viewers may forgive a lacking story if the characters are at least charming and make them laugh. But if you try to force comedy and end up botching it, it only creates further resentment. A flat gag is painful to witness. Moreover, it leads into broken characterization as with Sage, as with Rosemary. Anyway, cringy comedy aside, how does Parsley fare on her first day? Well, how do you think? She is the bestest in her class. In fact, she outclasses everyone to such a degree that the teacher immediately moves her to the third year class. Bullshit! Is what I would say, except... The show does in fact have a justification for this. See, Parsley has been working in her family-owned blacksmith shop her whole life. So of course she's ahead in her studies. If anything, the problem here is the fact that the teacher isn't aware of this already. It is stated several times in the show that the students are handpicked for their capabilities. We welcome you, our first year students, and commend you for being chosen. You've each been selected for your exceptional qualities. And yet the academy has no clue what the students' capabilities are. These two things cannot be true simultaneously. How are the applicants appraised? When did it happen? Why does Sage angst about not being good enough if she has been handpicked to attend the academy? How did a dumbass like Rosemary make the cut? Was it nepotism? I don't know. The show never explains anything. It's not just a plot hole, it's a plot black hole. A supermassive black hole, if you will. Back on track. Contrasting Parsley next to Sage is actually an excellent way to illustrate the difference between a Mary Sue and a character who is simply capable. Parsley has a clear reason for why she's better than everyone else. More importantly, the show never pretends like Parsley is an average person, let alone an underdog. Writing-wise, the Mary Sue lacks self-awareness, while the not Sue simply follows cause and effect. Now it is important to note that this does not mean that Parsley is a well-written character just because she ain't a Marisu. Due to her mastery of smithing, she really has nowhere to go. There's no development ahead of her. She has no reason to exist. She has no arc and no personality to be entertaining on her own. All her scenes amount to her just smithing away or delivering some forgettable dialogue with the other gals which could be accomplished just as easily with anyone else from the overly stuffed cast. She is a useless, boring addition to the roster. All of her scenes could be cut, and the show would remain exactly the same. There is nothing to her character. The show tries to give her some tired family drama in episode 4, and we'll get to that at a later point. For now, suffice to say it's a wee bit shit. So congratulations, Parsley. You are not a Mary Sue, but you are still a worthless character. <laughs> Up next is Fime. Haven't talked about her much yet. So what is the Dark Elf up to on her first day of school? What kind of journey is the show crafting for her? <laughs> That's it. No, seriously. The staring contest with this one random cat is her entire contribution to the story in this episode. Riveting! Now, in the deranged heads of the dumbass writing staff, this here is supposed to be foreshadowing, and I'm using that term extremely loosely. 
the black kitty with the menacing stare is actually secretly a girl with a menacing stare. Ooh. She is the primary villain of the show. More on that later. I just... I just can't right now. Hilariously enough, this scene is actually a perfect microcosm of Fime's contribution to the show. She is just there. She is the cool, semi-aloof, bow-wielding elf of this band of heroes. Because every band of heroes needs a cool, semi-aloof, bow-wielding elf. Fantasy! As for Marisunes, I don't think it's justified to call her one. She never misses with her bow, sure. She never struggles to do anything in general, yeah, but still. I guess it's the show's lack of focus on her. She just exists as someone who occasionally shoots things with her bow. And she's not made to feel overly special. She never actually accomplishes anything significant on her own, only as a part of the group. Her motivation later on in the show centers around the magical plague taking over the land, which is not really exclusive to her, since, you know, a looming apocalypse is everyone's problem. She also has some sort of feud with her family, much like Parsley, which we'll get to. Suffice to say, it's also a wee bit shit. On her own, Fime is basically an angsty tree hugger. She broods, she scoffs, she tells the dumbasses around her to piss off. So that's a plus in my book. I just wish she did more of that. Being a guardian can kill you. They just say that stuff about death to scare people who aren't willing to do the work. No, they don't. They say you might die because you might die. In a vacuum, I probably tolerate Fime the most out of the main quartet, but that assessment comes with a huge asterisk. The only thing that elevates her above the others is that she is allowed to say things as they are, and not just shower her classmates with undue validation. After she eventually stops doing that, she becomes just another lame gal in the group. And finally, as for Rosemary, is she truly a Mary Sue? Yes! A thousand times yes! I already went over how utterly garbage her character is. But just to reiterate, because this is the main protag we are talking about, so this shit is infinitely important, she is the special child of a special legendary hero. She has her special sword, she is somehow able to wield it with her noodle arms. She is a fighting protege, surviving encounters with not one, but two more experienced villains in her first year of training. And she fights while wearing a pink frilly hoop skirt dress for fuck's sake. She never fails truly, and every time the show tries to showcase her struggling, it never amounts to anything significant story-wise. This here, this, this is nothing. It means nothing. A moment of stumbling without self-reflection, humility and development is empty. It's cheating. Rosemary never grows because she never has to grow. She is everything the writers wish to be. She is selfish, inconsiderate, rash, Loud, stupid beyond belief, and yet she's treated like the most important person in the whole world by the show and the cast. Her friends allow her to be awful, teachers take special interest in her, the only trope she lacks is the villains literally falling in love with her. If this show had even a hint of realism, any kind of stakes, then a person like Rosemary would be dead dozen times over. She would never even be accepted into High Guardian Academy. On the other hand, the school's curriculum seems to be aiming to train a future generation of sociopaths. So at least that checks out. I hope this helps illustrate that the Marisu is not an all-encompassing term when it comes to character descriptions. There's more nuance than many people care to think about, 
Lackluster characters are bad in their own right. The Marisu spice on top of that is simply that extra insult from the author that makes stories like this so special. Short bus special. Now to preface this next section, I'm going to briefly talk about something known as death of the author. I'm certain many of you are familiar with this already, but for the benefit of that one person in the audience who has literally just now heard this term, in short, Death of the author refers to a style of media analysis. It basically means that the author of the story, who they are, their intent, what they have said about their own work, or the context of when and where the story was created, should not affect how the story is viewed and analyzed. Sounds reasonable. After all, every story has to function on its own without any kind of meta knowledge. When utilized in moderation, Death of the author is a crucial component of truly objective analysis. Without it, we leave the door open for the author to patch up their work retroactively, or try to justify all of their screw-ups by all sorts of limp comments like, uh, uh, actually, this was what this was, uh, and this is how this works. No, you wrote the story, it is finished, it is published, you got paid for it, it has to be cohesive on its own, now shut the fuck up, do better next time. Or alternatively, sometimes the author might even try to argue that their work is actually about something utterly contradictory to what is happening on the screen. Which is just hilarious. It is the trademark of misguided writers, trying to make a point in their story, and then failing so spectacularly that their work ends up making the exact opposite point. Using death of the author also frees the audience to appreciate art for its actual merit, and to not be burdened by its origin. For example, it allows the fans of Ruroni Kenshin to remain fans of the story, even after the author of the manga was outed for being... Um, <clears throat> the big oof. Or it allows us to look at a drawing such as this, see that it is constructed quite well, and give it a big ol' thumbs up. It's a nice picture. It may not set your world on fire, but it is made competently. You know who made this? Well, it was made by this guy. I may see many creators as unworthy pieces of human filth, but that will never affect my analysis of their works of fiction. If something is good, it's good, and if something is lacking, then it is lacking, no matter who made it. Equality, objectivity, the same rules and standards for every artist and every piece of art. Simple enough, no? These are my standards. This is how I generally approach media. I care about the story, what is presented in the work itself, and only that. At best, the words of the author can offer an interesting clarification to an already functional work. In Wally, -E, the humans aboard Axiom have grown fat and lazy due to being coddled by fantastical technology for generations. That is what is happening on screen. However, in the audio commentary for the movie, the director, Andrew Stanton, offered a neat factoid about his thought process for the design of the humans. According to him, the idea was to invoke the image of adult-sized babies. As in, humanity has devolved to the stage of infants, and now they must learn how to stand on their own feet anew, as seen in the ending sequence of the movie. As you see, both interpretations work. They don't fundamentally change the narrative. This is an obvious way to identify a well-presented story. Even if the audience misses parts of the intended point, the story still functions all the same. A moment ago, I stated that death of the author should be utilized in moderation. While it is a useful tool in objective analysis, it also has some major pitfalls. You see, this style of analysis, separating the artist and their intent from the art, can often lead into excessive focus on the audience experience instead. Or in other words, navel gazing. If taken to the extreme, distancing oneself from the original intent of the work can create viewpoints lacking any semblance of objectivity. We enter the realm of pure subjectivity. 
This goes by many labels. It's sometimes known as postmodernism, sometimes it's reader response theory, other times it's critical theory. According to this kind of media analysis, the feelings, ideas, and personal views of the audience take priority when assessing the text. Context, facts, reality itself is removed entirely. In other words, it's utter horseshit. The viewer can dismiss the actual events on the screen, the objective story elements, and just invent their own meaning. Everything is nothing, nothing is everything, anything can be anything. All that matters is how the story made the audience feel. In the worst case scenario, we end up with some sad delusional weirdo claiming that Middle Earth is secretly populated by trans people. Like in most things in life, the effective path, the truth, lies somewhere between two extremes. More often than not, if we just take a brief moment to actually look, and listen, and think what is presented in the narrative, the author reveals their intent plainly to see. Every story carries something about the author, their fancies, their philosophies, their ideals. The writer tries to communicate something via their story, obviously. In one way or another, the writer always inserts themselves into the story, not necessarily consciously, nor in the form of a character, but as an overarching arbiter of values and ethics. This may happen either subtly, or quite in your face, but it absolutely happens. The values of the story are the values of the author, there is no question about that. No one fights against themselves in their own stories. Simple example. No writer who considers themselves an animal lover would ever create a hero character who likes to kick puppies in their free time. If a character decides to do something so heinous for whatever reason, the story always condemns this action in some way, either thematically or by some other character outright stating the fact. And if not, then we can be justified in assuming that the author is actually a psychopath. This is basic communication of ideas. Valorous acts and ideals are shown as good, and villainous things are shown as bad, in accordance as to how the author views the world. The most obvious way this manifests is those soapbox moments where the characters simply blurt out the moral of the story, you know those, you see, I've learned something today moments. Something more subtle is when the villain of the story has a quote-unquote point. They are altruistic in their goals, at least as far as they see it. In these situations, it is the job of the heroes to call out their misguided views, hypocrisy or flawed logic and to stop them from enacting their evil. In rare cases, the author may showcase a certain type of restraint and humility, crafting a narrative where two opposing sides are shown to be righteous in their own ways, with no true victor in the conflict. The story basically throws up its hands and declares, I'm sorry, I just don't know. The world is grey sometimes, and to see that acknowledged by writers is an exceptional occurrence becoming ever more rare each passing year. Now, with all of that being said, let's bring this whole thing back around to the main topic at hand. I'll just play this clip to you, and afterwards, well, you'll see. Ethics involves telling right from wrong, and wrong from other wrong, etc. ad infinitum. Today, we'll discuss destiny and autonomy what is inevitable, and what is unintended. In her groundbreaking theory, The Choices of Mortality, my favorite philosopher posited that the absence or presence of fear determines both love and hate. Fear of the other is the fuel of violence. 
It really begs the question, who, if anyone, can we trust? Rosemary, do you have any thoughts regarding our little friends here? Uh, I think... I think they should both have spikes. <laughs> <laughs> hmm, both? <laughs> or neither. Rosemary, your affinity for balance, for fairness, for justice is clear. But, lesson one, we must not let the mere presence of weapons determine our actions. Write that down, class. It'll be on every ethics test for the next three years. So what is happening here? We have a character, a teacher, part of an institution training the fresh generation of warrior heroes, tutoring them about ethics. This irrefutably noble character, at least in the narrative of the show, quotes her favorite philosopher. Her thoughts aren't challenged. This is not a setup for some larger theme. It is not meant to be pondered further. In fact, it has no link to anything in the episode. It is simply a non sequitur idea shoved to the forefront just because. For the sake of being there. The show is making a definitive, philosophical statement here. The author is talking to the audience directly. Sure, I'm game. Let's get smashing! Fear determines love and hate, presented as a dichotomy between good and bad, positive and negative, harmony and violence, where the fear of the other is the source of all violence. Absolute nonsense. Do athletes in contact sports fight because of fear? No. They fight in a consensual test of strength to determine who is the better. Does the fox hunt and kill the rabbit because of fear? No, it kills the rabbit because it wants to eat. Does a person rob his fellow man because of fear? No, they do it because they are selfish and want free stuff. Does the evil empire invade a smaller nation because of fear? No, they invade because their leaders want more taxpayers, resources, and political influence. Does the sick individual who violates a child's innocence do it because of fear? No, the sick individual does unspeakable things because they are fucked in the head, they have developed disgusting desires, and they do not care how much suffering they cause in pursuit of satiating their urges. Violence does not stem exclusively from fear. There are a myriad of motivations for violence. In the same vein, hate is not necessarily linked to fear. You can hate someone without fearing them, and you can fear someone without hating them. Let's say you have a messy breakup. Someone hurts you badly, they lie, they cheat, they play you for a fool. After it's all over, and you inevitably split up, do you hate them for hurting you? You might, and you would be perfectly justified in doing so. But do you fear them? Of course not. Why would you? On the flip side, when fear is the motivator of violence, it can just as easily be seen as the purest sign of love. When you protect your family from someone meaning to hurt them, risking your own life to fight off the offender, that is due to your love, the fear for their safety. Or when a police officer puts themselves on the line for complete strangers, and are forced to enact violence on criminals, they do it because it's the right thing to do, because of their love for their fellow men. Once again, the fear for their safety. Fear in itself is not good nor bad. It is simply a human emotion. It can manifest in a myriad of ways. At its core, it is an important tool for our collective survival as a species. It tells us when to fight and when to flee. The show offers nothing of value here. 
It's all a bunch of meaningless words strung together into an incomprehensive mess. The topic the writers are trying to address is far more complex than they can ever hope to fathom. And that's not even going into the fact that the visual presentation is completely backwards. The creature being assaulted is the one that's cowering, and there is no fear present in the violent creature, it's merely being a dick just because. So where's the fear of the other that supposedly fuels violence? The show itself just proved themselves wrong, contradicting their own statement as it was being said. Now that is some hilarious incompetence. And then we have the second part. Removal of spikes equals balance, fairness, justice. If we remove spikes, the weaponry, or in other words, the capacity for violence from everyone, then we would achieve love and harmony? Completely ignoring the entirety of human history and psychology. Before we had firearms, we had swords. And before swords, we had sticks. And before sticks, we had our bare fucking fists. Not to mention the willingness to use them. Humanity will always find ways to hurt one another. And there will always be selfish people willing to hurt and subjugate others by force for their personal gain. Should we amputate everyone's arms? Their legs? Rip out their teeth? So that no one can hurt anyone? Just to be sure? If we follow the logic presented in the show, then yes. Everyone would be equal. Everything would be fair. Society would be perfectly balanced. As far as the capacity for violence is concerned. Utter insanity. Whoever wrote this drivel has the mental maturity of a six-year-old. All of this is blatant misuse of language and subversion of basic common sense. These kinds of sweeping statements lacking any kind of nuance are the prime way of identifying an underdeveloped mind and soul. These ideas fall to pieces with even the smallest bit of critical thinking. The creators of this show are not equipped to lecture anyone on ethics. Further evidence of the writers lacking grasp on morals are the myriad of contradictions in this episode alone. They talk about love and harmony and all that mushy stuff, claim to be advocating for fairness and balance, and yet the quote heroic guardians and the academy training them are free to commit whatever dubious acts they please. Forcefully transmuting living creatures to illustrate a vague point? A-okay. Using caged dragons as sparring fodder for the students? Sure thing. Poisoning the students and turning them into crimes against nature? Absolutely fair game. Fear of the other is the fuel of violence, according to the show. So who the fuck is afraid of who here? Is the teacher afraid of her students? Is that why she poisons them? It's pure absurdity. Down the line, the show is filled with stuff like this. Blatant hypocrisy, notions of right and wrong turning on a dime, however it suits the creators at the moment. Moving forward, the curriculum in the academy includes something known as everything hours. The premise is that each day the students get a free period to train in any subject they wish. In addition to the obvious choices such as combat training, or... or just combat training, the students can also pick subjects like pottery, ballet, or playing the loot. Supposedly, these accumulated skills will be tested by sending the kids on harrowing adventures to dangerous locations around the world. Now pray tell, how the hell is ballet supposed to help you when faced with a goddamn dragon? This is a school for warriors and combat mages. Why would anyone choose to focus their energy on random hobbies, instead of honing their fighting skills? You know, the thing keeping you from dying on the field? Why would the school even allow this? Again, this is a school meant to train warriors, with the duty of protecting the realm and its citizens. 
If any of them wish to train in whatever extra thing piques their interest, then let them do it on their own time. When was the last time you heard about the army training people how to do pottery? Well, you haven't. Because that would be utterly retarded. The show treats combat school as summer camp, full of fun activities and games. It's demented. And in the same episode this is introduced, after it is specifically stated that the students should nurture their skills in any field they wish, to be free to do whatever the fuck they want, to be themselves. The same students are chastised for being individuals. The students are ordered to craft their own oath as guardians, to state their desires and the path they wish to walk, and then they are all called out for being dumbasses because their individual desires are wrong. Here comes the faculty, spewing a ridiculous litany of vagaries that can be interpreted in infinite ways, but to the untrained ear sound good and righteous. It's all meaningless virtue signaling trite. But that's the show in a nutshell. If the first episode was lame and annoying filler crap, then the second episode is where the show truly kicks the nonsense into overdrive. It's just contradictions upon contradictions. No idea is developed, nothing is sufficiently explained, stuff just happens, everyone is a goddamn moron, the main setting of the show makes absolutely no sense, there is no cohesion, not in terms of world, characterization, morals, or narrative in general. Watching this show, you don't need to know anything about the writers beforehand to come to the conclusion that they are all twisted between the ears. A mess of this magnitude doesn't come from time constraints, or inexperience, nor even incompetence. The style and attitude this show employs to storytelling is simple and pure indifference. The author, none of them, care about storytelling. In their mind, anything they say goes, no matter how ridiculous it is. They make the rules, they say what's right and moral, even if they contradict their own rules moments later. They have fully revealed their values. Subjectivity, narrow self-centered thinking, moral relativism. It is truly frustrating to sit and watch as a gang of cartoonist cunts shovel endless truckloads of narrative garbage on the screen, while getting paid for it. I'm not exaggerating when I say that every moment of this show is pure pain. The one thing I love the most in lackluster storytelling is when the author insults the intelligence of their audience. Write what you know is one of the oldest writing advice out there. So logically, if you don't know shit, then you shouldn't be writing anything. Yet here we are. We welcome you, our first year students, and commend you for being chosen. You've each been selected for your exceptional qualities. If you know your vows already, you may recite them now. I vow to think about anything that's not wet, loud, kissing. One of your strengths isn't writing! Moving on to episode 3, carrying the name Transformations. I don't like where this is going. The episode opens with the girls hanging out at the cusp of the day's everything hour. Sage and Rosemary have yet to decide their focus for the free period, which leaves Sage feeling anxious. Cartography, levitation, or. Should I stick to something practical, like astromancy? Breathe, Sage. We've got the week to decide. You'll find something that floats your goat. There are too many options! Might this be a place for some self-reflection? Does Sage have to look inward? Ponder about what she truly wishes to accomplish as a guardian? Make some tough decisions? A mini arc of sorts for the episode? Nah, this is High Guardian Spice we are watching. For all her spassing, Sage just walks to the potions lab, starts brewing, does her magic stuff, and the issue is never mentioned again. 
Meanwhile, Rosemary is not worried in the slightest. Airhead that she is. In fact, she is so preoccupied with trying to kill a fly with her sword. A fly with her sword. That she suddenly forgets how to grip her trusted tool of potential manslaughter. And flings the thing across the yard. Hitting a perfectly placed rock. That's just there. In the middle of the otherwise neat and tidily kept garden. Breaking the pommel of the weapon. And at that exact moment, Fime saunters to the scene, roasting Rosemary as reliably as ever. Nice one. First lesson is how to take pride in your weapons. Listen, you pointy... I like to think that she was patiently waiting in the shadows the whole time. Waiting for the time when, and not if, Rosemary screws up. If only the other girls were this sharp and punctual. Don't you have somewhere else to be? Maybe haunting an old clock tower? Huh. You've been working on those comebacks. What? Huh? What does that even mean? Haunting an old clock tower? Is Fime a ghost? Are you saying she's a bat? A gargoyle? What was that line? Come now, Fime. You don't have to humor this wishy-washy would-be sorceress. You are better than that. That comeback was shit. Time! You're on your way to class, yeah? I was just telling Sage how you chose enchanted marksmanship for everything hours. Yeah, but I'm on my way to archery. But you just said that... How? Why? Huh? It's the everything hours. And you just said you chose enchanted marksmanship. Why are you heading to archery? Do the students have everything hours at separate times? No, that can't be the case. We see Fime later on just milling about her own beeswax. Clearly not in the middle of class. This dialogue, this world building, it can't even remain consistent from one spoken line to the next. I'd actually like to introduce something here. It's the patented Lobster Hero's first rule of High Guardian Spice Analysis. You can take any moment from the show, any line of dialogue, and I guarantee that it is contradicted somewhere else in the show. Turn that into a drinking game, and try to see how long you'll last till you are desperate for a liver transplant. I've ruined the one thing that matters to me. Okay, yes, fucking finally. This is what I've been waiting for. A perfect opportunity for Rosemary to grow as a person. Her foolhardy ways will inevitably get someone hurt. She just broke her mother's precious sword, injured her legacy. She must realize that being a guardian is something to be taken seriously. Life won't just accommodate her forever. It's time to leave her sheltered, selfish life behind and embrace the responsibility that comes with the title of guardian. This must be what sets Rosemary on a path of bettering herself, right? Some honest-to-goodness character development at long last. I mean, the writers wouldn't be so utterly tone-deaf and clueless that they would actually absolve Rosemary, even after she showcases time and time again how irresponsible and reckless she is and are you fucking kidding me? The sword was already broken all along. Rosemary's mother broke the thing on a mission long time ago. And it's fixed just like that. Sure, that's fine. That's just fantastic. Why should there be any need for character development? Why should anyone face actual consequences for their actions? Proper life lessons clearly aren't on the list of this show's priorities. Obviously, I'm the dumb one for expecting anything more. Fuck me, basic setup and payoff, Jesus fucking Christ. All we get from this is Rosemary activating her flashback mode. Her mother, quote, teaches her how to hold her weapon, doing a demonstrably shitty job at it. We learn nothing new about their relationship, nor about Lavender, the mother, as a character. And the lesson itself is as bare bones as anyone could possibly write. Find your center. The weapon is an extension of you. It'll give you strength. The show has nothing of its own to offer. We know nothing about Lavender's philosophy as a warrior. What are her values? Her fighting style? Is she a fierce bruiser? A calculating tactician? A noble samurai type? 
We get nothing. She has no insight to give to her child. The whole thing gives the sense that the author didn't even really want to write a lesson. So they just cobbled together the most basic set of platitudes possible. Lavender is a strong independent woman. And her twerp offspring will follow in her vague footsteps. And that's all we need to know. Something of note, and the only sort of interesting part in all this, is that Lavender purposefully left the sword in Rosemary's care. Implying that she knew beforehand that she was going to disappear soon. And yet, this fact is never pointed out by anyone. And to hell with this sword by the by. Aside from the obvious, the fact that it's overly decorated and fragile for a tool that's meant for actual combat, and that it is far too weighty to be handled by Rosemary, the name is utterly lame. This sword was given to me by my mother. She, the sword, has a name. Flowering Thorn. Flowering Thorn. Flowering Thorn? How long did it take you to come up with that? Oh yeah, my OC is so cool, her name is Rosemary, and her sword is called Flowering Thorn. Please don't steal. I know that your well of inspiration is as deep as a puddle, but come on, you could at least try. Call it the Quartz Thorn, or the Spice Slicer, or something like that. A bit of flavor, effort. And while we are on the subject of priceless heirlooms getting nicked and cracked... Ah, must be reinforced. Uh, how often do you take it in for a tune-up? <sighs> Never, dimwit. The sword's immutable. <laughs> She's right. It gets nicked, the hilt can break, but the metal's enchanted, so, uh... <laughs> so there's a spell that can keep a blade flawless for all eternity. Or at least for a good number of years? Is that old magic? New magic? Who cast the spell? If there's no cost, then why isn't every weapon enchanted like this? Why wouldn't the person making the spell cover the entire weapon instead of just the blade? Can the spell be cast on any object? Can it be used on people? Why isn't everyone walking around with an invisible perma shield protecting them? It's never stated that the spell only works on metal or such, so... Like I said, first law of Highguardian Spice. So what is one to do when their precious tool of death gets banged up? Fuck all, just sulk about it. That's Rosemary's advice. It's not like she has both a protege mage and an ultra-talented blacksmith right there beside her. No siree, it's better to do absolutely nothing instead of asking for help. You stupid, worthless, cotton candy brained muppet. And these two aren't any better. Why don't either of them offer to fix the sword? It's not even a question of whether or not they could actually do it in the end. It's just what friends do. You see your friend in trouble, and you do anything in your power to help them. They can both clearly see how broken Rosemary is about the whole thing. Sage could try to whip up some sort of fixer-upper spell. And we've literally seen Parsley create daggers out of nothing by banging her hammer twice. Clearly she has some kind of magical prowess of her own. They both literally have a free period right now. Why don't they make helping Rosemary their everything hours project? At least for the day? Both of them are either morons, or they are being real bad friends here. On the other hand, maybe they are both just salty about the whole... I've ruined the one thing that matters to me. But that's par for the course. Common sense, logical plot structure, and characterization can all go hump a cactus. You see? The episode has other priorities in mind. Beep, beep. The savior for Rosemary's woes suddenly arrives to the frame out of nowhere in the form of Professor Caraway. Now honestly, who struts around randomly while reading a book? You can't see where you are going if you focus on the text, and you cannot focus on absorbing the information if you are forced to constantly mind your surroundings. This is not something a normal person does. This is fake. 
It's posing. It's something one does when they wish to appear deeper and more intellectual to the people around them. When a person of true intellect wants to immerse themselves in a text, they do so alone, at peace, at their own dwelling, somewhere where they know they won't be bothered. Someone who is truly confident in themselves and their mind has no need to flaunt their supposed erudition in the presence of others in this kind of empty manner. Reading a book is not supposed to be a performative act, unless you are making an audiobook, but that's a whole another thing. Caraway shit is the same kind of posturing as all those booktubers and other adjacent reviewers who film themselves in front of a stacked bookcase in a pathetic attempt to seem more professional. As in, look how much I read, ooh, I know my stuff. Yeah, no, you are the same dumpster brain spewing worthless nonsense as anyone else. Clearly, your wealth of experience hasn't affected your intelligence or taste in any way. In reality, we never see Caraway giving any proper lessons to the students. What little he ever says is either something childishly elementary or just utterly incomprehensible. He has no wisdom to impart, not in the classroom, nor outside. Basic platitudes and nonsense babble is the best we get. Everyone's a little bit shy, it's the first day. I've been there. But you've got to be brave if you want to be a guardian. Like me. <laughs> I trust you're having a glorious day. Depends on what you consider glorious. So many things. The way life gifts us with changes. Like new that? seasons, new friends, yeah. new grogs. <laughs> oh, wait, you're serious. Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> I'm jumping ahead a whole lot here, but I want to show you this one clip in particular to showcase just how utterly incompetent Caraway is at his job. So in the final episode of this travesty, we have our main villain disguising himself as Caraway. The details aren't important, so let's just roll with it. The real Caraway struts in, sees the doppelganger, and what does he do? Does he whip out his wand and incapacitate the threat with a quick spell? Of course not, because that would make sense. Instead, he runs up to the villain and starts tussling with him, so that the girls get confused about which of them is which, and we end up with a Mexican standoff. How the hell does an experienced warrior mage screw up this badly? You are a long-ranged fighter. Why the fuck are you running at your opponent to have a fist fight? You impulsive, dumbass child. And his reaction to the villain casting his own spell is equal to that of a snail on sedatives. Oh yeah, sure. Just let your opponent knock down and possibly kill one of your students. Lucky this was apparently a non-lethal spell. Even though the villain's one and only goal here is to kill everyone in the room and... And I'm digressing. I fucking hate this show. Let's back up to the topic at hand. I'll deal with this shit later. Who wrote this? And were they high on spice? This is literally the only time in the entire show Caraway has a chance to showcase his skill and experience in action. And this is what we end up with. What an absolute cretin. The creator's intent behind Caraway is clear. He is supposed to be a highly learned archmage, a respected instructor in this esteemed academy for warrior heroes, a cerebral and approachable shoulder to lean on for the students, a wise and admirable, inspirational figure, a real teacher of the year type, that much is obvious, but it doesn't matter what the writers are going for or what their intent is for the character. Execution is everything. You cannot just claim that your character is proficient or smart or witty. It needs to be shown, it needs to be palpable and it needs to be consistent. It is the writer's job to convince me, the audience. It's the same thing as with the Spice Girls. 
the writers would claim they are such good friends, but half the time their conduct is completely against that notion. The borderline indifference they show towards Rosemary in her moment of sorrow, even though they literally have nothing better to do at the moment, whilst holding all the power to fix things. Rosemary, find us after. We'll fix this. Miss you. Love you. See you so soon. Bye, bitch. This is not how friends act. The girls are bad at being friends. Caraway is bad at being a teacher. Or a functional adult for that matter. And yet, the story never calls any of them out for it. The character's failings aren't treated as flaws. That's the crux of the issue. The script is so horrendous that the depiction of the entire cast ends up being a jumbled mess. Caraway is a phony. That's his actual portrayal on screen. Instead of true wisdom or skill, he has props, smoke and mirrors to fool the people around him. The only reason someone like him isn't called out for his horse shit is that everyone else in the show's universe is apparently even dumber than he is. He wears the skin of a teacher, an intellectual, of an adult, without actually being any of those. He's a person who likes to pretend they are something they are not. Much like the creators of this show. Anyway, Professor Texmex invites Rosemary for a chat. Supposedly to discuss Rosemary's yet to be decided focus for the everything hours. It's time to choose your discipline. You can't really deny your legacy. But I already have battle classes. Sure, those cover broad stroke stuff. What the shit? What do you mean they cover broad stroke stuff? I've said it multiple times, and I'll say it again. This is a school with the specific purpose of training warrior heroes to protect the realm. The trainees are literally called guardians. So what the show is saying is that this highly specialized school doesn't in fact teach their students sufficiently in their chosen field of combat, and instead the students have to train on their own, unsupervised. Then what the fuck is even the point of the academy in the first place? The whole idea behind teachers and schools is that there is someone actually teaching the kids. If the twerps are just gonna swat their swords around on their own anyway, then they can do it anywhere. Preferably someplace where none of them end up hacking their fellow men to pieces. To hell with this backwards ass piece of shit academy. This is pure insanity. Not a single school worth shit in existence works like this. No human works like this. No one can be this stupid. The writers have to be aliens. This is the only plausible explanation for this. Anyway, Rosemary ends up picking swordsmanship as her everything hours focus. Yay, who saw that one coming? In the end, all the main characters' picks for their focus are painfully obvious. The archer practices marksmanship, the mage does magic -y stuff, the blacksmith works at a forge, and the one with the sword trains in swordsmanship. And to be fair, these choices are indeed the only correct ones. But that begs the question of what even is the point of everything ours in the first place. The correct choice for everyone is to focus on their immediate field of expertise. So why doesn't the academy simply have proper classes each day in those fields? Fuck the pottery and the ballet. Train the kids how to handle their weapons. Going deeper than simply broad stroke stuff. Yeah. It's quite different than facing the world with a terror sphere. Keep at it. <laughs> the concept of everything ours has no bearing on the story. It should have been cut entirely. Introducing it is a complete waste of time. Time that could have been spent on fleshing out something actually important. Say like... What the fuck is... Guardian. We are three episodes in. And the show has yet to give any kind of proper parameters for what being a guardian actually means. 
I use terms such as warrior heroes to describe them, but that's me giving the show the benefit of the doubt. After all, their goals seem to be painted as righteous. The Guardian O, for example, is a list of vague virtues, bravery, self-sacrifice, stuff like that. So I can only assume that an all-encompassing Justice League approach is what they are going for? Mind the hypocrisies. In the show itself, it's never stated what the organization's specific goal is. Nor do we learn what kind of authority the Guardians have. Are they comparable to police? The military? Are they mercenaries? Do they work in the private sector? Or are they under the rule of the government? Whatever the fuck that is in this show. Seriously, we do not even know whether this land they live in is a monarchy, a republic, some kind of theocracy, or just a cluster of city-states. The realm is called Scarborough Kingdom, mentioned once. But is that a modern-day kingdom, as in the United Kingdom with a parliament? Or an actual tyrannical monarchy? We never hear anyone mentioning anything along the lines of for the glory of the crown, or their royal highness. And then there are other areas that are mentioned aside from Lingarf, like the witch country. Is that part of the kingdom, or a separate neighboring country? We do not know. The world building is so bare bones that rapid street dogs are gnawing on it, desperately trying to find at least some sustenance. Alas, in vain. I'm saying the world building is shit. The only times we see guardians on official missions, it's always something as basic as getting rid of some random monster. We get a flashback about Caraway and Lavender on a quest together. They slay a manticore. Okay. And? Why did they do this? Was the creature attacking some remote village? Did you need materials from it to create a complex and rare magical remedy? What were the stakes? What's the actual reason for any of this? We never get to know. There is no story here, no setup, and no payoff. No drama, no reason to give a damn. It's just empty spectacle. Except it doesn't even work as that, since the animation is as limp as ever, and the choreography is one enormous yawn. It's actually quite telling about the mental maturity of the writers. Oh no, there's no need to write an actual story. Just have these D&D rejects killing a few beasts. That's what fantasy is all about, right? The life of a guardian is like some filler side quest from a video game. So Rosemary has her focus, great. And Caraway fixes up her sword, fantastic. So what else do we get out of this exchange? Well, the show has some interesting revelations in store for us. Caraway tells Rosemary how he and her mom used to be the bestest of buddies back in the day. Which leads to some obvious questions, remaining unanswered, as is the style of this show. Questions like, why didn't Lavender ever mention Caraway to Rosemary? And how come Caraway never visited her closest friend after graduation? The lives of these two, their careers, and the future aspirations of Rosemary are so intertwined that I refuse to believe for a second that Rosemary wouldn't be aware of Caraway long before attending the academy. Her mother would have spoken about her supposed friend several times. Once again, the way all of this happens in the show is not how normal people act. This is just blatantly lazy writing, and the reason behind it is clear. The writers want all this information to be new to Rosemary, so that they have an excuse to tell it to the audience by proxy. It's the same thing as with Parsley having to explain how classes work to the rest of the girls, even though they should all be equally in the know. Moment to moment, this show is truly a marvel. The writers completely ignore basic information that would make the story and the world function properly. And at the same time, what little exposition they do give is dispensed in the most awkward, unrealistic manner possible. This is why you need to redraft your script. 
everything in a story is connected. Dialogue, characters, motivations, world building, moment to moment narrative. All of this needs to mingle and flow naturally. Every story beat and spoken line of dialogue has to go through a simple checkup in the writer's mind. Does it make sense for my character to actually say and do this? Clumsy exposition is a surefire way to kill immersion. And if the writer gives a flying fuck, then errors like these are super easy to iron out and make more natural with the tiniest of tweaks. For example, instead of Caraway initiating the conversation about Lavender, have Rosemary reach out to him. Something like... Man, I bet mom never messed up like me back when you two were my age. All those times I listened you two recite your adventures. Just makes me think. I'm just not sure I'll ever be half the guardian my mom was. Have it so that Rosemary already knows Caraway. Maybe he was a close family friend a long time ago. Perhaps Caraway used to visit Pebble and her dear friend from time to time. Maybe he stopped visiting since Lavender's disappearance. He might rationalize it as being too busy as a teacher, but deep down, he knows that he's staying away to shield his own heart. Visiting Pebble without his best friend there would make everything too real. He would have to face the fact that his confidant is gone. It would be too painful to bear. Perhaps he feels guilty about not being there for Rosemary in her grief? and now tries to make up for the lost time by personally guiding her. You see, everything makes vastly more sense, and we end up with some actual characterization to boot. The writers can otherwise have the exact same conversation between these two, and exposition all they want. Except... There is another, more sinister reason behind this entire scene. No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 Man, you've got so much cool stuff in here. Oh, is that a lizard? You are just like her. Who? The lizard? You're an idiot! You know my mom! Do you know where she is? Please, tell me everything about her. W were you close? Was she amazing? What does she smell like? Now you say another word and I swear to God I will dice you into a million little pieces. And put those pieces in a box. A glass box. That I will display. Lavender and I met when we were students here together. Our first year. We were a lot like you and your friend Sage, actually. What? How? Totally inseparable. This was our first everything hours, dorks. Mom looks so fierce in the uniform. Is... is that your sister? It's me, actually. You are a girl? <laughs> I'm transgender. Anyway, how is your sex life? I'm gonna lay this out as simply as possible, so that no one misses my actual point here. The writers refuse to share vital information about the world and the story. The exposition in this show is either non-existent or scattershot at best. The team behind this animated series don't have the willingness, or the talent, or the time, or the budget to actually explain anything, to tell a functioning story. But what they do have time for, is explain the concept of transgenderism. I don't know that word. I was born into a female body, but it wasn't the right body for me. So, I used new magic to change it. Cool! You can do that? I is that kind of transformation magic permanent? I take a potion once a month to keep the spell active. Which lets me be the real me. Now that we are all on the same page about what is happening here, I'm gonna explain why this whole exchange is absolutely dreadful. Caraway gives a photo album to Rosemary, and unless Caraway thinks Rosemary is an utter retard, he knows that she is gonna notice something is off about the pictures. He knows that Rosemary will ask about it, 
and he knows he will get the opportunity to share his stunning and brave life choice with this 14 year old girl. Caraway purposefully leads the conversation into including his body morphing magic. This fact alone elevates this conversation from awkwardness into the realm of insidiousness. I'll state this plainly, because there is no reason to dress up something this obvious. It is not the job of a random member of the education staff to discuss matters of sex, sexuality, or anything having to do with genitals with their underage students. Every person who advocates for this kind of behavior is a groomer. Either sexual or ideological variety, bonus points if both. Caraway is a self-centered deviant crossing the boundaries of common decency in leaps and bounds. And the same goes for the creators as well. And on further note, the fact this explanation exists in the show in the first place, regardless of who is in the room to hear it, is utterly absurd. Think about it. Who is this show made for? A wider topic would be to whom the average product at Crunchyroll is made for, but for the sake of this conversation, let's say this show is made for mature audiences. The trigger warning at the beginning would indicate as such. So if this show is made for mature audiences, older teens and adults, then by all logic, they would not need this explanation. Is there truly anyone who doesn't know what a trans person is? But if we are being perfectly honest, we should note that vast portions of the anime and cartoon viewing populace are underage. The material itself is certainly aimed at underdeveloped minds. Let's be real here, a goddamn trigger warning isn't gonna keep the kiddiewinks away. And any adult in the industry who tries to argue that they aren't aware of this fact is a filthy liar. So yes, the creators are trying to sell their propaganda to kids as well. Adult people are free to do as they wish, as long as it doesn't affect the lives of anyone else. But if you try to infect growing minds with issues they have no way of properly handling, indoctrinating them, experimenting on them, using them as pawns for your social change, then we have a problem. Cross that line and be prepared to be called what you are. Self-interested, degenerate, subhuman trash. This is only fair. And if we examine this scene from pure writing point of view, it doesn't fare any better. Nothing about this is natural. Rosemary's okay cool reaction to this huge concept being added to her vocabulary is ridiculous. In reality, there would be a lot more questions and questioning of the entire concept. Nothing about this back and forth flows like an actual conversation. The dialogue is as awful as ever, it's like a rehearsed PSA between two people, suddenly popping up in the midst of a larger conversation. No one communicates like this. It's a very modern reflection of the world. Our characters are really diverse, our cast is really diverse, and that's one of the things that excited me the most about it. You hear this type of sentiment often from modern creatives like this. Diverse characters are the way to go which, if translated to normal people speak, means anything other than white heterosexual men. Because the existence of white heterosexual men in prominent roles in fiction is... a problem. Because... reasons. I'm not insane, so I don't know. In any case, the people fixated on race and sex and sexuality identity of any kind, are free to make whatever they like. Obviously. Do what you want, express yourself. Make every character you want into transvestite, pansexual, queer, black Asians with Tourette's, or whatever the fuck the flavor of the month happens to be for you. And hey, if the story is good, then I'm all up for it. After all, there really are no inherently bad ideas, only bad execution. 
And following from that, to the entire writing staff, I say this. This was your chance. You had your very own story, a clean slate, you were free to create anything. Crunchyroll had given you the platform, all the opportunity and publicity you could want. Now was the time to bring in your A-game, to showcase your writing chops, to blow everyone away with your array of wonderfully diverse, fully-fledged characters, meaningful dialogue and a gripping narrative. Well, here's the end result. This here is definitive proof that people who are obsessed with stuff like this, who live just to whine about how there's never enough this or that type of people represented in pop culture, are incapable of writing anything worth shit. They are bad at their job, pure and simple. This is the one thing they claim to care about, and yet they have no idea how to integrate these themes and character traits into the narrative. A character just declares, I'm trans by the by, instead of coming up with a clever way to weave the fact into the story, or just leaving it to be inferred by the audience, we get this. I'm trans. This is what qualifies as writing to these people. This is the best they can come up with. These people are worthless. They have no love nor passion for storytelling. All they care about is having character type X on screen and making sure everyone knows it. Shallow, self-absorbed, insignificant people playing as authors. Their minds, souls and hands are incapable of creating anything worth investment. Bottom line, this forced exposition about commonly known concepts exists in this show solely as representation and to normalize said representation. And even at that, the show fails miserably. The trans experience in the show is turned into an absolute joke. Just like with every other instance of magic, the spell to spontaneously sprout a dick or vagina doesn't carry any kind of cost. It is even implied that it can be reversed just as easily, anytime the person so wishes. This kind of representation is completely detached from reality. It ignores all psychological, biological and societal implications and makes the entire thing tantamount to changing one's socks. It's just that you came out the wrong sex and ruined everything. The girl a penis to get lost. The fact that Caraway is so eager to announce his own trans existence is absolutely mental. You see, I'm a thinking person, a logical being, so I have to ask, isn't the whole point of transitioning to be viewed as the chosen sex? And not as a person who used to be the opposite sex? Shouldn't the end goal of the whole trans experience be not to identify as trans man or a trans woman, but rather simply male or female? But therein lies the paradox. To these people, creators like this, it's never about achieving anything. It's never about arriving to the logical endpoint, actual progress. It's about perpetually remaining as a fringe identity so that one may feel special and reap the benefits in this crazy modern world of ours. This is representation in the most shallow form. It's identity as a fashion statement. Fucking disgusting. And truly, who would ever want to be represented by this kind of person? A self-important, talentless, rash, idiotic manlet who never takes responsibility for his own fuck-ups. Oh, wait! Do you know anything about transition magic? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
a couple of brief words to cap this thing off. Considering that my videos are intended for mature audiences, as dictated by YouTube's creator guidelines, I am sure we can all be rational adults about this. My mind is my own, my views are my own, and I expect the same from each of my viewers. Far as I'm concerned, everyone is welcome here, for as long as you feel like staying. Jokes and chaps aside, I will never advocate for bigotry, but I will also call out things for what they are. As you might have noticed, I aim to have a bit more nuance than the average entertainment reviewing Joe, and focus on things that actually matter. Small things, like the cohesion of storytelling itself, regardless of social issues and politics. In truth, I would never go out of my way to discuss this shit, my interests lie elsewhere, but I have decided to come through and critique this show in what many would call excessive detail, so that includes this scene also. My standards are consistency and common sense. Every story and every author has the exact same opportunity to either impress or disappoint, and I will treat each issue with brutal honesty. This I promise you. My problem is never the existence of character X, or the fact that their creator belongs to a certain group, my problem is flat characterization and retarded storytelling. Amazing, I know. If you have thoughts, share them in the comment section below. That's what it's there for. So meanwhile, Rosemary is sitting at Caraway's office, getting all her mistakes fixed for her, and receiving tutoring on the one actual new concept she'll learn across her entire time studying at the academy, Parsley is busy banging away at the forge. Thanks for letting me use this station for my Everything Hours project. Oh, of course. I'm glad you're um, I'm making a... Um, what is that? No, oh, it's not anything yet. Just bothering some metal to get my hammer used to this forge. To reiterate, Parsley is currently busy literally wasting her time with nothing. And yet, the possibility of doing something constructive Helping Rosemary with her worries never crosses her mind. Anyway, to spice up her everything hours, the teacher comes to Parsley with a special mission. I have an important job for you. What you need? You'll need the right tool for this. Hmm. One of the portraits in the far hallway is all screwy. Needs to be rehung. You'll know which one it is because of how it's all screwy. Here's the right tool. Oh, okay, sure. See you. How specific and also random. Where's this far hallway? Which hallway is that? How is Parsley supposed to find it? Or is there a part of the school that is literally called the far hallway? What the fuck? Oh, and never mind the question of why you yourself haven't fixed it already, since you clearly have witnessed the problem firsthand. In any case, Parsley heads out to complete this most important task. The portrait in question ends up being of the triad, the headmistresses of the school. Curiously, the characters in the portrait shift position as the frame tilts. Because Harry Potter, I guess? And as a side note, because I can't imagine where else to mention this, the very existence of the triad is an unnecessarily muddled concept. Clearly, there's something funky going on with them. They look similar enough to be related, but it's never clearly stated. Are they three generations of guardians who just happen to share the role of principal? Why would the responsibilities be split between three people in the first place? Or is this some kind of especially powerful mage who has somehow severed themselves across three distinct temporal states? I'm just tossing ideas here. The most tangible information we get about the trio is a single throwaway line in episode 11. It's a blink and you miss it moment, but here it is. Ah, being a mortal with you two is exhausting. So on top of every other high concept with little to no explanation in the show, here we have these apparently immortal beings watching over the academy. Are they some other race entirely? 
Or is it a spell of some kind? Is it new or old? What kind of immortality are we talking about? Are they literally eternal? Are they indestructible? Or do they live only as long as they manage to avoid the pointy end of a halberd? This is not a small thing. Immortal beings walking amongst normal folk carries extremely heavy implications. Think of the wealth of knowledge and experience one could accumulate. How much prosperity or chaos one could spread with this kind of power? None of these implications are brought up. Whimsy for the sake of whimsy is the best faith interpretation there is. The triad are just there. Sometimes. Whenever it would be inconvenient for the plot for them to exist, such as when a devious villain infiltrates the school, they are nowhere to be found. Much like the portrait itself, they are needlessly complicated, useless decoration. They are barely characters. I mean, for fuck's sake, we never even learned the trio's actual names. Specifically, we do learn their names. Oleander, Hemlock, Foxglove, they are mentioned once off-handedly, in the midst of some other crap. But we aren't told which of them is which. They have names, we just don't know who is who. I have never encountered this kind of omission anywhere. Information that is at once given and kept from the audience at the same time. Not that it matters all that much, but it's an interesting mistake to add to the pile. It is never a good idea to just toss these kinds of high concept elements into a story for the sake of making everything feel more magical. Things like this are prime fodder for theory crafting, sure, but that is not the point of storytelling, having the audience write the story for you. It is the author's duty to tell their story, to explain how their worlds and characters and fantastical concepts work, to have it make sense. Simply dumping everything and anything from the storytelling spice cabinet into the narrative gravy will only result in unpalatable sludge. More often than not, simplicity is the most effective starting point for any author. Just focus on the immediate story you truly wish to communicate. You see, there is no way for the audience to know beforehand which details are important and which are just random clutter. Stuffing all these concepts into your story without narrative utility, just because they sound cool and mysterious in your head, will only result in the audience pondering about things that have no bearing on the actual story. If the audience has an endless list of unanswered questions, it makes it unnecessarily hard for them to focus on the characters and the moment-to-moment -moment narrative. If the world and its possibilities are poorly defined, then it is impossible to have stakes, because the immediate question in any conflict will be why doesn't this character simply do this obvious thing? Or why don't the heroes just use such and such to fix everything? If the triad are immortal guardians, then why aren't they constantly on the field, saving innocent lives, fighting the good fight, protecting the land from any and all threats? The only logical reason is that they are either idiots, lazy, or selfish. And I'm sure that is not the author's intent, yet here we are. But of course, this line of reasoning only applies if your audience has their IQ above room temperature. If you believe your audience to be drooling dumb fucks, then you can obviously ignore everything I just said, and just keep slamming your face against the keyboard. Now steering back from the side tangent, Parsley fixes up the stilted portrait by clinking the frame with a hammer instead of the classic method of just straightening it. But hey, she was given a hammer, gotta use it for something. But in a surprising twist of fate, a trapdoor suddenly opens up and swallows Parsley in a bottomless pit, never to be seen again. <laughs> No, no, never mind, she's just fine. And before you put too much effort into trying to make sense of the whole random Looney Tunes trapdoor shenanigans, just hold off for a minute. 
because this whole series of events quickly becomes more... just more. So on this random hallway, there is a trapdoor that leads into a pit, that leads into a set of catacombs, that leads into a tunnel, that leads into a cave full of fluorescent parasects, that leads to a door that needs to be opened by inserting a pole into a hole next to the door, that eventually leads into a storage room, that leads into a crawl space, that has a set of nails, which after getting hammered, open up a door that leads back into the forge. What the hell was that? And in case you are wondering, no, that is it. I swear I didn't leave anything out. But the same cannot be said about the show. All this to hang a picture. We escaped the dungeon, we found our way out of that bizarro broom closet, we solved a dozen riddles for the grog mob, saved a hornet's marriage, climbed walls, climbed between walls? What are you talking about? That never happened. So let me lay this out. Instead of even attempting to answer any of these obvious questions, the show decides to waste close to 5 whole minutes, that's 25% of the episode, on this utterly useless misadventure. And not only that, the show also decides to leave out the part of this travesty that actually sounds like something of substance. This is the worst kind of fluff B-plot I have yet to see in any show. The word filler does not begin to describe this. The actual content happens off-screen, and the only thing we get to see is the character moving from place to place. This is blatant waste of the audience's time, and an insult towards everyone's intelligence. I cannot fathom how something like this makes it into any finished product. At no point of production, not while writing, storyboarding, animating, voice acting, no one in the team questioned any of this. No one pointed out how none of this makes sense, or that half the plot is missing. This kind of aimless bumbling is the first thing to get axed from any script. Provided the author cares to do even a single redraft. But in the name of fairness, there must be something the writers are going for. In their mind, surely, there must be some utility to this subplot. What is the takeaway here? That was a test. Good job. You passed. Wait, what was the test? I've been lost for hours. You could say that. Or you could say you've been excelling at the use of one tool for hours. A dinky little mallet? So apparently, Parsley needed to learn this important lesson. The lesson that you can in fact use a tool in more ways than one. The fact that you can shove a stick into a hole, you can use a hook to climb, and you can, indeed, hammer down nails with a literal hammer. This is a show made by adults, for adults. And that is highly presumptuous from the teacher, isn't it? Just assuming that Parsley wouldn't be already enlightened about all the wonderful uses for a dinky little mallet. When was it implied that she wouldn't be proficient with any kind of tool? What's the logic here? Or was it because she nearly orgasmed by the sight of those beefy hammers? Was the whole reason for this exercise so that Parsley grew to appreciate tiny wimpier tools? Instead of lusting after meaty mazes. Take that as you wish. Whoa, Parsley, have you been rolling in mulch? Funny story, actually. I'll tell you what's funny. The writers had vastly more organic way of implying Caraway's past and identity in the same episode, no less. And still they decided to approach the matter with all the finesse of a mallet to the face. Since we are three episodes in, and all the plot we've gotten thus far has been aimless faffing, chasing critters, inconsequential schoolyard drama, repetitive woes with legacy, and a total lack of world building, the viewer may begin to develop a question on the back of their mind. A simple question. When is the story gonna start? Well, I'm glad to inform you that the main conflict of the show will be introduced in this episode. 
at the very end, literally in the final minute of the episode, and it's not so much introduced as it is alluded to. But no matter, at least the tale can finally, finally begin. The following episodes will be all tightly focused on the central narrative, right? Right? If you are raising your eyebrow in skepticism, then I've taught you well. Out of the 12 episodes this spoil of a show has been allowed to fester, only episodes 8, 9 and 12 have an actual significance in furthering the main plot. By which I mean developments, events and new information which move the story forward. And that's me being generous. The laughably tiny amount of main plot in this entire show could be fit into a single episode. Most of the runtime even in these plot-centric episodes is wasted on nothing. Even while there's an actual crisis going on, a villain scheming to murder everyone, the authors think that a substantial part of the episode's runtime should be given to mermaid cosplay and shitty VR games. Yes, this ye old fantasy world has VR games. I'm dead fucking serious. There is barely any true conflict to unfold even in these three episodes. The core story of this show could be summed up as villain wants to kill heroes, the heroes defeat them, rinse and repeat once more for good measure. Think about it. The basic opening act of any proper action show already has that exact amount of plot. Aside from that, episodes 4, 5, 6, 7, 10 and 11 have absolutely no bearing on the central conflict. All of them are the same kind of useless running in circles as the first three episodes. At best I might say they are character focused filler episodes, but that would be giving them disgustingly too much credit. But every detail will be covered in due time. For now, we still have one final plotline to dissect back in episode 3. Sage's subplot for the day has her witching it up old school at the potions lab. My family is old magic. Like, old old. I grew up watching my mother use her body to pull magic from the earth. I thought, that's how it's done, you know? It drains you. It's like, there's always a cost. But this new magic is so different. It's like a language I don't understand. Old magic tools I know. I can find my way around a broom, or a cauldron, a wand. This new magic stuff? There is no cost. They can just do things. Cut their hair. Fly around the world. Make a castle out of sausages. <laughs> I want to master all the tools we have here. And I hope you enjoyed that explanation, because that is the closest this show ever musters to clarify how the magic in the universe works. As you may have noticed, it doesn't explain anything. Not really. Everything is stated in the vaguest of terms. Sage reminisces her mother pulling magic from the earth. Does she mean channeling some kind of magical energy from deep within the planet? Or does she mean literally pulling vegetables out of the ground for potion brewing? She states that old magic drains you, and there's always a cost. But why would drawing magical energy from the earth drain the magic user? Shouldn't the entire point of drawing magic from the earth be that the energy being used comes from someplace else other than the user? The earth? Not the person themselves? So how does it drain them? This explanation is no explanation at all. Here's an idea. Why not do the same as with Rosemary? and give Sage a flashback of her mother practicing old magic. That way, you could show specifically how old magic works in action. You could have Sage's mother explain the principles, the philosophy, the storied history behind it. She could even have some solid arguments why the new style of magic is the stuff of heretics, turning everyone lazy and careless. She might lament how the new generations of mages are all talentless, pompous and reckless. She could make an appeal to Sage, asking her to always remain true to her roots and treat magics with respect. 
for with great power comes great responsibility. Anything would be better than this. Heck, even nothing would be better than this. This explanation only adds further contradictions and confusion to an already incomprehensible magic system. According to Sage, new magic users can do anything without a cost. Among other things, they can apparently fly around the world. But Sage herself uses a broom to fly in the very beginning of the show. So how is that any different? How does this drain her? She shows no signs of fatigue or the like. What's the cost here? And we never see anyone outright levitating without the help of brooms or staves. One big distinction seems to be that old magic users have to draw these runes in order to cast spells. And the new magic users utilize their Terrasphere wands to simply toss them around as they please. But what exactly is the cost here, drawing these symbols? The effort to move your fingers? Oh yeah, what a drain that must be for you, moving your goddamn fingers. And if you can cast spells out of nothing simply with these runes, then why do you need cauldrons and potions? The show never makes a distinction about what can be done with runes, and what must be done with physical tonics and the like. There's just a bit of everything, simply because the author so wishes. There are pots and potions, because that's what witches use, right? And there's neon colored runes, because that's cool, right? The utility of these concepts is never considered. It's purely visual flair, hollow and derivative, and nothing else. The lack of clear-cut rules in itself is laziness and incompetence from the writers, but what makes it absolutely inexcusable is the fact that Sage's entire existence in the show hinges on the old magic new magic dichotomy. Her story is supposedly all about learning the ins and outs of sorcery and the way all of it relates to her traditional slash old-fashioned upbringing. But if the audience doesn't have an adequate grasp of the rules and limitations and possibilities of magic, and subsequently the social implications, then it is impossible to craft personal drama around the culture of magic. There cannot be investment if the audience doesn't have a clue about what's going on. The narrative weight of everything having to do with magic is equal to, okay, if you say so. Bottom line, the magic in the show makes no sense. The different attributes of new and old magic are never consistent. There's a cost, there's no cost, none of these statements matter. Everything just is whatever the writers want at the moment because fuck you, it's magic, look at the pretty colors, also something something conservatism. And once again, as with every other scene we've suffered through thus far, even the most baseline logic is absolutely fucked. See, Sage brews up a potion, but while she does so, she peruses the spell book, as if still in the middle of deciding which spell to perform. Do all of these spells have the same base ingredients? That's mighty convenient. I know when I'm cooking, I always just boil a bunch of random spices, add a bit of cream, some veggies, let it simmer, not knowing what I'm actually making, and after I browse the cookbook for a bit and decide that I wanna make pizza instead, well, I guess we are having veggies to pizza tonight. Anyway, Sage's goal for the day, in her first week of studying at the academy, is a simple fundamental spell. Feline communication? Nappy, when I'm done with this spell, you're going to be able to speak at least five words. You can choose which ones. No swears, okay? How to make an animal talk. And what exactly makes Sage think she can do something so specific and complex? Gifting a creature the ability to speak is not a casual thing. We are not talking about teaching someone a few words in a different language, mind you. We are talking about a creature of lower intelligence suddenly being able to comprehend complex ideas and concepts. 
That's the same as if the creators of High Guardian Shite suddenly gained the ability to write properly. If this kind of spell was even theoretically possible, enough so that it's apparently listed in a common spell book, then every household pet would already be given the ability to understand speech. It would be treated the same way as neutering is in our world. Think how much simpler owning a pet would be if they could understand you even at limited capacity. Okay, that's enough. This is not the Playboy Mansion. Break it up. That's better. Some spheres grant eternal life. Mm, that's a bit much. Excuse me, uh, the, uh, the fuck did you just say? So while Sage is brewing her pot full of linguistics nectar, the local school bully and her crony arrive at the scene, also known as Amaryllis and Snapdragon. Not like they have everything hours of their own, both of them are just meandering around. Unless lukewarm insults are their focus for the free period. An infestation of nerds. <laughs> we came up here to get away from the peasants, but here you are. Ugh, is this what you eat? Real, you got to smell this. It's curious, isn't it? The people making this show are certainly the types of people who got their fair share of verbal whippings back in their academic years. I mean, just look at them. And yet, they have no ability to write effective and believable bullying. These lines and delivery are just lame and wimpy, bizarrely safe and family friendly even, certainly not the way someone who torments others on a daily basis speaks, this is just sad. But then again, these are the types of people who claim that everyone who dares criticize their creative work is somehow a homophobe, racist, sexist, bigot, literally the worst human alive, so we can count them as officially out of touch with reality. Seeing as her limp verbal jousting gets her nowhere, Amarilly steps up her game and tries to sabotage Sage's potion by throwing in a dragon testicle. I don't know, what is that? There's a bunch of them in all the colors of the rainbow. Taste the rainbow. Double, double, toil and trouble. Chaotic ingredients end up with chaotic effects. And thus, the ruined potion conveniently spills all over the school mascot Neppy and. Help me clean this up. You're gonna get in trouble if you go around throwing junk into people's homes. Ooh, are you going to? <laughs> <sighs> <sighs> I think I just threw up in my mouth. To reverse the spell, Sage just casually draws these magic symbols. How the fuck would she know how to do that? Has she done something like this before? Is there a universal anti-spell incantation that just resets everything? And pray tell, what would be the cost of something like that? But before Sage can finish up her reversal spell, the crime against nature dunks its hand in the potion that enlarged it in the first place, grabs the dragon testicle, which turns into Cardcaptor Sakura's ceiling wand, and the mutant feline jumps off the window, declaring that it has a mission. Now just what the fuck is going on here? The wise and house are rolling in at such a rate it's impossible to keep up. Lucky I have the pause button, so I guess the dragon testicle is a terra sphere, since it transformed into a wand. But why the fuck would a potions lab have a cookie jar full of these things just sitting there? How the hell does an omnicapable magical orb turn a random potion into mutating ooze? And more importantly, why would the school ever give these dumbass children the access to dangerous magical items without supervision? Do they want everyone to die? If these kids made this abomination by accident, then think of what they could do if they actually tried. The school shooting equivalent of this world would be horrific. And as the feline goes for the double dip, 
How come the potion suddenly does jack shit? Shouldn't it fuck up the poor creature even worse? How does the feline know to go for the Terra Sphere in the first place? Why would it? What's it gonna do with it? What mission has this mutant cat suddenly been blessed with by the fact that it has been mutated? Instead of screaming in agony, or questioning why it's even alive, it storms off on some utter nutshop crusade. What is any of this? Hello, Ebrinian! How are you? Why, thank you! Oh my god! The mutant cat flees across the schoolyard, spreading confusion and chaos, wet pants all around. The duo of dumb fucks try to zap it with spells, but the writers are incompetent, so the characters are conveniently incapable of aiming for shit. What else is new? And before moving any further, I have to point out that none of this will have any kind of consequences. No, I'm dead serious. None of the students are traumatized by this, the faculty will never be notified, the parents will never be notified, nobody cares that a fucking mutant Garfield just rampaged through the school grounds, no one gets into trouble, Sage and Amaryllis never even get a slap on the wrist for transmuting a helpless creature into a hideous monster and unleashing it upon the school, not to mention using a Rufy spell on a fellow student, or throwing around explosive blasts all willy-nilly, nothing about this entire sequence of events matters. This is pure pandemonium, and it's treated like it never happened. Reminder, this is the academy training the good guys. Luckily, the mutant kitty's path happens to cross with Fime's training place, and without asking any questions, the elf puts the cat out of its misery. Time! Is it dead? No, these arrows are tipped with napping potion. Could someone explain to me what's going on? Oh, my mistake. They just seem to burrow mighty deep. Kinda like any basic arrow. And they look exactly like normal arrows. And given the way the cat just slammed on his back, those arrows are all the way in his lungs. Napping potion or not. Also, napping potion? What are you, five? Call it sleep drug, you twat. Surprise, the mutant is still alive, and the arrows are just gone. Because of course they are. The girls catch up to the cat as it's honing its claws on a suspiciously isolated tree. Glowing with eerie light. Ooh. What? Nappy cat! What? <laughs> that is honestly the funniest line in the whole show. I'm serious. It's the delivery. It's at the same time so grouchy and nonchalant. As if the girls hadn't just pelted the cat with magic blasts and arrows, and chased him all across the woods, it still sounds surprised and irritated. It's like, what is it now, you dumb bitch? Can't you see I'm busy? The mutant keeps insisting it has a mission, Fime lets loose another barrage of arrows, and this time the potion does its job. For some reason, the cat reverts back to normal. How convenient. Yay, the day is saved. Kinda. Truth be told, the cat never harmed anyone. It never even tried to harm anyone. The dumbass mages were the ones who blasted half the schoolyard and their fellow students of the face of the earth. Our heroes, ladies and gentlemen. Also this. Amaryllis, that garbage you pulled made me lose my grip. I meant to cast a gentle, harmless spell. 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 You're a jerk. Jerk. Snap! What? Me? I don't... What's wrong? Neppy got your tongue? What can even be said about that? Sage puts on an angry face and vaguely chastises Amaryllis, and Snapdragon suddenly has tummy full of butterflies. Does he have a fetish for pouty-faced chicks? What is so different all of a sudden? I 
could sort of understand it if Sage just went all out rage mode and blasted Amaryllis verbally off into the stratosphere, then I guess it would be Snapdragon seeing Sage in a different light or something. But this is just lame. One moment there's nothing, and now Snap is all party. Sorry to tell you all fanfic writers out there, but this is not how human attraction works. There's a bit more that goes into it. And it's all the more sadder considering this is actually the beginning of a... ...romantic arc between these two. Just think about it for a second. Snap is enamored with Sage because she called his best friend a jerk for being a bully. A bully he himself supported. I'm just gonna put this right here. And I'm gonna place this question mark right over here. Because I honestly cannot fathom the brain chemistry of the author. This is just embarrassing. I'm actually embarrassed in the writer's behalf. I'm sorry you had to witness this. Moving the fuck on. So I did promise you that the grand central narrative of the show would begin by the end of the episode. Well, here it is. The mutant cat uses last of its strength to shove the ceiling wand into the tree, which causes the eerie glow to dissipate. I guess that was its mission? No clue why or how it would know to do any of this. In any case, apparently whatever the cat accomplished wasn't enough, as Fime gazes in horror at the roots of the tree. No. It's the rot. Wait, 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 wait. Explain yourself, Fime. What is the rot? How do you know about it? Is it dangerous? Should we notify the teachers that this magical plague is festering at the academy's backyard? No one asks any of these obvious questions, nor do the girls ever even consider the possibility of trying the spell anew, getting the cat talking again, and asking it directly what the fuck all of this was about. In fact, no one mentions this to anyone. No, no, the girls just meet up all smiles and sunshine, as if the whole mutant cat episode wouldn't be the talk of the entire school. All the students should be bombarding Sage with questions. What was that thing? Where is it now? What did it want? The whole incident with the rot would come to light within the span of that same afternoon. There is no way that it wouldn't. The rot itself is woefully underdeveloped. Eventually, once the show decides that Oh yeah, we had that whole magical calamity narrative going on. We should probably do something with it. All we get are vague statements about the magic in the world being out of balance. Which means absolutely nothing. What causes the rot? What does it do exactly? How does it spread? Why do the villains wish to cultivate it? This is supposed to be the main threat to this entire world. Every major conflict in the show revolves around it. And yet, it's hand waved away the same as with everything else having to do with world building. For the time being, everyone just goes on with their school life as if nothing happened. All except Fime, who broods in her lonesome about the rot, instead of notifying any of the authorities and enlisting their help. Because at the end of the day, she is the same as everyone else in the show, a self-centered dumbass lacking even the most basic capacity for problem solving or self-preservation. Episode 3 carries an important theme, one that permeates across the entire rest of the series. That theme being the lack of consequences. Absolutely nothing matters. None of these characters behave like people, no one asks the obvious, no one does the obvious, no one is responsible for their actions, Bullshit magic fixes every problem. Once the author decides it's time to wrap everything up, that is. The lack of logical cause and effect is the telltale sign of amateurish writing. And I have yet to witness a show that showcases this at a such consistent rate. And with that, we are fourth of the way done with High Guardian Spice. 
I'm gonna tear up the fucking dance floor, dude. Check it out. This show has a serious problem with pacing. Over half the runtime of this action adventure show about warriors and battle mages is low stakes, forgettable, trivial, slice of life filler. Oftentimes, the word filler is used purely as a disparaging term. It's commonly understood to mean parts of a story that exist outside the central narrative. Episodes, scenes, subplots, conversations, all of which could be at least theoretically removed from the story, and nothing significant about the plot would change. The author is padding out the story, killing time in between major story events. In the case of High Guardian Spice, we've already seen this in full effect. But it is also important to note that when utilized well, filler stories, as opposed to developments of the central narrative, serve a vital purpose in storytelling. Showing characters dealing with low-stakes situations, the calm everyday moments in between high-octane action gives the writers the opportunity to reveal to the audience just what kind of people the heroes are. When there's not much going on, the pure everyday nature of the characters rises to the forefront. Moreover, showing the humble happiness that comes from simple choice of life helps build stakes. It gives the heroes something tangible to fight for, the kind of peaceful existence they wish to protect, for themselves and for the people they love. Episode 11 of Fullmetal Alchemist Brotherhood, Miracle at Rush Valley, is one of the few filler stories in the entire series, and it is easily one of the strongest episodes. In fact, if I was asked to recommend the series to someone with only one episode as my argument, I would choose this one. It's wholesome, funny, and the characterization of the cast is fantastic. And it achieves the best thing a filler episode can do. It works as a piece of art all on its own. Same goes for episode 35 of Avatar The Last Airbender, Tales of Ba Sing Se. Even though it's an inconsequential collection of slice of life vignettes, it is widely considered one of the best episodes of the series. Character stuff? episodic standalone stories, all of that is fine and dandy, often they are even my personal favorite parts in any TV show. I do love my characters, and episodes that are considered filler are usually the ones that truly get me invested in the characters. Filler in itself is not a bad thing, as with all things in writing, the execution is what counts. But given the fact that all the High Guardian characters snort spy straight out the back, and the show's rather tight dozen episode runtime, it's best not to waste too much time on inconsequential trouble of the day episodes. The creators have chosen to make an action adventure show, as broad as that genre is. This is not supposed to be a slice of nothing ever happened show. If that was the case, there would be 100% less weaponry present in every single episode. Your chosen genre carries certain expectations. Things like... Something actually happening. The first three episodes have already been wasted on establishing the characters. As weak, bland and one note as they are, there is no excuse for there to be any filler episodes going forth. If you have a story to tell, then just tell the story and stop wasting your audience's time. If you want to delve deeper to the characters, then do it adjacent to the main narrative moving forward. Weave the character moments amidst the action, the travel, the intrigue. This is not new or groundbreaking. Every story worth the man hours put into them follows this formula. Since the dawn of storytelling. But if this show heeded common sense, 
then we wouldn't be here now, would we? That is one big pile of shit. Let's get shoveling. Episode 4 carries the name Past, Present. And it actually marks an important turning point in the series. You see, this is the point where the show becomes self-aware and decides to present an apt review of itself right out of the gate. My sentiments exactly. Uh... Hello? What are you doing in my room? We're trying to pack for the weekend, but Sage's trunk is not cooperating. What? That, that does not answer the question, you Nimrod. The point still stands. Why are you in my room, presumably packing your stuff? Who the fuck wrote this? And have you ever had an actual conversation with a fellow human being? If it's not too forward of me to ask. These kinds of logical fumbles are so obvious a six-year-old could pick on them. Ah, oh, this goddamn dialogue will be the end of me. The wider premise of the episode is that the school will be evacuated for a while. For pest control. Now pay close attention, cause this is important. Good morning, everybody! Get out of here immediately! Dozens of Travers got loose from the dungeon, and the school's crawling with them! Total evacuation until Monday. Okay, thanks, Professor Redbud. Good. <laughs> the crazy potion hack teacher explains the situation as if the girls weren't already getting ready to leave for that exact reason. This is a classic example of a clunky dialogue trope, which I personally call, as you know, exchange. It's whenever a story has one of the characters state something that everyone within earshot knows fully well, for the benefit of expo dumping something to the audience. It's jarring, it's unnatural, and I want every writer out there to stop this and take some pride in their craft. Weave the info into the narrative in other ways. People are smarter than most writers think. They can figure things out from context. Do not just have your characters blurt out obvious facts. This is not how people speak. And if you are honestly this desperate for filler dialogue, you might as well just give up and start killing time by having the characters talk about weather or whatever. So due to the infestation of Parasex, the girls will be spending a couple of days back at their... Folks? Parents? I was actually tempted to say guardians. Get it? Guardians of guardians? Oh brother, this guy stinks! But before they can head out, our duo of Apex retards are having trouble getting their sentient flying treasure chest to cooperate. Putting aside the existential horror that is implied by the fact that such a thing exists. Girl. And apparently it is a she. I don't even wish to know how you came to that conclusion. Huh, we've tried everything. Pliers, a spatula, a shovel. Tridents, spells. The squirrely kid down the hall who picks locks. Intimidation tactics, hostage negotiation. Charms, tickling. Have you tried asking nicely? Hmm. Please. Please, will you carry our things? Hey, hey, hey! There's my girls! Anise! Uh, we missed you! Welcome home, little guardians! Auntie Allo! How have you been? Auntie? <laughs> okay. <laughs> they must be zonked from all that schoolwork. Right, Sage? You cannot begin to imagine. And you know, then there was that time I transmuted the school cat into a 9 foot behemoth. But we don't talk about that. Since we've already spent two whole episodes at the central milieu of our tale, I guess it's high time we get the fuck out of there. It would be nice if the girls had some actual stories to share with their folks. Some personal growth to reflect upon. Perspective gained knowledge accumulated but no 
the heroes of our tale return from their non-adventure. For the time being, they exact people as they left. Placing the ending of the classic hero's journey smack at the center of the narrative is just weird. At best, it's a bump in the road, a waste of screen time. And at its worst, it squanders a perfectly good setup for emotional reunion. All this lovey-dovey hugging would have been better served at the end of the tale, the epilogue of the final episode for example, if the girls had actually spent any decent length of time apart from their loved ones, and faced hardship, returning to the warm embrace of home would reach entirely different emotional peaks. It would be a wholesome reward for the heroes at the end of an arduous path. There won't be any of the sort in this show, obviously, but if there were, the reunion at the end would feel like regurgitating a previous scene, it would be whatever. Naturally, part of the problem is the fact that the support network of each of the girls is such a teensy rock throw away. There's no true sense of adventure, venturing into the unknown, when the entire show basically takes place at the backyard of your lesbian cousin. But perhaps this reunion will at least give the chance to deepen the supporting cast, some meaningful interactions and defining attributes beyond Tumblr Dyke parody number 463 and a baking housewife elf. Are you ready for your greatest challenge yet? Beignets! Fuck me for asking. And just as a quick side tangent, because I already went over this, but it keeps pissing me off. The elf casually uses teleportation magic all the time for the most frivolous things. Old magic, mind you, at no apparent cost. Now in any conflict in the show, anytime anyone is in trouble, the immediate question from the audience will be, why not simply teleport? Transport yourself to safety? or transfer the tools you need right into your hand. The stakes of this show are non-existent. Every magic user should be spamming this one spell, resolving every single conflict as soon as it arises. Limitations are good. Limitations make us think. Limitations force us to become creative. So please, save your story from starvation, give it stakes, and give your magic limitations. Meanwhile, this show is busy making every single aspect of magic as nonsensical as they can be. To welcome Sage back home, the diverse characters have prepared a special present for her. Go on, open it! Uh, okay, okay. We thought it might help you at school. It's... Uh... Do you like it? <laughs> she loves it, right, Sage? I... Here, you just hold it like this. <laughs> it's rather strange. Every other terrasphere we see in the show is far simpler by comparison. So why does this one have such an outlandish design? Why would anyone buy this huge gilded staff for Sage and expect it to be the right fit for her? And it looks mighty expensive. Come to think of it, where does the diverse couple get their income? Do they have jobs? It's never mentioned. Does one of them live off some hefty inheritance? They must be relatively wealthy, considering their high standard of living. Where's the money coming from? In fact, no aspect of the world's economy is ever brought up. We don't even know what this world uses as currency. Coins? Bills? Gold? Gems? Rubies. Or is this some kind of naive utopian fantasy where anyone can just get anything they want for free? Considering the hashtag small budget of this show, one would think the creators had put at least some thought into it. Oh no, you hate it. 
It's no good. She's too sweet to say it. We'll take it back. We'll go first thing tomorrow and get you one that fits. Great! Well, hot diggity, strap in for an amazing adventure. Friends for a lifetime, amazing adventures. After three episodes of nothing, followed by nothing, and even more nothing, this is seriously what the show thinks as acceptable storyline to keep the audience entertained. A shopping trip with the diverse couple. Half the episode is spent on this plotline, a trip to the shop to exchange a faulty product. That, along the usual serving of nonsense. Hmm. Hey, are you okay? Rosemary, I... I don't want a Terrasphere. It's not right. I'm not... I don't do new magic. My mom would be livid if she knew about this. Sage is reluctant to have an all-powerful magic trinket because her mom wants her to practice old magic instead. Because new magic is... bad. For some reason. Well, it was a moronic thing to allow Sage to attend High Guardian Academy, if that's the case. Let's put this to rest once and for all. There is no conflict here. All of this is idiotic. Either Sage learns what the Academy demands, regardless what her mom says, or she does not and packs her things and fucks off back to Pebble. There's only two choices. Schools have a set curriculum, the Academy is the one to decide what they teach and how they teach it. You cannot just walk into a web design class and demand you be allowed to do oil paintings all day and still pass the class. This is not how life works. You either study the things you are there to study or you don't. The school should demand the use of Terraspheres, since they are so omnipresent in society and the gold standard for spellcasting. Better yet, if this is such a prestigious academy, reserved only for the best of the best, with the purpose of making their students as effective at their job as humanly possible, then by all logic, they should provide Terraspheres for each of them. And if Sage truly wants to practice only the use of traditional magic, then she should have never come to the academy in the first place. Stay home and learn from your mother. She is most definitely an adequate teacher in old magic, I'm sure of it. Stop your whining, you miserable cunt. Take some responsibility for your life and make some goddamn choices instead of just whinging all the time. As you may have noticed, my patience with Sage is growing mighty thin. Now as for the magic shop itself, here we have a golden opportunity for the show to thoroughly explain the nature of new magic and Terraspheres. We are literally inside a store specializing in that specific subject, but instead of capitalizing on it, we get introduced to yet another waste of space character. Back. She's elbow deep in uh, turnips. Hey, slime boy! Haven't seen you in a grog's age. How's school? Oh, it's fine. We're in break. We, we got catapulted out because of a traveler infestation. You go to High Guardian? Yep. We're there too! I'm Rosemary, and this is Sage. We're first years. Sage is on the magic track, and I'm a warrior. I am slime boy. You're... You're what now? That's what everyone calls me. I, I kind of like that. Uh, you know, it's the same slime and then boy. Why do they call you that? I got caught with ink legs in, in my dorm once. You know inkles? They're um, slimy. So. Okay, excuse me. But is this supposed to be funny? Charming? Quirky? Why would anyone think this is entertaining? What exactly is the point of this character? Why does he exist? Here he is, manning the shop, something that could have been done by any no-name character, and then he appears a couple of times as a student of the academy, where his only contribution is the fact that he strums a harp. Riveting! 
once again, instead of using their finite screen time and budget, let's not forget about the goddamn budget, part of which goes to voice talent, mind you, instead of using their resources on proper character development, world building, focusing on things in desperate need of fleshing out, the creators keep gifting us with one useless rando character after another, with nothing of substance to offer. And it's not aided by the fact that every line uttered by this moron makes me physically wince. He speaks as if, as if he has his asshole full of maggots, like he needs a shot of heroin real bad. Like he is utterly perplexed by the concept of enunciation. Okay, so this person just plays himself. That's not cringy at all. Excellent feather in your cap there, buddy. Being associated with this trash fire of a show. <laughs> But of course, but of course. Putting this particular story of wasted screen time extremely short, Sage gets a new trinket, one that fits her sensibilities, and we return back to the tea room for another round of sitting around. Look at you! So cool, Sage! You forged a connection with this one. It's lovely to see it happen. I feel... odd. What's wrong, Tiger? I... I didn't want a Terra Sphere, but I didn't know how to tell you. Mom would be so angry. She despises new magic. She doesn't want me to use it. At the store, before, I wanted to give it back. Then, I found this. And it's... I don't know. It feels like... like something I'm supposed to have. Like it's made for me, but we're star-crossed. I don't know what to do, and now I'm yelling, and I hate yelling! Acting. And pouring more drivel to the pile, it is implied that Terraspheres have some kind of consciousness. How exactly does an orb of magical energy form a connection with their wielder? Does that mean that no one else except the bonded wielder can use them effectively? If that's the case, then why would the diverse couple buy Sage a random Terra Sphere behind her back? That is the most inconsiderate gift anyone could ever give. If the Terra Sphere has to feel just right in order for someone to be an effective user of new magic, then Sage should have been there to pick out her trinket the first time around. And furthermore, if there is an element of compatibility between the orbs and the user, then every Terra Sphere should be crafted to order. There should be some kind of expert, taking magical measurements or whatever bullshit, like a tailor making a suit, and then creating a Terra Sphere that is made specifically to the customer's needs. But hold on, this notion of forming a bond is directly contradictory to what we learn in episode 5, where it is stated that Terra Spheres can quote, run out of juice, and need to be replaced. The fuck is this? Are you saying you need to form a spiritual bond with literal batteries with limited lifespans? That is insane. Has the teacher formed a connection with all of her wands? Is she a magic slut? See, the show pretends like there is something deeper and mystical at present, but all that really happens is a spoiled kid taking their birthday Lamborghini back to the dealership because she didn't like the color. Everyone at school makes fun of me or laughs behind my back because of my old sigils and my stupid hat. What are you talking about? No one laughs behind your back. Everyone at the academy is either a rando with no presence, life, or opinion on anything, either that, or they are within your friend circle and constantly validate you. The only one who pesters you is Amaryllis, and she does that to your face. Seriously, 
the one person who bullies and torments Sage is the most ineffective lame ass bully in all of fiction and Sage is losing her shit over it. Fuck you Sage, honestly, grow up. And as for Sage's anxiety about her mother, not to worry, the diverse couple handles that lickety split. We're so sorry. Yeah, dude, we didn't want to freak you out. We just wanted to help you with this huge, crazy shift. Oh, I know, I know, I know. I'm not mad at you. I could never be mad at you. And look, if your mom gets mad, we'll take the fall. Bad influences and all that. A bit hypocritical of her, though. <laughs> Why? Well, I mean, your mom wasn't always so conservative. Hold on. Anise, sweetheart. What? The kid deserves to know. Look at her. If she gets any more anxious, she'll combust. Fair. So, when I was little, growing up in witch country, your mom went through a phase where she really dug new magic. I looked up to her because of it. She was a badass. After a few years, she stopped using it and went back to her roots. But she pretends that she never deviated, even a little. And that's not fair to you. <sighs> I know, right? A Terrasphere. You can do whatever the fuck you want, because your mom did the same when she was young. As if that justifies anything. This whole issue carries zero understanding of nuance. No one bothers to ask why Sage's mom made any of her decisions. Maybe she learned something that changed her view of the world and magic. People are allowed to change their attitudes on things when presented with new information. That is called growing up. We get a completely one-sided view of the events. For all we know, the diverse character is lying by omission. The person being scrutinized isn't even present to explain herself. And that's because the creators are incapable of actually writing people who are dissimilar to themselves. Meaning, intelligent people. Oh, and I do get it giving an opposing point of view to reflect upon, that would make it harder for the author to hammer in their propaganda, and we cannot have that. Now this is, of course, the show and its agenda factory imbecile brigade revealing their hand with hilarious bravado. Everything old is conservative, and everything conservative is bad, and should be cast aside. Everyone should embrace the new, for all eternity, because everything that's new is great. And it's not about this scene alone. There is a through line for this kind of philosophy in the show. Here's an excerpt from that ridiculous Guardian Oath from episode 2. I promise balance. Keep history alive and never be constrained by its relics. I vow to stay curious and engaged. To look at the world with a questioning eye. Cast aside old values, embrace the new. That is the translated message once you peel away the coding of poetic language. The writers aren't being subtle about this. The way this show tries to fit the different ideals of magic into an allegory for progressive slash conservative values is ridiculous. The scene insidiously paints the situation with Sage's mom as if she was a cool, progressive, liberal, radical chick in her youth, complete with a nose piercing to make the parody image utterly perfect. She was an ideal person, not because of the things she did, not because she was a good person, that doesn't matter. What matters is that she embraced the progressive agenda and everything that comes with it as far as the writer's worldview is concerned. As long as a person fits a certain aesthetic and carries the acceptable agenda with blind fervor, everything is hunky-dory. And now, when she is a settled-in mother with a husband, a child, a steady job presumably, and living an all-around unassuming life, 
now she has suddenly done something wrong and is a hypocrite for trying to guide her own child in accordance with the wisdom she has gained from her own mistakes. That is literally what parents are supposed to do. But no, her choices, her ideals, the truths she has discovered about herself, what makes her happy, all of that is unimportant. What matters is that she is no longer part of the aesthetic and agenda that makes the dykes tingle. Therefore, her decisions deserve to be ridiculed behind her back to her own child. This kind of writing reveals the authors as vile, narrow-minded, self-interested idiots. Lacking even a shred of empathy, they honestly see their worldview and lifestyle as the only correct one and every other choice ought to be sniped at. No further proof is needed other than the way the elf skank casually badmouth Sage's mom, as if by accident. Your mom is a filthy conservative hypocrite. OMG, did I say that out loud? I totally didn't mean to. What a callous bitch. And speaking of hypocrites, you yourself practice old magic exclusively. Where's your terrasphere, you conservative cunt? You forced the trinket upon Sage. You made the decision for her, behind her back. So it's not okay for Sage to uphold tradition, or for her mother. Yet it is somehow fine with you. But it's okay, because she's a lesbian, and a lesbian can never do anything wrong. We should all stuff our faces full of fish hooks, tiddle each other's oysters, live a life of hedonism, free of work, free of responsibility, judge others for choosing a different path, and make up rules that only apply to other people, because that is new, and new is great. What a childish view of the world. And Sage is such a flippant cunt. The first opening she sees that absolves her from all guilt, she accepts it without questioning anything. She never asks what actually happened, why is her mom against new magic, what made her turn against it. She never contacts her so that they might talk things through once and for all. From the beginning, none of this has to do with Sage's relationship to her mother. She never cared about what her mother thinks. She has no respect for her or her wishes. Her experience and wisdom mean nothing to Sage. Like a wimpy child, Sage's only motivation is the fear of getting yelled at for doing something wrong. It's never about what's actually wrong or right. It's all about Sage herself, how she feels, and how she can best justify doing whatever she wants at the moment. Thank you for the Terra Sphere. I like it. I really do. Now she knows she can just throw her mother's criticism back at her face, and thus, she has found peace. Episode by episode, Sage is quickly becoming more and more insufferable. She is honestly a horrible person. Equally as selfish as her cotton candy brained partner. But I will save most of my vitriol for later time. A storyline such as this demands that the person who is insecure about their place in the world and their heritage has an actual conversation with the person they are in conflict with. If the author wishes to tell a meaningful story about self discovery, and the chasm between generations within a family, both sides' viewpoints have to be made crystal clear. The audience needs to understand, so that we can empathize with the situation. The opposing sides need to interact for more than 15 seconds. But that is only if the author truly cares. Propaganda artists need not bother. <laughs> Come here, you. <laughs> huh? 
Better try a new trick, cause that one's getting old. Meanwhile elsewhere, back at their own B-plot for today, Parsley and Fime are heading towards lackluster family drama of their own. First things first, Parsley invites Fime to spend the weekend with her family, because she refuses to go home to her mother, because reasons. And I truly must congratulate the show at this point, I'm being sincere. You see, Parsley is doing something nice to her friend, entirely from the goodness of her heart. She's just being a proper mate with no hidden agenda. The author has finally cracked the code to basic decency and human behavior, and I feel like that deserves a slight kudos. Of course, in any other show, this wouldn't be worth much more than a shrug, but that's the point we are at with this catastrophe. Any sign of logical, heartfelt behavior takes me by surprise. It's a respite from the utter hurl-inducing selfishness otherwise present throughout this shitfest. But that being said, the way this situation ends up manifesting makes little to no sense. Let's consider Fime's characterization. She is presented as the abrasive loner of the group, especially at this point of the story. She wants to keep her distance from the other girls, doubly so when it comes to private issues, hers or others. She wants her personal drama with her family to remain secret, that is undeniable. That being the case, it makes absolutely no sense that Parsley somehow knows that Fime lives with her mother in Lingarth. Doesn't your mom live in town? She's busy. At what context has that topic come up? And why would Fime divulge that information to Parsley? If Fime truly wishes to keep her distance from everyone else, to be left alone, if she wants to avoid excess sympathy or pity, she would tell everyone it's none of their business, or even simply lie about the fact. She's already lying about her mother being out of town, and thus she can't go home, which in itself doesn't follow any semblance of logic. Let me ask you this, have you ever come home from school while both of your parents are still at work? I would imagine so. You can unlock the door to your own home, stay at your own home, without your parents being there to greet you, right? Fime is a goddamn moron, and she is an awful liar. Now in a world where everyone inhabiting it isn't a drooling mustard brain, Fime should simply say that she's going back home, instead of revealing she plans to camp out in the woods, which will inevitably ignite Parsley's desire to help, because apparently she actually holds some semblance of empathy. Unlike, say, our heroic protagonist, the low-key racist of the group. Listen, you pointy Don't sleep in the woods. You'll scare off the bats. <laughs> At least I got rid of all those damn ni- You see what I'm dealing with here? I'm trying my hardest to give a compliment to this show, but it's really difficult. So, about that family drama, what exactly is Fime's problem with her mother? Well, maybe we'll find out, since she just so happens to visit Parsley's blacksmith shop at that specific day, so that she can fix up a pair of shitty scissors. The writers honestly couldn't be bothered to come up with a better excuse. A pair of rusty old scissors. As if the magic of this universe couldn't just fix those up in a jiffy. And how do you even get your scissors into such a horrid shape? Did you shove them up your ass? What possible use could you even have for those? Anything you would wish to cut, I'm certain you can use magic for that. Or just buy a new pair. I'm sure that's easier and cheaper than bringing them to a fucking blacksmith. I would feel insulted, but this is High Guardian Spice, so it's honestly my fault. I'm expecting too much from a bunch of cunt huffing, anti working man, terminally online, professional victim types. 
as if any of them had ever even seen any kind of tool in person, let alone used them. Hey, time! Can you- I'm sorry, did you say time? Sure, she's my friend from High Guardian Academy. The school got all infested with Travers and was evacuated for the weekend, but her mom's away, so she's staying with us. I see. Time? Hi, Mom. Your school was evacuated. So instead of coming home, you came here? To hide? I'm not hiding. I just didn't want to bother you. Father, I haven't seen you since school started. I thought you'd be happier that way. What's going on up? Oh, hello again. It's Flora, right? It is. I see you've met my daughter. <laughs> Small world. I'll take her off your hands. Nonsense! We're just about to have brunch. Join us! No. I'd love to. <laughs> Time I remember when you were this little. Really? I was a dwarf baby? Time! Angie, you'll have to excuse my daughter. Her marksmanship always takes precedence over her tact. Yeah, I learned it from watching you, Mom. Now I'm not gonna lie, the first time I saw this exchange, my interest was ignited for a fleeting while. Those are some serious accusations from Fime. If the picture she's painting is even close to truth, then her mother must be some kind of oppressive, passive-aggressive, manipulative, ice queen of a mother. There's some ingredients for a truly effective character study here. Maybe she's the type who acts like a level-headed lady in the presence of others. But behind closed doors, she's a psychologically abusive tyrant to her daughter. Maybe Fime's abrasive nature stems from the way her mother treats her? If her mother truly is that awful, then I wouldn't blame Fime for running away from home. Is that what's going on here? Of course not! Because that would be interesting! The episode skirts around the issue the entire way through, with Fime constantly shooting Venom at her mother, without ever even hinting at the true reason for the animosity. It's never revealed what kind of scissors Fime's mom shoved up her arse to make her so hateful. For that, we have to wait all the way till episodes 7 and 8, where it is finally made clear. So, Fime, what horrid crime did your mother commit to make you want nothing to do with her? We all had to flee the fairy woods. The rivers dried up. The trees started dying. Dad stayed to help. He's trying to find a way to reverse the rot. He and my mom, they had a big fight about leaving. She dragged me to Lingarth. The woods are dying and, and she expects me to just sit there. This is my home. I need to help, not run away. That is not your choice to make. Your father and I have decided we are going to Scarborough Kingdom. But- Time. Resources are scarce. The fairy woods are no longer safe. Then come with us. You said it's not safe here, so why- I must stay and do what I can. This is my duty, not yours. Now go. Your mother brought you away from the dangerous Calamity Woods to safety so that you two could live a stable life as were your father's wishes. What an unforgivable act! Oh yes, but you wanted to stay behind and help your father. And do what exactly? You have no way of helping him. You are just some random kid with no special skills or knowledge. At best you would be in the way. There's no reason to entertain this tantrum any further. This is moronic. Fime is being a vicious bitch for absolutely no reason. Her mother has done nothing wrong. No matter how much teen angst you are carrying, you must realize that you are being unreasonable with your mother. Mommy, you are a cunt. How dare you drag me to safety from home? I wanted to stay behind and be totally useless and get swallowed by the rot, just like daddy. I know I shouldn't smack you, but I feel like I should smack you. And how does this conflict resolve in the end, I hear you asking? 
Well, the two of them have no further conversations on screen for the rest of the series. Then, Fime sees her mom turned into stone in episode 9, don't ask, which makes her sad. Yeah, your mother is in mortal danger, just like she was in mortal danger back in the woodlands. You see how this works, Fime? Maybe you should be less of an insufferable cunt about it. After it's all fixed, there's still no convo between them. Like the whole thing never happened. Which is awkward, to say the least. The mom isn't a character. I can't even say she's a plot device. She's a prop, a pathetic attempt by the writers to amp up the personal stakes for fine whenever they feel like it. And then, at the very end of the final episode, we suddenly get this. We can use the vacation. Yeah, but I kind of want to get back. I want to learn more, grow stronger, and I think I want to hug my mom. Oh. What? She was stone last time. The show's idea of character development is having one of the heroines bitching about nothing and then conveniently doing a complete heel turn at the last second before the epilogue. An epilogue in which we get a whopping single still image to wrap everything up, because fuck actually writing a resolution, I guess. This plotline is an enormous waste of time, even whilst considering what show we are examining. In fact, I'd say this subplot is one of the worst narrative structure-wise. At least much of the bullshit in this show gets resolved in the same episode it is introduced, but this subplot has the goal to leave things unresolved for several episodes. It's trying to bait the audience into thinking there's something more complex going on with Fime's family, only to serve up yet another plate of nothing burgers. Not to mention that this plotline, which is supposed to give layers to one of the main heroines, makes them incredibly unlikable. Fime is mad, then she's not, because that's what it says in the script. Unless this is some kind of demented allegory for menstrual tantrums, I cannot fathom what the writer was thinking. But that's only half of this, half of the episode. Parsley has her own family feud to sort out. Yay! A bit of background nonsense to preface this upcoming rubbish. Parsley is met with an enormous surprise back home. She has a newly born baby sister. <coughs> now the semester hasn't been going on for longer than a couple of weeks at this point. A month at the most. I refuse to believe anything else, seeing as how elementary the classes in the upcoming episodes are. And despite being gone for such a brief while, Parsley is surprised by the happy news. Given these facts, the dwarfs in this universe breed at an amazing rate. A less than a month of carrying time? Holy fuck fever, Batman! That is a lot of baby dwarfs if anyone feels like getting busy. And in the case of Parsley's family, someone is getting busy! <laughs> Now it is curious how come all of Parsley's brothers are around the same age, give or take a few years, while Parsley herself is considerably more mature. Why did her parents decide to hold off from more bedroom baby factory business for several years after having Parsley, and then suddenly crank the libido to max? Could it be to justify some lame conflict between the parents and their eldest offspring? Yes. Yes, it is. Only a couple of months till I have all my girls back under one roof. You mean, for the holidays, right? <clears throat> oh, silly me. I wasn't supposed to bring this up until after dinner. Bring... what up? I'm gonna help with that firewood. Oh, it's nothing, dear. It's just... <sighs> We're wondering if you've got it out of your system yet. Got what out of my system? School? We're sure it's interesting there. But we want what's best for the family. And it's a lot of work here for just your father and I. So, if you're done trying it out, we're ready for you to come back. 
I'm gonna go sit on the roof for a bit. Now, Parpar, don't be upset. It's fine. I just... This is a lot. Now, that was dumb from a multitude of angles. What exactly do Parsley's parents need her at home for? To man the forge? To help with the flock of kid brothers? Everything seems to be going just fine without Parsley in the house. There doesn't seem to be an overflow of customers. The mom isn't stressed by housework. And the brothers are just doing whatever at their own leisure. Couldn't any of the twerps be of use? Are they too young? Apparently, Parsley has been helping around the house ever since she was little. So why not make the brothers carry their weight as well? Why is Parsley specifically needed back home again? Oh, right. No particular reason. Just manufacture drama for drama's sake. Wonderful. Par for the course. Or should I say Parsley for the course? Oh, ho! I am on fire today, top of the shelf dad jokes flying left and right. But to be perfectly fair, maybe the parents are worried that one of the brothers will end up killing themselves, or someone else, seeing as some of them exhibit blooming psychopathic tendencies. Ow. Spurge, what have I told you? Trousers first? Then Bell? We don't stab dinner guests. You're not the mom of us! Hey, why don't you walnuts go gather some firewood for dinner? Go, go on now. What have I told you? Implying that this has happened before? What kind of parents are these two if they just let their kids run around casually stabbing people with cutlery? Anyway, after sulking in dramatic lighting for a wee while, Parsley has a rebuttal for her parents the following day. So, uh, Angie tells me you're a botanist, hmm? <laughs> yes. I just started working for the council that organizes Lingard's fauna processional. <laughs> oh, we take the kids every year. Have you been in town long? No. Time. Please. Misplaced my appetite. Gonna go find it. She shouldn't treat time like a child. She is a child, Parsley. You both are. I never got to be a child, Mom. I've been looking after my brothers my whole life, and I love them. They've been my whole world. But I finally get this shot to make something of myself, and you want me to leave? Just to come back here and... and what? End up like you? Oh. Parsley, you apologize to your mother this instant. Why? You have another girl now. Raise her to be the help. Parsley insists she never got to be a kid. She laments that she always had to take care of other people her whole life. So, to make something of herself, she instead decided to attend an academy where she supposedly trains to become a protector of other people. She could never make something of herself by working at her family's forge. So she goes out to attend an academy where she herself picks forging as her specialization because that wasn't something she could do back home by learning from her father. None of this makes sense. How hard can it be to write a single character in this godforsaken show with motivations that actually follow any kind of logical through line? Here, I'll fix this shit for you. Just say that the dwarves are super race slash family oriented. It's their custom to be isolated. Parsley's family has fled to Lingarf because of the rot and they are suspicious of the other races and their organizations, like the Guardian Academy, make it so that Parsley wants to do something other than be a blacksmith, say that she wants to be a mage, an alchemist, something that's unnatural for their kind in this universe, 
or say that she wants to be a warrior, a police officer, a peacekeeper, and have it so that her possibly racist family doesn't care about the other races or their safety, because the dwarves are such an isolated people, just do something that actually puts her at odds with her family and legacy. If you want to create drama, then actually place differing ideals against each other. Don't just have your characters whine about nonsense while taking obvious snipes at the role of traditional housewives. Yes, I saw that. You ain't slipping that past me, you vindictive cunts. Parsley, is your brother supposed to be on the roof? Before the issue can develop further, there's convenient trouble afoot. I'm not sure what to call this trope. You know, whenever the writer clearly doesn't know how to end a conversation naturally, so they throw in some kind of nuisance to interrupt it. Saved by the random bullshit bell, perhaps? Uh, uh, baby, uh, stay still. Oh my lord! What are we gonna do? Well, we just saw Parsley sulking up on the roof, so maybe she can just use whatever path she took last time, grab her brother, and bring him back down, or she can just MacGyver this ridiculous plan together that works too. And it's mighty super duper ultra mega special awesome that she and Fime can coordinate this plan perfectly on the fly, without exchanging any words. That's the way any conflict in this show works. Some trouble is introduced, and then it's just fixed, just like that. There's barely enough time to be invested in anything, even if I didn't wish for all these characters to die horribly. Now allow me to guide your eye to a subtle detail in this scene. Notice how everything is handled by the vagina folk. The father of the family just stands there gawking like an idiot, despite the fact that it's your kid up on the roof! You pathetic, castrated, insult to your gender! You should be the first one to jump into action, climb up there, tell your kid to sit tight and not move a goddamn muscle. But no! Why would a father care about the safety of their own flesh and blood? After making such a fuss about wanting to have all of his family under one roof. I guess that goes dead or alive. Not to mention that, of course, the kid brother climbs up on the roof no trouble whatsoever, but then suddenly turns into a kitty cat stuck in a tree. As if boys are incapable of climbing except in one direction. The writer's views are really showing in this episode. What was it again? All men are trash? Short story short, the day is saved by the empowered female brigade. Huzzah! And Parsley's parents are so impressed by her awesomeness, they completely flip their position, admit they were wrong about everything, support Parsley in her aspirations 100%, basically do what they should have done from the fucking beginning. And when I say Parsley's parents, I mean Parsley's mom. The father gets no more dialogue, no screen time, no nothing. Because why the fuck would you get both parents in on the lovey dovey family wholesomeness when we can give that screen time exclusively to the vagina folk? No reason to talk things through with your father, the one who actually initiated the conflict. Nope, no reason at all. 10 out of 10 writing. <laughs> Maybe I could visit some weekends. Even when the school's not being exterminated. We would love that. Your academy is in the same city. You could have dinner with your family any flipping day of the week. How fitting is it that the literal final line of the episode encapsulates it so perfectly in all of its nonsensical, artificial, forced, no stakes whatsoever glory. 
Episode 4 tries to have a unifying thematic throughline. The topic of the day is family drama. Each of the girls carries some kind of baggage, insecurities, or are at odds with their parents due to differing ideals. That is, in theory. In reality, every plotline, every conflict in the episode is nonsensical drivel, propaganda masquerading as drama, a 20 minute stretch of meaningless noise before it's all wrapped up and ignored. None of the alleged troubles with their families hinder the girls in any way. They aren't forced to reflect upon themselves, to grow, to change, maybe even admit that they aren't as ready as they thought they were. The fact that there actually is an overarching theme proves that the writers are fully aware of what they are doing. A specific premise like this does not happen by accident. The lackluster script isn't due to budget or time constraints. This episode alone debunks all of that. The author has a message, a vision they wish to share. It's just that their vision is shit. This episode is one of the most frustrating ones in the entire show, because if these issues were handled with any kind of finesse, if the author had injected some actual layers to the characters, in a well-written show, this would be a standout episode. The core of a character is always who they are as people, not their skill set, heroic deeds, or any random feat of strength, but rather the motivations behind their actions, and characters' relationship to their loved ones is a vital component of that. For me, it is always far more interesting to see characters interact amongst themselves, rather than the part where the hero punches the villain real hard in the face. This episode squanders a perfectly valid setup for meaningful character building, repeatedly, and I hate it for it. In addition to the usual crap at this point. And the suffering continues as we move on to episode 5, aptly named, A Lost Cause. I'm telling you, the writers knew exactly what they were doing, they knew they were making the writing equivalent of a back alley abortion. And this one actually gets my vote for the most useless episode of the entire series. Not necessarily the worst, just the one with the least reason to exist. Nothing new gets introduced, no subplot moves forward, and the trouble of the day is as frivolous as it comes, even while considering the competition. If this episode was skipped entirely, no one would notice. Following up from episode 4, the focus of the day is Sage getting the hang of using her newly acquired Terrasphere. And you might think that something like that is a decent premise for an episode, an important step in the development of a future sorceress guardian of the realm to be. It's a literal school, this is a series about young girls training to be the best like no one ever was at what they do, so what better use of time could there be than a good old fashioned training montage with all the ups and downs, arduous work and sweat and sleepless nights and push it to the limit eye of the tiger action. This is as simple as a premise gets, all you have to do is show the arc of growing, passage of time linearly from one day to the other, one week to the next, the steady incremental improvement, seeing a character work for their success is a surefire way to make them likable and gain goodwill from the audience and let's just see how the show manages to fuck everything up. Sage sneaks out during the crack of dawn to get in some extra training before classes. Admirable initiative. She is woefully behind in her studies, so she definitely ought to place as much time as she can into mastering her newfound power. The intensity of the Terrasphere is rather overwhelming. We actually see Sage struggling. She pulls an Iron Man 1, nearly face planting across the schoolyard. Surprised she didn't snap her spine from the whiplash, but hey, cartoon physics I guess. Makes one wonder about the lack security of the academy, who's responsible if the students end up self-deleting while on campus. But that's an abandoned concern at this point, whimsy away. Sage's secret training gets abrupted by Fime, saving her from her own incompetence. And curiously, 
this is the only way we see if I'm practicing magic ever with old magic runes. The much talked about enchanted marksmanship for example never comes into play. Wouldn't it be more fitting if Fime's magic was tied to her archery somehow? Like the bow acting as a catalyst for the spells? Some continuity? Maybe insert some lore about the dark elves? The fairy woods? But of course, these episodes were written by different people, and it's unreasonable to ask for the writers to exchange notes. Thank you! Just trying out my new Terrasphere, but I can't control it yet. You know how it is. Not really. I don't mess with that shit. You kiss your muffer with that mouth? Forget I asked. And the hell are you doing out here anyway? Just stalking the Rotary randomly. Is it for some kind of demented nostalgia? Instead of watching paint dry, grass grow, you watch the rot silently spread? And not inform anyone about it? Do you get some kind of sick pleasure from the closeness of impending apocalypse? In any case, to the show's lukewarm credit, the part about Sage training is fine. She has decided to embrace a new type of spellcasting and she is putting in the effort to master it. Not only that, but it is shown that she actually isn't quite grasping it immediately. I want to underline that this in isolation is good. It follows cause and effect, showcases logical motivation, it makes sense. The initial setup works in concept. The author is so close to creating something actually decent here. It's just that the way the rest of the episode unfolds squanders all of it. The magic class of the day takes place at the botanical garden. The crazy cackleta teacher feeds one of the students to a man-eating plant. Are you even surprised at this point? Now watch how fast that fucker eats through flesh. Fuck me! Now watch how long that poor lass spends inside that insatiable maw. She is dead. Oh, never mind, she is fine. Apparently the piranha plant just wanted to suckle the skin cream off her cheeks. Better have those nasty marks checked up though. Is there a doctor in the school? A nurse? Anything of the sort? There's only so many times, and so many ways I can say this. This place is evil, and the teachers are insane. And I'm using the term teacher with extreme generosity. For example, this is all the guidance given in this class for rookie mages. Today we'll be giving these plants a real pruning. We will use the collected buds in future spells. The teacher does whatever, never explains anything, and then expects the students to replicate the spell. This is not teaching. Something like this has no value. These kids would learn as much, if not more, completely on their own. Why does this academy exist if they are so opposed to actually teaching their students? Whoever created this crap has never been to an actual hands-on class in any subject. There is no other reality where something this incompetently bizarre ends up on screen. And what do you mean we'll use them in future spells? New magic doesn't require anything except a Terrasphere, right? And the utility of new magic is unlimited. So where are all these ingredients suddenly going to? I know you have potions classes at the academy, but that's exactly my point. Given the potency of new magic, as well as old magic runes, teleporting everyone, potion brewing should be obsolete. The job of this hag shouldn't exist in the first place. Unsurprisingly, despite the apparent simplicity of the task for the day, some of the students have difficulties completing it, specifically the trio of Sage, Fime, and Amaryllis, completely owing to the fact that Sage decides to make everything needlessly hard for everyone out of the blue. Let's watch.
Is it okay if I use old magic? Sage, why crawl through the desert delirious with thirst when you can summon an oasis of sparkling water in any flavor you choose? Well, I was taught that old magic is sacred. <laughs> Maybe, but it's impractical. New magic doesn't require the hours of ritual, the reckoning, the effort. Basically, old magic is dumb. But I wouldn't say that. It's just new magic is better. New magic multiplies your power and lets you do what you want. My mother taught me that as magic gives to you, you must give to it, or the balance will be destroyed. After a sizable spell, she plants a tree in thanks. Valance, uh, uh, Malance, you've got a Terrasphere now, haven't you? I, I mean, yes, but... Do what you want, Sage. But the history of Guardians demonstrates that those who don't adapt are doomed to obsolescence. Sage, let me lay this out as simply as possible. This is a new magic class in an academy where the main field of study is new magic, you have a terra sphere, a tool meant for new magic, a tool that you quote really like. So get the fuck down from your high horse and do what your teacher tells you to do. Stop wasting everyone's time, you self absorbed, limelight hogging, special snowflake twat. And as a side note, about all this magical balance stuff. If this show ever decided to write a conclusion for itself, or just properly explain anything at all, the obvious story path to take with the rot would be that it's actually caused by the introduction of new magic, which supposedly siphons away the magic from the earth and triggers imbalances in nature, it would be the most obvious revelation, given what little world building the show offers. However, this is never outright stated in the show itself, so it's a Schrodinger's plotline at best. Hilariously enough, if that actually ended up being the case, then several of the show's alleged themes and conflicts would end up even more broken than they already are. The whole debacle about conservative old magic practices, for example, would kneecap the progressive subtext of this show in its entirety. Back to what's literally on screen, how does any of this take longer than a second? Sage conjured up a sleeping spell in episode 3 with a flick of the wrist. You are telling me she can't sedate the hungry hungry flora just as easily with old magic? Trade? Notes, you miserable hacks. And following on that, the fact that Fime doesn't mess with that shit, the shit being new magic, is conveniently ignored. She should agree with Sage here. In fact, it should be Fime specifically who demands to use old magic. If the show bothered to follow up on facts that were stated literally in the previous scene. But nope! Fime acts all frustrated because their group is dragging behind everyone else and is relieved once the deed is finally done, in a second, by Amaryllis, once new magic is brought into the mix. Fime is annoyed by Sage, because Sage wanted to use old magic, even though she herself uses old magic exclusively as well. And Sage is being a little bitch, and refuses to use new magic, despite that she was okay doing it that very same morning. None of this makes sense. Again, for the umpteenth time, two scenes, back to back, written solely by a single author, fundamental characterization, completely contradictory. That level of fuckery takes special skill. <laughs> New magic. The only decent way to do anything. Finally. Done. I didn't want to just use the easy way. Blah 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 blah. Old magic is sacred. What's the sacred part, Slab? Sweating into plants instead of going to lunch? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> ah!
I'm gonna kill myself! Wow. I'm going to kill myself and it's your fault! What am I supposed to say to that? Sage is pathetic. This is the definition of pathetic. All the characters in this show have the mental maturity of five-year-olds. These teenagers who are in training to become warrior, hero, guardians or whatever the fuck, people who are supposed to endure hardship for the sake of others, people who will inevitably get hurt physically and mentally, people who carry deadly arms and wield devastating magic, these people are so brittle they can't even handle the most mundane disagreement imaginable. A combat school should never tolerate this level of weakness. The first thing the academy should do is beat that kind of victim mentality out of the cadets. Literally. I'm beginning to see the point of the poisonings and the surprise deep throats. If anything, the teachers clearly aren't being cruel enough. And what does Sage do now that she's been so deeply hurt by Fime? She goes have a cry in her lonesome, meets this useless creature, vents about her nonsense issues, and then decides to work on her new magic. And after about 10 minutes of stupid pointless shenanigans, she emerges as a true master of her terrasphere. Within the span of a single afternoon. Now allow me to break down what just happened, in case you missed the essence of this episode. Sage has decided to embrace new magic, she wants to harness the power of her terrasphere, and so she trains during the early morning and during the afternoon free period. The only time when she refuses to train in new magic is the official class, where the focus of study is new magic. How could no one notice this? How could they allow this to happen? No one can be this incompetent. This must be some kind of open trolling towards the audience. The writers are competing who can get away with writing the most insulting gibberish. I refuse to believe that a person who gets paid to write could be this level of absolute dumb fuck, unless it's on purpose. And Sage just keeps evolving as an absolute unapologetic omega level cunt. She has an insatiable drive to be the victim. First it's all, boohoo, I'm being teased for my old magic. Then it's, boohoo, what will mom say if I use new magic? And even though she already embraced new magic in the prior episode, screw her mom and her conservative ways, now it's suddenly, boohoo, I wanna use old magic like my mom. She has no principles. Every situation twists and turns any which way Sage can justify acting the part of the poor victimized girly alone against the world. Everyone else is a meanie and a bully and racist and no one understands just how special and unique her background is. She uses her own culture to score oppression points from anyone and everyone. She is victimized by her mother and all the conservative traditions of her family. And that's bad. And at the same time, everyone is calling out her conservative culture that victimizes her for being ridiculous. And that's also bad. Reality? Morality? Standards? Everything just flips and flops however it suits Sage herself at the moment. Behold, mental gymnastics ascending into an art form of its own right here before our eyes. Art imitating reality. And naturally, while Sage is busy absorbing an entire lifetime of sorcery in an hour, the other half of the episode is dedicated to everyone else running around aimlessly, trying to find her, so that Fime can say she's sorry. Because of course it is! What else would anyone wish to see in a cartoon about warriors and battle mages? An adventure across the lands? Saving the world from impending doom? Nope, pointless tour around the school. Top tier content right there. Everyone takes time out of their day to follow Fime around, 
Because reasons. Rosemary is the protax, so she needs to be involved in everything. Snapdragon wants Sage to step on him. Amaryllis is in the market for a dark elf BFF. And Parsley asserts that... I'd seen you apologize. You're gonna need some backup. When have you ever seen Fime apologize? What has she ever had to apologize for? Apart from being a cunt to her mother, but that's on the back burner. You haven't seen shit. Stop lying. Point is, for doing absolutely nothing, for saying absolutely nothing to Sage, Fime is the one forced to apologize, and at the same time everyone else is super worried about Sage. No one chastises Sage for being a hyper-emotional little bitch, it's all about validating this worthless two-faced shit for brains. It's a quest through pure cringe, all to rescue an egotistical princess and her hurt fifis. Minutes upon end of just the most horrendous, droning, nonsensical, pointless crap ever put on screen. I'm just having trouble getting this Terrasphere to do... anything I want. Oh, it's, it's all on the wrist of your brain. I have to demonstrate it a lot at the store. Here, here, hold on. I'll draw you a diagram. You wanna share it with the audience as well, so that we might finally understand how the hell the magic in this universe works? I know the answer is gonna be eat shit, but I'll ask anyway. <laughs> I think I get it. I'm going to try to... conjure some shampoo. Out of all the things you could randomly pull into reality, you decided to make shampoo. Are you gonna make a bottle for it as well, or just let it splatter all over the place? So Sage misfires and makes a magic bubble that sucks in everyone who touches it. She then misfires again, and turns the thing into a cloning machine. It only clones the frog monsters, because shut the hell up. And it also solves world hunger in the process, but it's never mentioned, because fuck you. Are you done looking for Sage? Amaryllis, you're adding nothing to this equation. Well, well, you guys aren't even looking, you're sitting. Exactly. Get a move on so that this crap can end. And why the fuck is Fime just randomly holding her bow here? Who was she planning on assassinating from the balcony? For some reason, Parsley kicks open every door she finds. Who the fuck just runs around kicking doors? Okay, so the big brain gang of Rosemary, Parsley and Snapdragon were at the library to gather references for their essay, and instead of studying, they get into some world-class procrastinating. But after they begin their search for Sage, they just pull everything out of their ass while sauntering across the school. Stop! That's the infinite hallway. Why is there an infinite hallway? What even is an infinite hallway? Who was the architect for this school? What? Possible use could an infinite hallway serve just smack middle of the school? And again, what the fuck is wrong with Fime? The gang here goes spying from inside the classroom, and Fime's first instinct is to ready her bow. What was she expecting to find inside that would require a deadly dose of arrow to the face? Wow. Oh, uh, we can fix this. Uh, can we? Help? You can do this. Really? I thought I couldn't do anything. I thought you were Amaryllis' new puppet. This situation is entirely due to your shit sorcery. You have no right to be cranky. Ew! I didn't even say anything mean. <laughs> I have an idea. Hmm, why doesn't your best friend Amaryllis fix this? <laughs> this isn't my problem. Why is Amaryllis the only one talking sense in this episode? Amaryllis is not my best friend. Time? That isn't an apology. I'm sorry? Time? I'm sorry. Sage, you can do this. Time is right, Sage! You can do this! I wish to point out that Sage just created life, only to snuff it out of existence a moment later. You may fight about the moral implications in the comments. At the end, everything is fixed, there's no stakes, Sage handles her magic staff perfectly, Fime takes it up the ass, apologizes for doing absolutely nothing, and everything is fine in the land of Sage, because she was right, 
everyone else is wrong, especially Fime, especially Amaryllis, fuck everyone, Sage is the greatest, the end. Fuck this episode. Misplaced drama is one of the most annoying things you can do when crafting a tale. I'll actually share my biggest grievance in all of storytelling. I hate stupidity. I'm allergic to it. It makes me physically ill. And I'm not just talking about inconsistencies in the plot or the world, but rather people acting like whiny idiots and creating problems for themselves out of nothing. Even no conflict at all is better than something that follows no logic. I would much prefer a low stakes narrative of peaceful uneventful everyday existence or even some kind of balls to the wall shallow power fantasy if the alternative is characters bitching about nothing and pretending like they have some deep personal struggles to overcome. Your troubles are nothing, so pull yourself together and just do the obvious. I have no sympathy for stupidity. But of course, all of this is due to the fact that none of the writers have ever dealt with actual hardship in their sheltered lives. And the High Guardian Academy is basically one big allegory for their dream feel good, no responsibilities, anything goes liberal campus. With some added magic and whimsy. So, how about some nonsense to start off the next episode? Change of pace, I know. Ooh, looks like it's going to be an exciting week. We've got Issa, Birkino, Perthro, and Gibo. Yeah, I make up words too. Runes of challenge and growth, secrets and relationships. Plus, there's this blank one, the wild card. The way it landed implies destruction, decay. What do these runes mean when they're in this sequence? Runes aren't a literal alphabet. Each has a meaning and they combine to make a larger picture. Cool! Uh, so what does it say? <sighs> he just said it's not literal. Sage and Rosemary both ask the same question back to back. What the symbols mean? Even though Caraway just told them the exact meaning of the runes. Challenge? Growth, secrets, relationships, and the destruction of the previously mentioned. Sounds pretty literal to me. The students should be bracing themselves for hardships unlike anything they faced. That is the obvious interpretation, and since nothing further is offered, the literal reading is the way to go. Otherwise, this whole exercise is a huge waste of time now, isn't it? And are we to understand that in addition to every other overpowered yet underutilized magical ability, fortune telling, actual prophesizing, is yet another thing that just exists in this universe? The episodes to follow seem to eerily fit this divination. If you can read the flow of space time and predict events that are about to unfold, then I think this should be something that scholars work on day and night trying to prevent major catastrophes and the like, instead of relegating it to a parlor trick for children. But the writers once again ignore this concept of potentially cosmic proportions as soon as it is introduced. Because of course they do. Moving on to the actual episode at hand, the theme of the day is relationships. Allegedly. More on that later. For now, the academy has a new student. Shirt. Too sexy for my shirt, so sexy it hurts. Meet Aster. He's a babe. So much so that Rosemary instantly falls head over heels for his chiseled boy's manliness. A tad surprising, judging by the writer's track record so far. I imagined the protagonist would be a strong, independent woman who needs no man. Fawning over a hot guy is oddly standard cartoon teen girl behavior. But naturally, this infatuation won't last. See, the whole point with Aster's character in quotations is that he is unfathomably dumb, ignorant, inconsiderate, pompous, talentless, misogynistic, lying sack of shit, worst human you could imagine. Throughout the episode, he constantly spins falsehoods about obviously fake accolades. 
while failing in absolutely everything. And that's when I was crowned the city's best Brambleberry Pie Baker. I wish my house were bigger, honestly, because my parents had to start putting my trophies in the barn. Ugh, so embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, I knew that trampoline was there. So obvious. You're welcome, Rhubarb. Sure. How are you not dead? I have no idea. He is worthless in every way. And what's worse, he doesn't express the humility to match it. He is painful to watch. And somehow, even though everyone else in the show barring Rosemary sees the truth about him immediately, this meritless imbecile has somehow been chosen for the Guardian Academy. We welcome you, our first year students, and commend you for being chosen. You've each been selected for your exceptional qualities. My natural sense of direction is one of my best assets. <laughs> the dude is so dumb, he made a sharp left and walked straight into a hedge. I guess he's seriously craving for some bush? <laughs> to Rosemary's initial delight, she gets paired up with the dreamy hunk of dumb for the day's exercises. And at every turn, Aster keeps being arrogant, dismissive of Rosemary, to the point of not remembering her name. Rhubarb. Yes! Yes! Uh, Rhubarb! A hundred percent my name! And no matter what, Rosemary just keeps putting up with his crap, because Kia Aster Kun is so sugoi! Or something along those lines. Also worth noting is the fact that Aster needs Rosemary to bail him out on the obstacle course, because he is apparently less athletic than this noodle limp girly. Right. Now despite being lovesick, and thus being even more spine deficient than normally, Penis! even Rosemary has her limits. See, being a dismissive jerk two times, three times, four times, that's all fine and dandy, but five times? Oh no siree, that's once too many. So, Rosemary has a girl boss moment, finally asserts herself as an independent woman who does in fact need no man, and takes the lead. You see, the show was simply playing the long game with this one. You guys should have seen this girl. Go away. <laughs> you probably thought she's just a regular girl, nothing to notice, but Rhubarb's like really good at this stuff. Do not call me that. Oh, right. Um, Rose Barb's strength today showed me that I have a lot to learn about myself and how girls look cute when they climb walls and stuff. Now in all honesty, Aster did try. He complimented Rosemary and said he himself has some growing to do. And he sounded sincere in his own dumb not quite there yet as far as gender equality is concerned way. But hey, baby steps. Aster's biggest sin at this point is that he is really stupid cartoonishly stupid. And thus, he says absurd stupid things. He's not evil or anything. In a normal IRL situation, everyone involved would just move on, meet once in a while in the hallway, at class, and whatever happens, happens. Maybe Aster could learn that he doesn't have to pretend to be something that he's not, just to be liked. After all, he's at the academy to learn, just like everyone else. Every single avenue for meaningful storytelling and character development is wide open. It's been fun, Aster, but... Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Should have known you were stuck up. <sighs> wow, son, we need to have a word. But no, Aster just has to call Rosemary stuck up because calling someone stuck up is the worst thing imaginable. There is no way to mend the relationship now. He deserves to be punished. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops, dropped my hammer.
Hammer, I should be more careful. <laughs> yeah, oh, that was very irresponsible of you, Parsley. And remember, physical violence is funny when it happens to men. That's diverse characters. And this is the last we see of Aster. He just poof disappears from the show, even though he was a new freshman like everyone else. Did he get expelled? I would think that would be big news. Someone fucking up so royally that they actually got the boot. But nope, never elaborated. He gets no further mention, no chance to redeem himself, because he is an awful icky man creature and deserves all the shit that's coming to him. And since he already got his foot turned into sand by Parsley, the interest in his tail is done and dusted as far as the authors are concerned. What a nuanced yarn the writers have so graciously weaved for us. Which brings me to an interesting observation. For as awful as he is, as dumb, ignorant, inconsiderate, ill-mannered, negligent, and talentless as Aster is, our protagonist Rosemary exhibits much of the same qualities. But whenever she acts like the great zenith of dumbassery that she is, the show presents it as fun and quirky and free-spirited, she never gets into trouble for pulling the exact same shit as Aster. Take a look at these two scenes. One of the characters almost decapitating their classmate is presented as idiotic and evil, no redeeming qualities to them whatsoever, and the other is presented as just being silly. One character exhibits flaws, while another one has mere quirks. One set of rules for thee, another set of rules for me. Now which factor might affect the way the author favors one character over the other? What is the obvious difference between these characters? Why does one deserve leniency over the other? I've already touched on this issue here and there, but it's high time we do a proper deep dive. Given the stated agenda of pushing quote diverse characters and the writing staff's propensity for open misandry, I feel like there's no need to be coy about this. The writers, directors, the team behind this travesty are not making entertainment, they are creating propaganda with the aim of subverting common sense and morality, as well as undermine the ideals of masculinity in our culture. The 100% female writing staff are a bunch of man-haters, and every man working in the team are self-hating enablers. Pathetic. A sharp assertion demands evidence, so let's get providing. I'm gonna go through each male character in High Guardian Spice, and give you the gist of how they are presented in the show. A pattern is sure to manifest. Let's roll the tape all the way back to the first scene of the series. Here's Rosemary's father and older brother giving their full contribution to the narrative. A whole year away from Old Pebble, Rosemary. We're really gonna miss you. Oh, I'm glad you're wearing the locket. Your mom would be so proud of you. Would be? Mom is proud of you. That is it. That's all they get. Their only function in the show is to tell the protagonist and the audience that she is awesome, and that her mother, the strong and famous and bestest ever guardian lady, is sure to be proud of her. They aren't proud of her, her absent mother is proud of her, because of course, the opinion of males is secondary, if even that. The show goes for a double dip half an episode later. Rosie, your mom helps to right wrongs. Plus she gets to lug around that humongous sword. Even in Rosemary's dreams, her family is merely a bunch of cheerleaders, stating just how magnanimous and powerful the most important person in the family is. That being the mother. This is literally every single spoken line by these two in the entire show. In the flashback later on, the father says nothing, merely watching from the sidelines as the mother shares her wisdom to their offspring. It is never even alluded to how the rest of the family is coping after the sudden disappearance of the most important person in the world. We never see their grief, 
only Rosemary's loss has any narrative bearing. The male members of the family are not characters. They don't have hopes or dreams or personalities or lives or stories of their own. They are decorations at best. And mind you, we are talking about the family of the protagonist here. One would think that the origin of the main character held some significance, worth exploring in the form of the supporting cast. On the opposite side of the road, things are no better with Sage's father. High Guardian Academy doesn't just accept anyone you know. You girls will have to take advantage of every opportunity. Putting aside the blatant lie in that statement, this is the only time he speaks, or is present on screen, or is even mentioned. Sage never speaks about her father. She never dreads what he might think if she uses new magic. It's always about her mother. Much like with Rosemary, the father of the family is at most a prop attached to the mother. I swear if the writers thought they could get away with creating a world where women have children all on their own, they would have done it. I'm actually a bit surprised. The magic of this universe would surely excuse that plot contrivance. This is one of those rare cases where the writing staff showcases some restraint. You get that thing the hell away from me right this second. On the other hand, it would have been much harder to mock and vilify men if they didn't exist. As is the case with Parsley's family. The father is a traditional family man, hence evil and stupid and oppressive. He is the catalyst for the idiotic nonsense drama of episode 4, and the matter is not even patched up with him, but rather Parsley's mom. Of course the father can't be shown apologizing and being reasonable. That would mean writing a traditionally masculine man having some kind of decency and merit, maybe even growing as a person and atoning for their mistakes. And that is far too steep a task for a writer who openly hates all men. The flock of brothers are also interchangeable and worthless and dumb. They need Pixie's Parsley to rescue them. And apparently Parsley was fine growing up on her own with no siblings to babysit her. Because she is so much better than all of them, naturally. Out of the four main girls, Fime is the only one with a father figure who has some merit. He is shown to be a revered member of the elf community. And rather heroically, he remains behind amidst the rot infested woods while his family flees to safety. The man gets to be the paragon of virtue and the target of his daughter's admiration. Remarkably, a man doing something plot related, not presented as useless or evil. That is fantastic, coming from the pen of modern day agenda driven intersectional feminist spinster brigade. Oh right, but he has that melanin factor going for him, but of course. Gotta remember those rules of representation. As is the case with Hakone, the battle class teacher. He is coincidentally the only other traditionally masculine character who gets to actually do anything, while presented as competent. To be absolutely clear, he is far from competent. Everyone in this show is an idiot at the end of the day, but the show claims that he is competent. As a taste of his spectacular failures, he lets his students spar with real weapons against one another on the same day they pick them up. Someone is going to kill their classmate, and it's going to happen soon. Additionally, exactly like his fellow professors at the academy, his guidance is often non-existent, and when it isn't non-existent, it is absolutely baffling how misguided and idiotic it is. <laughs> Snapdragon, this is your father's weapon. It is. There are times when the weapon one inherits is not inherently best suited to them. <laughs> hmm. I, I should stick with the axe. I don't want to tarnish his legacy. Snapdragon, it can be painful to let go of the identity others expect you to manifest. But what of your legacy, young guardian? You must play to your strengths. Mm. Ah! Whoa. How about earning your keep and teaching Snapdragon to actually use the axe, you miserable Mr. Miyagi wannabe piece of shit? It's a precious family heirloom, you don't just hand it over to someone else. Obviously, 
the reason Snapdragon can't use it effectively is that he has the build of al dente spaghetti. That's just how muscles work, you know. Athleticism is the prerequisite for armed combat. Make him drop down and give you 24 starters. Jesus Christ, this isn't rocket science. But hey, no biggie. Snapdragon can just use a rapier, because handling a rapier is something you can pick up immediately and requires no training or discipline or muscle mass. All you fencing enthusiasts out there, you heard it here first. You are all ninnies and your sport is a joke. Now obviously, the absolute triumph of Hakone as a character is when he steps in ready to scold Aster and defend the honor of his female students. And after Parsley fucking annihilates Aster's foot, seriously, he's lucky if he walks again. Professor Shaq Fu here does nothing but smirks along, even though one of his students just physically assaulted their classmate. Justice? The rules should be becoming clear. White hetero male bad, black hetero male possibly good, for as long as they act like good little feminist allies. To be fair, this same courtesy is extended to white male characters as well. As long as they spend each and every moment of their existence validating the female cast. Such is the case with Parsley Smithing Teacher, whose only function in the story is to tell Parsley just how fantastic she is. Similarly, the creature known as Slime Boy is fine in the writer's eyes. He gets to hang around the school, never really doing anything, just existing, looking pathetic and weak, sounding like a cat getting smushed by a road roller. And when he sings, he sounds even worse. You asked him to pour peas down your shirt. Adjacent to him is Parnell, the other creature that just exists. He is introduced as a disgusting wimp, literally crying because bullying. And yet, he is apparently the bestest ever, as seen on the obstacle course. I need you to know something. What's that, Parnell? I am very good at all of this. I believe you. Thank you. <laughs> Parnell! How did you know you'd bounce? I didn't. But in general, I don't believe in oblivion. Want some trail mix? Come on, just roll on your back when you get to the top. Yes! Yippee! That's it! We finished the course! I wonder if we're the first! You shot for the moon and nailed it, kid. Oh, I feel like I could melt bones with my mind. This pathetic dwarf shit is the fastest, strongest, most athletic, most intuitive student in the entire freshman class. Parsley and Parnell ace the course, getting a new record time. Parsley gets the first place by technicality, even though this was supposed to be a team exercise. And that is tragic, because there is a shiny trophy. And it would have been really super duper neat if Parnell had won the trophy instead of Parsley. And why is there even a trophy for this random obstacle course in the first place? For the first year class? The first time any of them even see the damn thing. This show is a fever dream. Parsley concedes the win to Parnell by assaulting Aster. Thus getting points deducted? And that is great. Parnell is the writer's wet dream. A victimized, wimpy, effeminate creature who is black, has no interest in girls, and is at once better and stronger than all the other students, including obviously buffer traditional male students, who 
who by all logic and laws of fucking physics should be better in physical activities. And the bullying he has suffered is never shown by the by, it just exists in one episode off screen and is ignored for the rest of the show's duration. Parnell isn't hindered by the alleged physical and emotional torture in any way. It's just scattershot garbage writing, pure and simple. The characters are what they are, morphing from scene to scene to fit whatever the writers wish to barf on screen. It's not even any kind of underdog rises above all expectations kind of deal. Apparently, Parnell is supposed to be some kind of prodigy, being only 10 years old in an academy where everyone else are teenagers. It's not even stated in the show. You have to go to the wiki to find this nugget of info. Yes, this trash fire has a dedicated wiki. And without it, I could never tell. All the characters are so childish in design and conduct, I would have honestly believed if the show said everyone is 10 years old. Also, those are the dumbest bladed weapons I have ever seen. Anyone who uses those, go fuck yourself. Sword? Sickle? Pick one. Callum is Parnell's relative and alleged tormentor. A brutish, mean, homophobic, transphobic, meritless piece of shit. He's a real jerk. He's basically Aster 2.0. Even his dark complexion won't save him from the one-dimensional evil bully jock fuckhead archetype. His crimes against the intersectional feminist religion are just so severe. We'll go through those in due time. In the meantime, to protect the world from the scourge of standards and common sense, we have Caraway, an absolute cretin and unforgivably incompetent moron. That's what actually happens on screen. But as far as the show wishes to present him, he's the bestest teacher ever and the epitome of everything a human being should be. After all, he is the creator's self-insert, there is no debating the fact, he goes so far as to voice act the fucker, that's how deep the mindless self-indulgence goes. The trans man is the greatest man who ever lived, the wisest, kindest, strongest, most talented person ever. He's also apparently an absolute stud, a sex beast oozing unparalleled charisma. <laughs> Hello, again? <laughs> Girls, sorry. Caraway and Alo have ended up in the same costume four years in a row. At least you're not dressed as cats. I've seen a million here. So boring. Well, how do you guys and Professor Bunny know each other? Oh, we, uh... We go to the same parties. I'm far past giving this show anything resembling benefit of the doubt. So in all cases where information is given this vaguely, I am assuming the most ridiculous interpretation. So apparently, Caraway has such an utterly magnificent sexual aura that he has casual threesomes with lesbian couples in his free time. The creator wrote their own sexual fantasy into the show. The absolute depravity. And speaking of all for fantasies written into the show, Snapdragon is Caraway's ginger alt coloring. Out of all the students, he's surely gonna be the bestest ever one day. You may be confused by that assertion. Isn't he an asshole? A friend of Amaryllis? And a bully? Ah yes, you see, that's gonna be ignored going forth. Never mentioned again. The show treats him like a decent guy who's never done anything wrong and never will do anything wrong. He's part of that pathetic creature club that just exists, and are allowed to exist, and given screen time, even while having nothing to offer to the narrative. In fact, he's the only character given anything resembling an arc in the entire show, despite the fact that he isn't even one of the main four. Don't misunderstand, it's absolute garbage, but also clear favoritism nonetheless. But why, you ask? What makes him so special? Well, the tiny fact that Snapdragon wants to cut off his dick and become a girl instead. I'll go through the details once the time is ripe, but for now, suffice to say Snapdragon's story is the show's core thesis slapping the audience brazenly in the face. Traditional masculinity, and femininity for that matter, is evil. 
every male should grow up to be a girl, and every female should grow up to be a boy, Snapdragon's family are nothing but oppressive bullies, and his father is the manifestation of everything wrong with the male sex, and pure evil. Even though everything he says and does is 100% correct. Oh, and then there are some idiots scheming to take over the world, destroy the world, kill people, trying to... something... evil? I guess they are the bad guys. They are all incompetent, flat, and unintimidating, and cartoony, and they are impossible to take seriously. And the only female villain of the show gets redeemed eventually. Who saw that one coming? And then we have Doyle. Who could ever forget about Doyle? Who is Doyle, you ask? Well, let me tell you about Doyle. Or rather, let's hear what the triad has to say about Doyle. You've each been selected for your exceptional qualities, which you will hone over the course of three years. Or four, or nine, if you're that, that one kid. What was his name? Doyle. If you know your vows already, you may recite them now. Please be sure to do so before dinner time. Or don't drop out like Doyle. Oh, Doyle! That was his name, the useless one. The lousiest guardian cadet in the history of the Academy was a boy. Out of all the deep lore the show could have included about the school and its history, this was apparently the most necessary. And there you have it. The ideal man is wimpy, effeminate, has no sex drive, and stays out of the way of the stunning and brave female cast, while showering them with praise. And the most worthwhile men are those who openly hate their penises, or conversely are late adopters, and if you happen to fit the traditional white heteromasculine male mold in any degree, your two choices are either to be brushed aside, or to be the literal villain. That's the extent of nuance as far as characterization is concerned in this show. Every story carries the philosophy of the author, the way they see the world, and the ideals they wish to insert into the world. In the case of High Guardian Spice, this fantasy is all about a bunch of cunt-huffing pieces of human filth turning their dreams of revenge towards the male sex into an animated disaster and passing it off as entertainment. And the bashing doesn't stop at mere characterization. It's not a coincidence that when Amaryllis shoots up the schoolyard, the only students caught in the blasts are boys. It's not a coincidence that not a single heterosexual relationship is shown blossoming in the show. It's not a coincidence that there doesn't exist a single instance in this 12 episode series where two male characters have a conversation amongst themselves. I'm not kidding, not a single scene escapes the vagina folk. I don't need to tell you that this is a statistical impossibility. This does not happen by accident, it's crafted on purpose. This is not up for conversation, there is nothing to debate here. This show and its creators hate the male sex, the very concept of masculinity, and wish to see it eradicated. The message is blatantly clear. Steering back to the episode at hand, the fizzling infatuation between our hero Rosemary and the straw man of heteronormativity, isn't the only relationship getting focus at the obstacle course. The entire episode is dedicated to bonds being formed amongst the cast. I think... Don't talk to me. Honestly, that was great. You're great. Oh, yes. You don't a lot of time, but what you do Boy, it's succinct. You're brutal. I love it. What? What do you mean? I mean, I'm not the one that made slab. <gasps> that was all you. Good job. Maybe you should sit with Snapdragon and me at lunch. You know what I mean? Following up from episode 5, Amaryllis has suddenly decided that Fime is simply the bee's knees. The way she... 
did absolutely nothing to make Sage cry, was so impressive that the resident bully of the class is adamant to make the Dark Elf her... friend? Girlfriend? A friend who happens to be a girl, it's not quite clear. In any case, the pair saunter through this magical hedge maze, because of course there is a magical hedge maze, Harry Potter did it, so darn it we can't pass up the chance to rip something off, tackling the lackluster challenges, whilst engaging the patented brand of High Guardian hijinks. By which I mean shit dialogue. Uh, elf girl? What happened? Whatever, this is stupid. Are you gonna help me? Are you going to stop pretending that you don't know my name? Ugh. <sighs> Just tell me what happened. Fine. Uh, the hedge maze is magic and apparently doesn't like being hacked at with an axe. Hmm. Just give me my bracelet. It has my Terra Sphere. <sighs> I don't get why you'd use magic in here. Kind of defeats the obstacle part of the obstacle course. Maybe I'm just testing your loyalty, elf girl. I'm loyal to people who bother to learn my name. Hmm, fair. Thank you, time. Since when is this a thing? Amaryllis called fine by her name in the previous episode. Hi, time. So where exactly is this elf girl thing coming from? I'd like to point out that the same person responsible for episode 5 co-wrote this episode also, and they also lent their voice to Amaryllis. So even the person who both writes and voices the character can't keep her motivations and relationships to other characters consistent between two episodes. This is pure apathy, plain and simple. I just, I don't see the point of this kind of thing. If we want a bunch of hedges moved, we just call a gardener. Watch it. My mom's a gardener. I mean, a botanist. What do your parents do? Travel, mostly. I was raised by nine au pairs. I wish I... Don't. Don't say you would trade all your money to have parents that would spend more time with you. Fime's comment here is extremely telling. First of all, she's being a bitch. One would think she, if anyone, would understand the value of family togetherness, seeing as it is her defining character motivation. But beyond that, this line is just out of place. Fime's comment plays into the meta-knowledge of having an archetypical pampered rich kid who seems cold and distant on the outside, but all they really want is to be loved. They may seem to have everything, but money won't buy happiness, that kind of deal. To anticipate and dismiss this trope in advance implies that Fime has seen this kind of thing before, but where? I don't think she has spent much time with anyone outside her own family, let alone to have seen this happen multiple times. And this world doesn't seem to be overly supplied with any type of pop culture or the like. Storytelling isn't a major pastime in this world, enough so that tropes like this would have already reached the status of cliches. So why did Fime jump to such a ridiculous assumption? <laughs> Are you kidding? I'd rather eat rocks than listen to my mother go on about her affairs. <laughs> We've got that in common. The simple truth is that this is purely a flat meta joke from the writers. It's immersion breaking first of all, all that's missing is the characters winking at the camera. And secondly, the sentiment behind it is absurdly misguided. The authors don't have the will or the skill to give any of their characters proper cohesive sympathetic characterization. The entire cast has the complexity of stale glass of water with drops of diarrhea sprinkled in for good measure. And at the same time the writers have the gall to mock an archetype outside their repertoire, admittedly corny though it may be. This show has strange priorities. Wait, do you mean affairs like the business stuff she does? Or do you mean- Oh, <laughs> she's a lush who never met a deckhand she didn't deck. With her hands. <laughs> She's a human shipwreck. But my dad's worse. <laughs> uh, wait, did you mean affairs like... Yeah, I meant the other thing. Oh, okay. Ugh. 
moving from one gag dead on arrival to the next. The delivery and reactions lack any energy to properly convey the comedy. And the double entendre was weak at best. There isn't anyone in existence who could honestly misinterpret the situation. The comedy in this show is like listening to discarded Amy Schumer material. Pain to the very core of my soul. This maze is terrible. Yep. Just like people. <laughs> yeah, well, we got that in common too. Misanthropy bringing people together. How wonderful. And with that bonding done, the pair are... Two people who tolerate one another. It's actually hard to say where the relationship stands going forth. Fyme and Amaryllis never do anything as twosome for the rest of the show. So establishing this pairing was a complete waste of time. Though the same can be said about Parsley and Parnell. Those two are never even present at the same scene after this episode. Why do all of these random plot threads exist if nothing gets done with them? The show has a wide cast, so everyone just has to have something to do each episode? Is that it? That's just the way it is. Half the stuff going on serves no storytelling purpose. It's just noise and colors and motions barely resembling human interactions. Every episode, minutes upon end, just aimless lameness between boring characters, conversations about nothing. It honestly makes me question how much time the writers have actually spent talking and living with fellow human beings. Outside their own immediate circle of hive-minded hens, I mean. In my experience, the basic everyday pleasantries over a morning cup of coffee have more meaning than any of this strite. But as we find between the lines, or just firmly slouching all over the text, the creators of this show have some obviously unresolved traumas when it comes to human relations. Do you think Aster's cute? Uh-huh. Might be a few rooms short of a full set, but he's a babe. I don't see it. <laughs> Is he trying to teach Rose how to use her own sword? <laughs> yup. Not sure what you're worried about. There is only one surefire way to get over a crush. Spend time with them. Huh. A guy tried talking to me during lunch once and an entire clam fell out of his mouth. That's when I knew. Uh, nothing. Clams are bad. Don't look at me. That was a joke. I believe the guys are all awful. I mean, Hackberry Trout was okey, but he never tried to explain magic to me. I think time's right about the antidote to crushes. <laughs> Once the mystery's gone, all that's left is an actual person. And usually that person has weird hangups. That is an alarmingly pessimistic view on people. Most people have weird hangups. That is what we call projection. And make no mistake, this sentiment isn't challenged in the show, so it is the author talking directly to the audience. That is how communication of ideas works. The writers clearly don't think highly of the people they share this planet with, and their ideals of romance are... they are interesting. While Rosemary is pining over Aster, there is another tale of blooming affection running adjacent to it. As you may remember from episode 3, Snapdragon has decided that Sage is remarkably appealing, owing to the fact how she mildly told off his best friend that one time. Anyway, here he is, finally making his move on the girl. Now I've been yammering on for several hours at this point, and I was thinking a change of perspective might be refreshing for a wee while. And since we are examining the mental movements of young girls, a more ladylike angle might be just the thing. You called. And she arrives right on cue. You mind taking this one? Not at all. As with every other plotline in this show, the romance between Snapdragon and Sage only serves to highlight just how unlikable the characters are. Snapdragon starts out strong, he offers his help to Sage, compliments her sorcery and tells she looks pretty, 
I mean, simple girls fall for that sort of thing, just ignore the whole bullying thing the show does. But even though she is being showered with attention and has her own training to worry about, Sage's attention keeps drifting towards Rosemary and her would-be arm candy. At every turn, she continues to obsess about her quote best friend. The only day so far when Rosemary has other priorities. And even though Snap tries to steer Sage's attention back on track repeatedly, Sage refuses to leave the subject be, not until she and Snap have this ridiculous spat that she finally shuts up. We're a better team than Ro Hmm. You're way too hung up on Rosemary. <sighs> you wouldn't get this. You're a guy. But Rosemary and I, we've been best friends for pretty much ever. <laughs> I understand friendship. Guy friendship is different. It isn't the same. Guys don't talk about their feelings. Let's just focus on the task. But Rose could do so much better. I know what she needs, and it's not him. <sighs> do I have to pay you? Do you want some kind of bribe? For what? To stop talking about Aster and Rosemary. She likes him. Who cares? I care. You don't say. Well, what if Amaryllis was going on and on about Aster all day? I'd be happy for her. She usually just talks about murder. Rose and I are girls. You and Amaryllis are a different story. In any case, guys just don't understand that the bond between girls is just deeper. And that, I'm a girl. You couldn't possibly understand. Girls and guys and guys and girls and girls and... <sighs> I'm sick of you talking like that. I'm sick of... A lot right now. Snapdragon? Just finish the puzzle. And even though she clearly made Snap upset, it doesn't occur to her to apologize. Not until she sees Rosemary and Aster falling out. Then everything is sunshine and rainbows once more. Sage apologizes for being annoying, but only after she gets exactly what she wants. She knows that she has Rosemary all to herself once again, so now everything is fine. Now she can be all precious and nice and accommodating once her own non-issue has been resolved. Sage is a terrible friend. She feels this neurotic ownership towards Rosemary and takes pleasure from her misfortune. Her crust didn't turn out the way she had hoped, and Sage takes glee from the fact. She is acting like a stereotypical mean girl, laughing behind someone's back, and then acting all buddy buddy when they meet again. And after spending an afternoon together, walking around and not really accomplishing anything, apparently in the writer's eyes these two are now friends. Not only that, but they have also developed romantic chemistry? I guess Sage doesn't mind dating her on-off bully. In reality, neither of them have done or said anything to spark a proper romance. It's all just blushing over nothing. You... you've got a thing. Oh, um, hey, where's your hat? I'm experimenting with not wearing it all the time. It looks good, and, and it's nice to see your hair. <laughs> Stop. They feel artificial together, like a romance novel written by an algorithm. The one big question a writer needs to answer when writing a romance is this. Why do these characters love each other? A pretty face only carries so far, there also has to be something valuable tucked within. Neither Sage nor Snapdragon have any qualities worthy of admiration. Sage obsesses about her friend, whines about nothing, and has both inferiority and superiority complex at the same time regarding her magic, bizarrely enough. She has most of the symptoms often associated with codependence issues. You don't want to date this kind of girl. Snapdragon's interest should have fizzled out after spending a day with Sage, like things ended with Rosemary and Aster. But that's the thing, in the end Snap is really not looking for a romantic partner, but rather a shoulder to cry on, someone to validate him while he deals with his own personal issues. Hey, if you ever want to talk about the heavier stuff... Yes, please, I could really... There's some stuff I could... I could really, really... I'd like to talk about. When Sage offers to hear him unload, 
His eagerness reveals his intentions. And just like Snap has an awful taste in girls, Sage has an awful taste in men. All that Sage knows about Snapdragon is that he is an occasional bully, a friend of Amaryllis, and has no mental fortitude to deal with an annoying girl for a whole afternoon without escalating into this weird rant. Girls and guys and guys and girls and girls and... Sage made snap to snap. I am Bunnybot. And by the by, men talk about deep stuff and share their feelings too. Close bros exist. Emotions have nothing to do with sex. Rose and I are girls. You and Amaryllis are a different story. In any case, guys just don't understand that the bond between girls is just deeper. Hilariously enough, Sage's crime in this scenario wasn't that she downplayed the emotional side of men. In the writer's mind, her crime was that she dared to suggest that Snapdragon was a man. That's the subtext here. Snap is emotional, men aren't emotional, therefore Snap must be a girl. It's pure lunacy. The writers are so focused on foreshadowing Snapdragon's transition arc that they don't care what nonsense they end up spewing in the process. Men don't have feelings. Not like girls. What a load of bull! All in all, Snap and Sage are heading in for a toxic relationship. They have nothing in common. They don't complement each other's personalities or attributes in any way. They are unpleasant to be around. They have no true companionship to offer. They will simply act as validation dispensers for each other. And this is presented as romantic? In real life, this kind of relationship would be doomed from the start. It would end at the first sign of trouble or turn into a downward spiral of mutual codependency. Obviously in a different show, if these issues and character flaws were presented as actual flaws, then there could be an interesting story to tell. But that's not how this show works. In High Guardian Spies, all the good characters are perfect as they are, and all the bad characters are one-dimensional punching bags with nothing redeemable about them. The concept of character development is far too complex to these writers. That about cover it? Thanks, that was lovely. May I bother you for assist later as well? I'll be around. Episode 6 marks the point where the creative team's mask not only slips, but falls off entirely and tumbles into the shredder, never to be seen again. Every decision with this show is made not in service of the narrative or the characters, but as an outlet for the author's revenge fantasies towards the male sex and a soapbox for some utterly bizarre ideals. The writers all suffer from unresolved personal issues, and they are using this show as a demented form of therapy. The protagonist learns that pretty people are not always what they appear to be on the surface, and that is a valuable lesson to give for 8-year-olds. The creators are adult children, they are writing a show allegedly aimed at mature audiences, and this is their ace material. Almost makes me yearn for the quality of episode 1, when everything was merely lame and idiotic, instead of this constant cavalcade of horrid morals presented as virtuous. But on the brighter side, we are halfway through our journey. Episode 7 opens with our team of idiots on their way towards a training quest out of town. Puzzlingly, this is treated as some sort of grand parade. The entire Lingarf has come to see them off, which means this same test happens each year, on the same day, and is promoted as an event that people may come to see. These brats walking through town on their way to a field trip. This fantasy world filled with omni-capable magic has the most easily impressed people in existence. And as per usual, we are treated to the most inane dialogue imaginable right out of the gate. If this show has nailed down something consistently, 
It's how to make me wins from the futility of it all. Someone was paid to write this. I've already pointed out the as you know style of writing, but it bears mentioning again, since this show keeps repeating this fuck up. This is not how people talk. The kid has no reason to say this right now, at this specific moment, when the camera, aka us, the audience, just so happened to be focused on him. There is no connecting conversation, nothing leads to this statement, it's awkward, it's unnatural, it's the most amateurish type of info dumping, stop doing this. And what makes this extra insulting? The info given isn't even something of substance. Every year there's a new mission? So what? Who cares? What does that add to the narrative? If anything, it sprouts further questions. Why is there a different quest each year? Wouldn't the same test be the most consistent measure of skill? It's not like there's need to change it for the sake of surprise. Nobody's gonna take the test more than once. They are either gonna graduate, or they are dead. Are they cheering or trying to scare us? That cave has barely swallowed up a bushel of kids. There's your answer. Uh, a bushel? The cave eats students? <gasps> that sounds like a good adventure! Caves don't eat. They're sideways holes made of rocks. That is blatant vertical cave phobia coming from Fime. Caves need not be horizontal, they can just as easily lead downwards. A pit cave, if you will. You know, the kind of place this show should be dumped into. Come on, the episode is called The Cave of Vinka. The entire goal is to learn all about that hole. I will not tolerate such misinformation about caves spread so brazenly. Good luck, darlings! If you die in there, I'm keeping your stuff! <laughs> Thanks, Red Bud! Don't fret. Townsfolk always come out to freak out the first years. We're not in mortal danger. I'm 80% sure of that. Uh, only 80%? That's right, Zinnia. The cave's a real death trap. You've heard the legends. All of Redbud's clothes are from students who plunge to their death. <laughs> okay, so which 14-year-old students, most of whom are half the height of this cackling crone, own spinster robes in her size? See what I mean? Most of the time this show and its dialogue is lame and unnatural, but this episode has suddenly kicked everything into overdrive. Not a single line these characters drool out of their worthless mouths makes any kind of sense. And the show really wants us to know that this exercise will indeed be extremely dangerous. The stakes are high, people may die, it's a true trial by fire, a make or break test for the freshman class. And the way the show goes about this, is by having the characters treat the death of youngsters as fun and quirky. How is this supposed to weed out the weak ones? They're all a big old herd of cowards. They're scared because the cave is miles deep, and monsters have risen from the depths. The mission is meant to challenge them, but it also forces them to challenge themselves. Boring! I miss the days when we used to just throw them in lava. We never did that. Right, of course not. <laughs> this constant jokey tone towards serious topics like this simply feels wrong. The crazy potion teacher is one thing, but now everyone's in on it? It's stupid, not funny, only reveals how immature the writers are. You cannot make a serious narrative about warriors whose literal goal is to guard the realm and the lives of their fellow men while doing this semi-self-aware LOL, we are totally having a D&D &D quest in a dungeon for real Z's. It's gonna be like filled with monsters and stuff and you will probably die. Isn't this fun? Routine. It's not amusing, it makes everyone look like sociopaths. Stop it. 
The cave of Vinca is a wondrous and ancient maze in which mysteries and monsters await you. As do maiming, mauling, and malediction if you're not careful. Remember, when you see the walls fall in and your throat Enough! close... None of us should be going in there! Why would any of you choose to walk into this nightmare? Um, because we want to be guardians. Well, ho, Zinnia, going for the old voluntary expulsion. That is wild. Go for it. Don't you at least want to stay and find out what our quest is going to be? No, no, I'm too young and way too attractive for a suicide mission. Good on you. Save yourself. You, my dear lassie, have just made the best decision in your life. Get yourself a proper education, some place that isn't run by malicious miscreant morons. You are young, all the doors are open to you, and you should respect yourself enough not to take this kind of shit. You are officially the smartest character in High Guardian Spice. Not exactly a genius. You should have packed your bags after that forceful French kissing Flora fiasco. But still, a character showcasing realistic human reaction to anything is such a breath of fresh air. Sadly, this also means that my new favorite character will no longer show up. Farewell, Xenia, the girl with great aspirations, attending both the blacksmith and magician classes. Even though those are two different tracks, this curriculum makes no sense. And speaking of things that make no sense, this girl is at two places at the same time. Look at this. That's the same character. These classes take place at the exact same time in episode 2. And she's yet another character who supposedly attends both smithing and magic classes. I swear, everyone just does whatever. That whole expo dump Parsley gave about the different study tracks was complete waste. Where was I again? Oh, right, the farewells. Anyway, I wish you all the best. May you find happiness. Maybe someplace close to the Grove of Flying Pokemon Rodents? The other best characters in the show? Back to the main topic at hand. The student's mission is to head into the cave and collect a vial of magical healing water. There is a cave that anyone can simply march into that has unguarded fountains of magical healing water just sitting there, going unused. And it's not just some mild tonic, oh no, as we shall discover, it is quite the potent beverage. Is there a reason why the cave isn't fitted with a pipeline harvesting this miracle remedy for hospitals and the like? Other than it's yet another random magical bullshit plot device that is only brought up when it's convenient for the plot. Um, Professor Hakone, I have a question. Hmm, go ahead. Can the spring, the, um, the healing waters, what do they heal? Could they heal a tree? Yes, yes I suppose it could. That is an interesting question, Fime. Why do you ask? Is there some kind of natural disaster threatening to engulf the world? Maybe at the backyard of the academy? Should we be worried? Maybe do something about it? Concentrating all our efforts into harvesting the water and distributing it to all the locations affected by the rot? Of course, everyone in this show is a goddamn moron, so no one asks the obvious follow-up questions. Because we don't want the conflict actually resolved, even though there is a painfully simple solution to everything. Hey, Time, did you ask about healing trees for botany homework? No. Hmm, did you ask so that they tell us why they need it? I think we're here. Sage, you were there when Fime discovered the rot tree, you unimaginably dim-witted skittle brain. You should know exactly why she's interested. You didn't ask about the tree then, you forgot about it the second the screen faded to the next scene, but now you are suddenly asking questions. Because this is the episode where Fime will eventually spill the beans to the rest of the girls. So now it's okay to bring it up. I have never seen a show where characters act this artificially and only in the service of the current plot. So the test itself is set up idiotically. All the students are given a map to the fountain, yet everyone heads in different directions. 
which means that most of the students don't know how to read a map properly. What the fuck is the school teaching these nitwits? The obstacle course was supposed to be training for the cave trip, but what exactly did the students learn? Climbing? Walking in a maze? With a compass? But without a map? Solving slide tile puzzles? Which of these is supposed to be useful inside this cave? It is a dungeon leading down in gentle slopes and staircases. At what point would you need to climb or solve goddamn tile puzzles? Also, the dungeon apparently gets more dangerous the lower it goes, with named levels indicating the intensity of danger posed by monsters. These maps show the caves and corridors down to level 3, where you will find the spring of healing waters. There are uncounted levels below and more springs, each with more concentrated magic, but protected by monsters. Below level 3, the risk level exceeds your training. This is some utterly absurd video game logic. There is no reason why the threat level of beasts would be consistently increasing going downward. They are creatures with their own goals and desires. They do whatever they please. It is not their job to huddle up in different parts of a dungeon according to their capability to fuck up an adventurer. That makes no sense. Using the mechanical side of video games or tabletop RPGs as a basis for world building is cringe. It never sounds natural, it never feels natural. Games usually have a numerical progression system, because it's easy to understand mechanically, and it simulates the feeling of growth. And the developers craft more and more intense encounters as the quest progresses, because consistently increasing challenge is satisfying. Games have to follow somewhat rigid rules to be functional. There are ways to make mechanics feel less gamey, but at the end of the day, it is the player's job to forgive the silly gaminess when immersing in the experience. But this is not a video game, it's supposed to be a naturally functioning fantasy world, with laws of nature not dissimilar to real life, Using the logic of games in non-interactive stories is always immersion breaking. And the cave itself feels like a collection of video game levels mushed together. It's just a bunch of stuff, with no cohesion whatsoever. There's a tunnel with roots, man-made temples, a random house for giants, crystal caverns, all right next to one another. Random stuff in a sequence inside a hole is not world building. There is no place in existence that functions like this. Even in fantasy, there needs to be a reason behind locations. We never learn anything substantial about Vinka, the deity the dungeon is named after, other than that she was apparently a huge cunt. That is Vinka. She liked to crash parties and turn her suitors into wine. And drink them. Weird way to spend your time. No, Fyim. It's not weird. It's absolutely disgusting. But that was supposed to be a callous joke, of course. People dying is funny. I'm guessing all her suitors were of the male variety. At the end of the road of absolutely no resistance, the girls arrive at the fountain. Mild surprise, the well has dried up, for whatever reason. Now this means that everyone taking the test failed, right? The objective was to collect the water, there is no way to collect the water, therefore everyone gets an F. Or at the very least, the result is non-conclusive. The teachers didn't bother to check whether or not the quest can be completed before sending the students into the murder hole, but that's basic High Guardian Academy incompetence, so I'm not truly shocked. Jumping ahead a bit, the girls do actually find another fountain, and time collects a vial of the magical remedy, but she never hands it in, she keeps it for herself. So even the protag team never completes the quest, and yet, this mission, this vital make or break test for freshman guardians, is ignored and utterly forgotten by the end of the episode. I'm dead serious. No one mentions it again, not the teachers, nor the students, not even the protagonists themselves. 
I have to underline this as fiercely as I possibly can. The test, which this whole episode revolves around. The premise, which we spent several minutes establishing in detail, just vanishes. The second half of this episode, including the conclusion, is written as if the test never even existed and the characters were spelunking the cave just because. No one in the academy is alarmed by the fact that the waters have dried. The students don't talk about it. The faculty takes no action. This incident leads to nothing. The characters themselves comment on the fact initially. This fountain's completely dry. Huh. Do the teachers know? Is this a test? But as soon as that statement fades into memory, the memory of this incident fades to nothing. The heroes don't pursue the obvious questions. And the adults responsible for these youths and this test apparently never bother to ask what happened down there or to check if any of them actually succeeded at the task. It's the mutant cat episode all over again, except arguably worse since this test was so hyped up and included most of the freshman class. The test itself should be rescheduled at least, as it currently stands. There is no true conclusion to this story arc, there is no epilogue, it's like every character in the show is suffering from memory loss. This is the fundamental flaw in this show's writing. I mean there are several fundamental flaws, but this is the all-encompassing, the alpha and the omega, the flaw. Nothing matters. Even a self-contained conflict spanning a single episode is never properly tied up. This type of slapdash writing is beyond frustrating. The viewer can never be certain which information on screen actually matters, and what will be ignored going forth. You cannot communicate a story like this. Big obvious events need to lead into big obvious consequences, cause and effect, the basis of real life, and thus the basis of cohesive storytelling, not even automatically good storytelling, just functional storytelling. Back to the moment to moment stupidity, before anyone can work their brain too much, the video game dungeon springs a random battle upon the girls. It's the return of the Parasex, this time a chunkier variety. Oh hey little big guy. The creature was right there in plain sight. How did you think it was that small? How did you not see that it was enormous? How stupid does this show think its audience to be? But no time to think, it's time to fight. Time to fight! I just fucking said that. And here we have the first proper showcase of action in the show. Aside from the Manticore Massacre flashback from episode 3. Fantasy adventure show, 7 episodes in, finally some action. And as is the case with every other aspect of this animated atrocity, the combat is... just absolute sludge. It only lasts a minute or so, but it feels twice as long, which is the exact opposite of what action should be. There is zero energy, no choreography. The girls just swat their weapons around and use the most basic methods of destroying their foes. And even though there were dozens of Parasex all ganging up on them, they never get overwhelmed, because the ones out of frame apparently just wait for their turn to get annihilated. How friendly of them. Lackluster action is hard to explain fully without going into directing, cinematography, or the methods and mechanics of animation itself, you know, visual side, which I do not claim to be an expert of in any degree. But in general sense, the core of satisfying action is built upon the ebb and flow, the changes within the moment, the shift of power between the combatants, the feeling of not quite knowing who will end up on top and how until the event unfolds is the thing that creates dynamic action. It's like a collection of mini plot twists in a sequence. This holds true both in duels and bigger battles involving a group of fighters, as well as something not directly combat, but action nonetheless, such as chase scenes. 
Of course, random stuff simply happening for the sake of surprise is not the point. Like with every other aspect of storytelling, consistency is the key. What can the characters do? How can they utilize their skills most effectively? How far can the writer push the characters and their skill set without actually killing them? A dance on the edge of the knife, a close victory against the odds. That's good drama, that's compelling. Characters actually achieving something impressive. Not just in general, but impressive for them. This show has none of that. Even in scenes like this, where there are dozens of enemies, there should be at least a bit of back and forth between the heroes and the monsters. Make the heroes deflect a few blows before dispatching the creature. Don't just annihilate them by the truckload with no effort whatsoever. If the enemy feels weak, there is no sense of accomplishment. Action is supposed to be exciting. That is the sole reason to have it. It should grab the audience at least on some minor level, make them feel like they are there in the moment, an electrifying sensation. Literally action. This here is just wimpy and sad. It's just... Monsters attack, I guess. Let's beat them up for a while. That's what fantasy people do. This scene is the perfect example of misplaced priorities as it relates to chosen genre. The show wears the disguise of an action-adventure battle school shounen magical girl whatever series. But as we have established, in truth, its only goal is to act as an outlet for the creator's shitty ideas. Boring OCs, hurl-inducing self-insert fantasies, obnoxious soapboxing for idiotic political views, all the worst telltale signs of amateur writing. The authors don't care about the genre or type of story they claim to be telling. They've decided to make an action-adventure battle school shounen magical girl whatever series, because that's the type of nebulous genre a vast portion of anime slash cartoon viewing populace go for. You have your demographic already established, most anyone and everyone. But if you wish to make an action-adventure story, it stands to reason that someone on the creative team should have a passion and a vision for the action side of things. It doesn't need to be ultra bombastic or highly complex. Just something that feels like it actually belongs and the people making it cared. And not merely a formality. Also, also, the way the girls slaughter all these poor creatures is just cruel. They are introduced all cutesy and helpful, and one of them even takes liking to Parsley. It looks like the tiny thing is going to become a mascot buddy for her. That's how it would work in any other show. Stop Thanks for the help, Momo! But then the little one just disappears and all of its relatives get exterminated. Because that's funny. Why can't we have these things as mascots or the Trixies from episode 1? Those are adorable. These are way better designs than those nightmare fuel goat frog things. Those are everywhere, as if they are so charming we cannot get enough of them. The writers don't even know what they have, or how to utilize it properly. And now these big travers get killed by the dozen while screaming in agony. <laughs> Giving them angry eyes does not make them any less cute. And they aren't evil. They are just defending their home. And then these vapid girls just come prancing in and wipe them out because adventure and stuff. Suddenly there's blood and money shots of fatalities. It all comes of mean-spirited. True, the sudden gruesomeness comes from the left field every time it comes up. The show has a serious problem with tone. The visuals and dialogue is full on pastel candy colors and friendship between girls, allegedly and fun, 
and sunshine and sugar and spice and everything progressively nice. But then from time to time someone remembers that this was supposed to be for mature audiences and thus they throw in some windsworthy swears and unnecessary gore. I don't mess with that shit. This is for trapping me, you bastard! <laughs> time, help me catch this asshole! The tonal whiplash leaves this air of utter confusion every time it appears. It's really uncomfortable, in the sense I feel embarrassed on behalf of the creatives behind this clusterfuck. And I'm not a prude, far from it, in case you haven't noticed. The issue is not with the swearing or graphic violence, the problem is the mishandled tone. The general kiddy vibe of this show does not mesh with the handful of adult moments, lasting a few seconds each. This kind of handling of mature material ironically makes the product seem all the more childish. And after murdering enough baddies, the boss monster appears. But not to fear, because Rosemary harnesses all her brain power to craft this ingenious plan. Drop the creature on me. That's the plan. So this enormous rock crab creature doesn't wait a ton. It won't just smoosh Rosemary. It conveniently flips on its stomach so that Rosemary can just stab it in its squishy belly and hold it right atop her head like the world's biggest seafood skewer. This is the show. This right here. This insane drivel. At every turn, the writers insult my intelligence. I hate this show, and everyone responsible for this travesty. The Parasects still want revenge and close in on the girls. Our heroes seek shelter inside this conveniently placed crevice in the wall. And for some baffling reason, the Parasects block the hole with boulders. Weren't they trying to mince the girls just a moment prior? Why would they let them go and purposefully block the only path through which to give chase? Unless they are actually pacifists and are only concerned with protecting the specific chamber they dwell in? Are they actually smart? Did the girls just murder half the community of an intelligent life form? Fun questions to ponder. Why would a trapper be evil? The well was dry. Maybe, without magic, they mutated? What the fuck are you talking about? That is not how anything works. There is no such dumb world, not in fantasy, not in science fiction, where the lack of magic mutates anything. You absolute drooling moron. Magic mutates this cat, the lack of magic mutates these crab creatures. Which one is it? It cannot be both at the same time! I know it's a high bar at this point, but this is one of the top most retarded lines uttered in this entire show. Just stop. Stop writing. I'm talking to every single one of you. You are all clearly incapable of forming coherent thoughts. You are utterly worthless as writers. You should not be wasting your time on anything creative, since you are so absolutely unforgivably talentless and criminally stupid. To allow this nonsense escape the pen of this cringy hairspray huffer, and end up on screen to torture me. This line, this fucking line, it still hurts my brain. Not one of you stop this from happening. That makes each of you equally guilty. Whoa, that is a lot of Trevor blood on you. Great swordsing. Thanks, Parsley. I'm not going to entertain this storyline with any kind of hopeful thinking, as in, 
Oh, maybe the protagonist I hate is gonna die for real. Can't wait to find out. Rosemary lives. Of course she does. She somehow managed to get herself nicked while fighting the boss creature. It's a blink and you miss it frame, but here it is. Rosemary tries to act all brave, because I don't know why. The main hero of this show is so stupid that when she has a gushing wound in her stomach, she doesn't immediately bandage herself up, but instead walks for several miles, lets herself faint into delirium, making everything potentially more dangerous than it needs to be. The girls are already screwed, trapped inside a dangerous dungeon full of creatures that want to cut them into pieces. You need all warriors on their feet. Time is forced to carry Rosemary, because she is so unfathomably idiotic as to not get herself treated right away to mitigate the damage. And of course, none of the girls notice that Rosemary is obviously acting unlike herself, desperately holding herself to keep her guts from spilling out. And again, for the millionth time it feels like, what is this school teaching the kids? The wannabe guardians are sent into this dungeon, where monsters await ready to maul them. First aid skills, magical and traditional variety, should be top priority in preparation for such a trip. Do none of the girls have medical supplies in their bags? No bandages, no potions, no nothing? Parsley has a napkin. A napkin. Look at this. It would be hilarious if it wasn't so pathetic. If you are this incompetent, this incredibly ill-prepared, so magnificently moronic, then from a Darwinian point of view, you all deserve to die here. Sage, I'm thrilled for you to learn about elixirs. Very important for a future healer. You say that so confidently. Yep. I'm going to be so great at magic that I'll be able to wave one hand and make you whole again. Oh, what's this? That's blood, sweetie. Blood? Isn't it supposed to stay inside my body? <sighs> Rose? We have to get back! Let them expel me! I don't care! We don't even have a map. Sage is useless. The genius healer sorceress to be doesn't even try to use her omnipowerful trinket to help her friend when she's literally dying. Her first instinct is to head back, even though she knows full well the path is blocked. That's the only reason the group is where they are in the first place. Everyone in this show, apart from Xenia, is a lobotomized tool. Instead of having the characters do the obvious, the writers keep using them only in service of the next idiotic story beat. Of course there is no healing magic, Aside from the healing water inside the very dungeon the girls find themselves stuck in, we have a MacGuffin to hunt in this episode. The girls find another spring, heal Rosemary, and everything is hunky-dory once more. Good for you. I can't imagine anyone with functioning brains who could possibly be invested in this conflict. Especially considering that this episode in particular has established the possible death of youngsters as fun and quirky, Instead of serious and dramatic, no author can expect their audience to take their drama seriously if they themselves refuse to do even that. Now, let's take a different approach to the analysis for a moment. I'm going to describe the sequence between the Parasex and the Gushing Fountain, the amazing adventure the girls end up on, the challenge they need to overcome in order to save their friend, Straight up what happens on screen, no tangents, minimal snark, and then I'm going to ask one simple question. Sound good? Not that you can stop me, pre-recorded and all. Here goes. So the girls arrive at this enormous house in the middle of the cave. The furniture is huge, like it's meant for giants. Yet the fountain statue of Vinka is relatively small, like it's meant to be operated by human-sized entities. And for some reason it is positioned right in front of the fireplace. In any case, the well is dry just like the last one, and Rosemary needs to be healed, as we already know. 
Now as the girls are panicking over Rosemary's idiocy, they are met by this goblin creature. He rhymes. That's a personality I guess. The goblin offers directions to yet another healing fountain as a prize if the girls play a game with him. A riddle. Correct answer, they get to heal Rosemary. Wrong answer, the goblin eats them. And the riddle goes... If you win, you'll know the exit. If you lose, you'll be my breakfast. That was barely a rhyme, Buckles. Okay, but I'm serious. I do eat people. What am I? That's the riddle? What am I? You're, You're Buckles. Buckles! Oh, I'm sorry. You lose. <laughs> Buckles will feast tonight! <laughs> Wrong answer. So the girls are toast. No idea how this wimpy tiny creature is going to force the girls to hold their end of the bargain. But that's not important, because Rosemary figures out the right answer, delirious or not. The goblin is in fact four goblins running around the house. Riveting. The girls win. It was never established that they get to guess more than once, but that's how it works apparently. The goblins send them on their way and give them a dragon egg for good measure. Because reasons. The girls drop through a hatch, sound familiar, and end up right where the next fountain chamber lies. The massive doorway has a convenient crack from where to enter, and the girls have all the healing water they could possibly want. Now listening to that description, and seeing it unfold on screen, my question is this. Who wants to see any of that? Pitching this idea, writing this script, animating it, voice acting it, no one on the creative team thought to ask themselves, who exactly is this for? Who in their theoretical audience has ever thought to themselves, I wish there was a show where four girls end up in a cave with a giant house with tiny goblins who rhyme and ask the girls riddles in exchange for access to a healing fountain which they would not need had they not come to the cave in the first place. It may be presumptuous of me, but I have an inkling that no one has ever asked for this. No one wants this, so why is this nonsense here? This event just comes out of nowhere and disappears from memory as soon as it is over. A challenge that means nothing. Overcoming this means nothing. No one learns anything, and no one has to exemplify skills unique to them. It's useless, and it makes little to no sense in context. The dragon egg could be found literally any other way, and it would make just as much sense. The episode would flow objectively better had this scene been cut entirely. And just so no one misses the detail, the girls don't even save Rosemary, she's the one who figures out the riddle, so technically she saves herself. Time is a mule, the other girls are simply worthless, even the most basic power of friendship winning the day is not the payoff here, not in its true essence. Instead of using this time on something of substance, giving the world building any kind of through line, dispensing some lore, explaining how and why this temple cave was built in honor of this mad evil goddess, we get minutes dedicated to this bollocks. Who asked for this? Whose life is enriched after seeing this asinine scene animated and published on a major animation distribution site? Why does this exist? Money, time, effort, down the drain, for this. Everything the writers came up with was gold in their minds. Either that, or no one in the writing room was brave enough to question one another. As we all know, to tell someone that their ideas are flawed is the same as brutalizing them in public. To criticize is to harass. Words are violence. This here, this is the kind of meritless art we end up with when people stop getting scrutinized for obvious horseshit. And since this show just keeps on giving, the girls get yet another worthless challenge thrown their way. These diamond golems come to life all of a sudden, filled with piss and vinegar. You dare to plunder the sacred fountain? 
So none of the other fountains filled with identical magical water are sacred. Anyone can ransack those as much as they please. Okay, got it. Makes about as much sense as anything else in this episode. So the action sequence has all the same issues as the one from before. Lazy and lacking in vision. This kind of opponent should be a grand challenge. Two ginormous indestructible golems. This fight should turn into some Shadow of the Colossus epicness. One of the girls climbing for a weak point, while the others distract the enemy, or something like that. But instead, we use the patented High Guardian Spice logic to solve the problem. The logic being absurdity. Our weapons can't break diamonds! It's the hardest element! Only diamonds can crush diamonds! Sage, that's it! Here's what we're gonna do. You want us? Here we are! Come and get me! Do I need to explain why this is ridiculous? Do I really? I should hope that I didn't. But for the sake of completeness... Yes, diamonds are extremely sturdy. It is difficult to cut into them, other than by some specialized equipment. Nevertheless, the hardness of diamonds is actually something that is regularly overhyped in fiction. They are not some magical indestructible material. They are literally cut and polished after mining, so obviously they have certain vulnerabilities. For example, their structure makes them more prone to cutting from certain angles. And yes, diamonds themselves are used for cutting into other diamonds. The saws and other tools in this process are coated with diamonds for this specific reason. But that does not equate to slam two diamonds together and they fucking explode on the spot. That is not how any of this works. Your payoff cannot be something that you pull out of your ass. Characters are not smart just because you have them say some vaguely sciencey stuff and then miss the actual physics of it completely. This is like something a child comes up with after sustaining themselves with nothing but the power of Minecraft and energy drinks for a week straight. Got this. Wait a minute. Ugh. Guys, we have a problem. Looks like we're all going to die here after all. We've already seen two separate levitation spells, one of them activated by accident, by Sage of all people. You wanna give it a go? At least attempt to save yourself and your friends? There's nothing to lose. No? Okay then, two for two. One minute Sage is supposedly the smart one of the group, and the next moment she gets lobotomized once more. Can't have anyone acting too clever now, otherwise the conflict might resolve. And besides, the girls have a private pool of healing water all to themselves. Surely, they can just keep themselves alive with this ultra-powerful miracle remedy until help arrives. It healed Rosemary from death's door, so it must have some Fountain of Youth eternal life properties, correct? Unless the rules suddenly flip and the water works in directly opposite way, but we'll get to that in a little while. Looks like we're all going to die here after all. Yeah. The fuck was that sound? You are all supposedly going to die here, and that is your reaction. Uh, if we die, we'll become one of the weird legends that students use to scare each other. <laughs> so there's that. All we can do is wait. The rescue's not likely. But if we have to gaze into the unforgiving maw of eternity, couldn't we make it fun? Exactly how much blood did you lose, Rosemary? <laughs> Enough to know how we can make the most of the worst, and probably the last, day of our lives! I bet I know what you're thinking. Gospel or Gauntlet! Oh no. What's that? 
the best game ever. Someone asks you gospel or gauntlet. If you choose gospel, you need to answer a question truthfully. And if you choose gauntlet, you need to complete a dare. What if you do neither? Then fun dies. Ugh. Sounds like a mercy killing. Absolutely confounding tonal choices. Is this situation supposed to be funny or dramatic? I find it to be neither, so it fails either way. But still, just commit. Make a goofball comedy or make a serious survival tale, but you can't pretend to be both at the same time. Those two moods do not mix. The out of place silliness kills the stakes, and because the situation is supposedly still serious, the attempted humor also falls flat. <coughs> it's the worst of both worlds. Also, and I know this is extremely petty, but why isn't the game just called Truth or Dare? This forced fantasization of a common term is unneeded. It's different for the sake of being different, not because there's any logical in-universe reason why it would be called Gospel or Gauntlet, instead of the traditional name. The game is even described with the exact terms Truthful and Dare, so it might as well just be called that. I'll go first. Rosemary? Gauntlet, gauntlet, gauntlet! You have to... climb up there and stand on your hands. Ta-da! Is it just me, or is it strange how Rosemary's skirt exhibits gravity-defying properties so that she won't flash the audience? In a surprising turn of events, the creators aren't so degenerate as to have their 14-year-old protagonist act as deviant fan service. Only to then have her show the camera what she's got in the following shot anyway. What's the intent here? What's the vision? What are the creative team's views when it comes to this sort of thing? Is this an honest mistake? I mean the pants are there, purposefully. No one draws visible pants by accident. But is this the animation director not keeping a close eye on the process? Or different animators having a miscommunication? I'm just baffled by the inconsistent intentions of the show. Moving on. Now, I would like to introduce a writing trope here. Or rather suggest one. At least I haven't seen this one given a name yet. The trope I'm referring to is when the author creates this massive contrivance so that their characters get stuck together in some enclosed space like the cave we have here, and are forced to spend an undetermined time sitting around talking. The writer just has to have the cast speak, whether it be attempts at bonding, expo dumping a backstory, what have you. The characters are stuck, decide not to do the obvious to save themselves, spew whatever dialogue the author has devised for them, and after exhausting the RPG dialogue tree, then the characters suddenly find a way out, conveniently, right after all is said and done. The situation has the air of blatant functionality to it, the pen of the author is distractingly on show, and that's not even going into whether or not the dialogue is good or not. Oftentimes it's garbage, problems tend to pile up when it comes to slapdash writing, But that's not the point. The existence of this artificial scenario itself is the point. This crap hole of dialogue, as I've coined it. The implications of the term should be obvious. Now since we are stuck in this crap hole, what vital information does the author wish to have the audience know? What nuggets of storytelling gold justify this contrived situation? Let's put it like this. Effective dialogue is supposed to do either of two things. A. Move the story forward. Or B. Reveal something about the characters. If your dialogue doesn't accomplish either of these, you can cut it. Now this particular dialogue is all about characterization and the girls bonding as a group. And I'm being extremely generous here. That's the obvious goal of this scene. Success is another matter altogether. So what new information do we learn about the main four and their relationship as they play through for there? My turn! Sage? 
message? Uh, gospel? <laughs> Two years ago, one afternoon on a dark August Eve, Sage vanished for three hours. Afternoon and evening are different things. I was probably studying. Ha! Deceptress! No one studies two weeks before school starts. Were you kissing someone? Uh, mayhaps a young mouth breather named Cybold Double File? <gasps> I've never kissed anyone! That's how you get tuberculosis. What the hell is even that? So now we know that Sage has never kissed anyone. How illuminating. And we also get further proof that neither Rosemary nor Sage has any life apart from one another. My turn. Time. Gauntlet. Hmm. Give Rosemary a compliment. That's a dare? <sighs> Rosemary is... No! Look at Rosemary and tell her. You're loyal to your friends. There is no way for time to make that assessment. The show has given Rosemary no chance to be loyal or disloyal to anyone. This statement is empty praise, incorrect, and merely shows that the writers themselves were struggling to come up with anything positive to say about the main character of the show. Next. Okay, my turn. Parsley. Gospel. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, who's your least favorite brother? Hmm. I used to hate Thistle, but then Spurge almost drowned and Thistle saved him, and I knew I don't hate Thistle. I don't hate anyone. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops! Dropped my hammer. I should be more careful. I don't hate anyone. Ever. <laughs> I don't hate anyone. Ever. So we know Parsley is a dismissive holier-than-thou bitch, lacking any kind of self-awareness. That's not exactly new information, simply reinforcing the characterization we already got. Rose? Gospel? What's the best gift you ever got? Flowering thorn for sure. My mom was a great gift giver. Was? I thought she was just... Lavender's... missing. Yeah, sorta. Off on guardian business. She has been for four years. Uh, she went off on some mission. I figured she'd be gone for maybe a month or so. But she never came back. <laughs> I wish I'd known. I would have said goodbye louder. Oh, wow. Rosemary misses her mother. I had no idea. What an interesting revelation about the heroine that gives her such depth. Just so you know, all you would-be authors out there, when your character bursts into tears for the fifth time about the same issue, the empathy of the audience starts to wear thin, especially since she has yet to take any active steps tracking down her mummy dearest. Asking questions would be a start, but this show is allergic to logical solutions. You know how it is. Also, this is not new information to anyone. Parsley and Time act as if they learned something about Rosemary, but this information has been publicly established to the entire class in the previous episode. The fact that Lavender is missing is common knowledge. Wait, the legendary High Guardian Lavender was your mom? I thought she was no, dead. No, she's been gone for a while, but she's coming back. The fact that Snapdragon has to be corrected by Rosemary is dumbfounding. The statement itself is set up so that Rosemary can explain exactly what happened with her mom. No, she's not dead, she's just missing. That's the function behind Snapdragon's statement. But the mere fact that Snap suggested that Lavender is dead makes him seem like a complete moron. Judging by his confusion, Snap is under the assumption that dead people cannot have kids. Does he assume that when people die, their children just vanish along with them? This show really needed a dialogue editor something fierce. The narrative keeps wallowing in this plot point repeatedly, yet no one does anything about it. All of this dialogue is hollow and pointless. 
the creative team does not trust the audience to care about Rosemary and her plight unless she brings it up every chance she gets. And they are right to be worried, because there is nothing else to her character. <coughs> All of this yet again underlines the fact that the main story has no direction, and the protagonist has been given the most overused and underdeveloped backstory a fantasy adventurer can possibly have. But hey, the issue needs to be brought up yet again, so that Time can start reflecting upon her own family issues. This is the point where Time spills the beans about the rot, the fairy woods, her dad staying behind, all of that. I already went over this. The only thing gained by this revelation is that Time's anger towards her mother gets contextualized as completely unreasonable, even by emotional teenager standards. Time's character is damaged beyond repair at this point. So far, she has been the sort of cool, sort of aloof, sort of voice of reason of the group. But this backstory reveals her as yet another massive self-centered cunt with no perspective. Before, her chastising Rosemary was rather cathartic, but now it just has this hypocritical air to it. This entire scene is the storytelling equivalent of Molten Fart Sludge. The characters are awful, the dialogue is lame, the tone is all over the place, there is nothing of value here. Yet, the creator saw all of this meaningful enough to craft this entire contrived scenario just so the girls can have this conversation. Every single stupid nonsense misadventure in this episode has been in the service of this scene, so that we end up here. Now the girls are closer than ever. Such good friends. Ugh. I hate it when feelings come out of my face. It's okay. We're your friends. <laughs> this is the emotional climax of the episode, and I couldn't care less. Since I can't stand any of the characters, their happiness means nothing to me. Okay, enough chipper chapper. we got a story to get back to. Time to get the heck out of this cave. But how? The path is blocked. Well, let's watch. Careful with the dragon egg. They're fragile. They're fragile. They're fragile. They're fragile. Liar! I'm sorry, dragon egg? I thought you all knew what they... Okay, 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 this... Oh. How did no one else know what the egg was? How did Parsley know it was a dragon egg? How come no one asked what this random jagged stone is? The goblins just gave it to them on a whim. Where did they get a goddamn dragon egg in the first place? For what purpose? Just to use it as a tinderbox? What is any of this? The fountain contains the strongest magic we've ever encountered, right? And the waters can heal and propel life forward. This is our only shot. That is not how any of this works. Miracle healing, supernaturally hastened metabolism, is not the same as propelling life forward, which in this case is just a fancy way of saying aging. If you wish to put this kind of magical healing in temporal terms, it would be rewinding time backwards, if anything. The younger you are, the faster you heal. It's renewal, rejuvenating cells, a rebirth if you will. That's what is being shown on screen. This sudden invention that the water acts as an aging tonic is in direct opposition to how it works in the prior scene. Time's hand would have been granified while she collected the water, and Rosemary drank the damn poison, so her insides should have turned into dust. In any case, Sage's plan is to fast forward the dragon egg, so that the adult dragon can dig them out and fly them off on its back. And Sage just somehow knows this will work? The dragon might just as well flambe the girls and snack on the roasted nut brains. Everything else in the cave has tried to murder them so far, but this dragon most definitely won't. Sage just knows this. This episode reads like the world's shittiest game of Mad Libs. Sage carries the script in her pocket, so the plan works, obviously. Minor temper tantrum aside, the dragon does exactly what it needs to do, and the girls are off. Squad alarm, we are off! <laughs> Shh! 
shut the fuck up. Just so you know, Sage has mastered the bubble spell from episode 5 and uses it to soften the entire group's fall during the goblin trapdoor plummet. So the one character who almost falls off the dragon's back is the one character who could save themselves using magic. There is no stakes, this action is weightless, this minor tension is fake, everything just works, the writers are idiots. And before anyone wonders, no, absolutely no one comments on this afterwards. No one cares that the famous Rosemary, daughter of High Guardian Lavender, along her pals, just suddenly descended at the Academy's backyard on the back of a rotting skeleton dragon after going missing in the cave of certain death. Just another day in this asylum run by loonies. <sighs> I'm okay. <gasps> Bye, take care. <sighs> Sage, is that how stars are made, huh? Oh, yeah, for sure. What the hell was that? Story time. The first time we watched this dumpster fire, we binged the whole thing in one sitting. Four hours of suffering is a tough sell on an empty stomach, and so during episode 7, I was actually making dinner for a large portion of it. Our apartment has this open concept, so I can keep up with happenings in the living room from the kitchen. <laughs> I caught most of the stupidity, some bits and details got lost amidst the chopping and the pan sizzling, but nothing major. If anything, I assumed that many of the nonsensical sounding plot points were due to things I missed. The episode got far worse on the second viewing. Anyway, when this scene rolled around, Corpu just froze, paused the episode, and invited me to join her. Get over here! Her face was like, you gotta see this shit. So we rewound just a bit, and watched this climax of nonsense once more. And after it was over, we just sat there, dumbfounded, teetering on the edge of laughter. The sheer amount of what the fuck was that, washing over us in a single concentrated instance, was so powerful that for a while we were both convinced that we had lost our minds. There was no way that this sequence of events, this dialogue, this absolutely asinine, atrocious storytelling had actually happened. There must have been a glitch in the video file, some scene that was missing, cut dialogue, anything that could justify this nonsense. But of course, there isn't. This episode is simply that horrid. You saw it yourself, I didn't leave anything out. The girls just murdered an innocent dragon, an intelligent creature with a soul used up its life essence to escape the cave. They didn't ask, they didn't give it a choice, they just took its life. The dragon gets to live for a grand total of 1 minute and 42 seconds, yes I fucking timed it, and then it says that it's fine in a voice that does not fit that face in any way whatsoever, and then it just goes, I must go, my people need me, and fucking explodes across the night sky. The dragon is fucking dead. The girls murdered it. And that is presented as okay, or better yet, as some kind of funny wholesome moment. And then, just like every other grand, harrowing, life-altering event from this episode, it's forgotten the second that it's over. Eventually... 
we both broke down laughing. Not with the show, but rather at the show. That, and at both of us as well. For subjecting each other to this practical joke masquerading as storytelling. The episode wraps up as time heals up the rot tree at the academy's backyard. The rot has already spread to engulf the entire tree, so how come no one else has noticed it is once more a question never to be answered. Nappy Cat, what are. Do you live here now? Are you taking care of the tree? Meow. Yeah. Okay. Talking to a cat. Oh yeah, sure, that's the strangest part about this whole day. Time also refuses to seek further help concerning the rot from any of the professional hero warriors and arc mages populating the school, because the prime conflict of the show would resolve in a second. And I know I'm harping on this point, but it absolutely bears repeating, since this is the major plot of the show, what caused the rod in the first place? I don't know, but the healing water's drying up has to be connected. Is the level of magic in the earth fading? I think so. And I plan to stop it. It's the closest thing resembling a narrative red line. Every other major conflict in the show stems from it. The motivation of the villains, Fime's family drama, the disappearance of Rosemary's mother, it possibly ties into the relationship between new magic and old magic, this plotline infects everything in the show, yet it isn't given the gravitas, urgency and exploration it demands. The fading magic from the earth and the rot are asserted to be connected. If that's the case, then here's a question, does the fading magic cause the rot? Or does the rot cause the fading magic? Even this fundamental cause and effect is never stated in the show, there is nothing to grasp. Things just happen, no one does the obvious to fix things, no one asks the right questions, or discusses things to the extent they should, so that we, the audience, can fully comprehend what's going on. Think of it like this. How many stories have you seen where a character dangles above an abyss, hanging on for dear life? Why does this situation carry stakes? Why is the audience worried for the character's safety? Because everyone has a basic understanding of gravity. Falling from great height kills you. The threat is simple, it's understandable, we know what can be lost if the character fails, and we also have an understanding of the logically possible ways out of such a scenario. This is the most basic, obvious, no shit Sherlock component in creating drama. Failure. Rules create stakes, understanding the conflict creates stakes. There are no stakes if the threat in your story is incomprehensible or the characters refuse to do the obvious to fix it. As the girls walk away from this shit show, for the day that is, a villainous presence watches on from the canopy. But we'll deal with that topic in a little while. For now, let's close the book on this episode. Episode 7 is the first one to fully deliver on the promise of an action-adventure fantasy show, and in the span of mere 20 minutes, it manages to commit every scene an adventure story possibly can. The threats are not threatening, the action is flaccid, the plot armor is thick, everything that happens is nonsense. There is no possibility that the girls could ever fail, the show has made that abundantly clear, Rosemary should have bled to death several times over, but no, she's fine, artificial drama is artificial, and of course, the heroes win at the end, that's a given in most stories, but the thing that separates an actual story from random scriplings is the writer's skill to make the audience believe for a fleeting moment that the ridiculous stuff they are watching is real, and the characters are living actual lives on the other side of the screen, and the things they do matter. There is some kind of conflict, and it needs to be resolved. We, the audience, care about the characters, 
and we wish to see them succeed, but there is a chance that they might not. That's investment. This is the bare minimum any conflict should accomplish. The writer's priority should be to cultivate investment. Otherwise, you might as well skip the action, skip the entire story, and just declare the heroes win. Also helps if you create heroes who are not completely deplorable. Radical advice, I know, but take my word for it. Way back at the start of this journey, I began by discussing how abysmal the main heroine's introduction was. Right out of the gate, Rosemary is a loud, obnoxious, self-interested jabbermouth, forcing out the craptastic dialogue as fast as her tongue can twist. That's the first part. And then we have the alleged clumsiness, which applies on an on-off whenever it suits the plot basis. The protagonist is thoroughly unappealing, and part of her characterization is an outright falsehood. A perfect introduction to the rest of the show. Welcome to pain. I would assert that the first time a character struts to the stage is among the most important points of any story to get right. Characters are the window through which the audience views the fictional world, so from an author's point of view, this is the one element in your story you absolutely want your audience to be attached to. Characters are your babies, you created them, you want your audience to like them, you want to show them in a flattering light. A good introduction establishes key traits, personality, who they are and what they do, what are their passions, their troubles, or at the very least hints at these. You have plenty of time to deepen the characterization later on, but optimally, from the very beginning, there should be something fundamentally recognizable, something immediately appealing about the character, something that makes this particular character them. Character appeal can make or break the audience's entire investment in the story. You get only one chance for first impressions, so you better make it count. Always lead with strong material. A generally favorable direct method to grab the audience is to make the character themselves entertaining. They are charming, they are witty, they are fun to watch. Their interactions with the world and other characters are enjoyable, intrinsically, even disregarding the plot. Another obvious path towards character appeal is to burden them with some kind of relatable problem. Love, family, money troubles, a debilitating illness, a grave loss, grand dreams, stuff like that. Fundamentally human struggles. Humans are empathetic creatures. If we see someone in trouble, our first instinct is to wish them all the best. It's a quick and dirty way to garner investment from the audience. This show tries both of these methods, and as I have pointed out many, many, many times, it fails constantly and utterly. See, in order to create witty and funny characters, the author has to actually be witty and funny, Shocking, I know, and as for the troubles the characters face, all of them are nonsensical artificial drama that would resolve in an instant if only the characters actually did something about it. Never offer sympathy for stupidity. People like this don't deserve it. Now all of this character appeal stuff applies to the main character, obviously. They are the driving force of the story, but it also holds true to side characters as well as villains. In fact, many times the villain side of this equation can be even more important. After all, common wisdom states that the hero is only as impressive as the villain they face. Crafting a compelling antagonist, in terms of presence, motivation and palpable threat, is a key part in any fantasy adventure. Yes, we are finally at that point where the main plot of the show decides to start moving once more. Not exactly forward, more like wiggling in place. But in any case, the villains emerge from the shadows, ready to cause trouble. Leading the charge is Olive, minion of the bad guy faction, the elusive triumvirate, 
and the prime antagonist of the show. So, keeping in mind all that I mused a moment ago, let's see about that introduction. Yes, Tell them that the elf girl and her minions are closing in on the secrets of witch country. One moment. The triumvirate says that you must vanish the elf girl and the others. Vanish? As in... Yes. Kill them! I don't feel comfortable escalating things to that level with anyone. Oh, it's them or you. Choose. Okay, as far as introductions go, this isn't all too bad. It's woefully bland, but at least we got something in terms of characterization. Olive isn't fully on board the villainous agenda. She has reservations about outright murdering her enemies. That being the case, the reason why she is part of the villain faction in the first place is an immediate question. One that demands a compelling answer in order to complete the character. The rot is a potential threat to the entire world. People will perish because of it. The villains wish to keep this under wraps. That's the secret of which country, I assume. Why? Nobody knows. But the fact is that people are going to die anyway if the villains succeed in whatever it is they are doing. So why is Olive so against getting her own hands dirty? Is she forced to do this? Do the villains hold some power over her? A spell? A loved one as a hostage? Anything of the sort? Never explained. Okay, fine. She's evil just because. Lame and lazy. The usual cracks are already beginning to show. That aside for a wee moment. This is how episode 7 closes. And this is how episode 8 opens. These two scenes are delivered back to back. Olive, I hope you've summoned me with deadly results. Calm down, Smokeface. I have news for the Triumvirate. The girls have told no one. I don't think we need to kill them. They're not worth our time. Oh, Olive. We knew you'd balk, so let's make this simple. First, smash the elf girl's bottle of healing water. Next, corner the girls at the autumn processional. Turn them into stone. With this spell, you only get one shot. So, make sure they're all cornered together. And then, shatter them. them. Be quick. Be merciless. To die. 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 Dead. I don't want to kill them. I mean, I can. If I have to. Right, Kino? Don't be stupid, Olive. Unless you return to witch country with four handfuls of guardian gravel, the triumvirate will finish you off without blinking. Ta-da! Dead. <laughs> it's the exact same fucking scene. The same conversation, now with the added benefit of Willow Wisp over here spoon-feeding Olive what to do, and giving her a magical WMD, so that there's no way she can fuck this up. One of these scenes is superfluous, and should have been cut. Combine this entire convo to a single scene, even when the main plot is finally at center stage, the pacing is still horrendous. But at least Olive's characterization is consistent, right? Right? WRONG! Okay, okay, I'll do it. But first, I'll do what I do best. Sow some discord. Might as well make it fun. So Olive doesn't want to kill anyone, but is okay with everyone ending up dead anyway at some point in the future. And she also takes glee from tormenting her enemies. Okay, enough of this. Olive is a horrendous character. Her motivations are at once non-existent and somehow still contradictory. She has no charisma, no threatening presence, barely any personality. 
she is supposedly a trickster type, morphing her villainous job into entertainment, turning the heroes against each other, and cackling as they scramble around helplessly, except we never see any of that. She taunts the girls in their eventual encounter, but that's it. Basic villain banter. Very basic. Sage, new magic comes naturally to me. Unlike you. There's no sowing discord. Coincidentally, Sage and Rosemary are pissed at one another at the moment Olive makes her move, but that has nothing to do with her. The two are just mad because reasons I'll go over in a while. Once again, what little characterization is offered is a bold-faced lie. You can't just say a character is a thing, you have to show them being that thing consistently. And just like everyone else in the show, she suffers from chronic plot-induced stupidity. Even when guaranteed victory is literally handed to her, she still manages to fail. Her ingenious plan to keep her paws clean is to deliver the girls to the main villains so that they can kill them instead. Which defeats the whole purpose, but fuck it. So she invites the girls to just come with her. Which is utterly retarded. Why would they ever follow her willingly? Especially since she declares herself and her masters as villains. How about being an actual trickster and lying to them? Tell the girls, oh, I know these people who can help with the rot, you should totally come with me. The girls are absolutely stupid enough to buy it. Boom, instant victory, minimal work, took me two seconds to come up with. So Olive's plan B is to use the ultra OP spell, which turns everyone in the city to stone, except Sage manages to shield the others from the spell, because there apparently are anti-magic measures in this world, would be really useful as a security system for the school at a later point. For instance, imagine a barrier that automatically dissolves magical disguises, but I digress. The heroes managed to thwart the danger only because they saw it coming. Had Olive only done her casting in secret, she would have won. She is an utter moron. And then, instead of holding the city hostage unless the girls comply, I mean actually doing it, not just saying it, crush a few citizens to drive home the point, instead of being an actual villain, she lurks at some random alley, challenges Rosemary to a fight, and gets her stupid Neko Ninja ass handed to her by this first year bubblegum brain warrior wannabe. First encounter between the hero and the villain, and the villain loses. How can anyone contain their excitement amidst this high stakes frail ride? I have no idea. You know Darth Vader, the guy in the dark mask, glowy stick, kinda cool voice, the most famous villain in all existence. You know what made him popular? Well, I can tell you that it wasn't because Luke beat him during their first encounter. This would have been a perfect opportunity to do a classic arc of fledgling hero gets beaten by the villain, has to train, and fares better on the second time around. Just have Rosemary survive the battle by the skin of her teeth, her friends come to rescue her, and then they all defeat the villain together. Motivated by her defeat, Rosemary trains like crazy, and the next time they meet, she can stand toe to toe with Olive, Classic storytelling, for fuck's sake, the whole rival trope in media exists because it is generally a good idea to have someone around who is harder, better, faster, stronger than the main hero. The rival character acts as a tangible organic measurement of the hero's growth. It's clean and simple dramatic storytelling practically gift wrapped for anyone to take advantage of. A world of obvious examples all around us. And still people refuse to follow what works. And after getting thoroughly beaten and humiliated, Olive's spell gets reversed. No consequences, nothing is lost, nothing is gained. The villains had a certain victory within their grasp. And they failed, 
because their minion is an idiot. You blew it! You had it all and you blew it! And instead of doing the obvious, getting rid of the useless pawn and sending another minion to use the exact same spell again, the evil masterminds decide that one incompetent nincompoop isn't enough, so they pair Olive up with this walking piece of moldy ham sandwich. Mandrake is a joke. The lamest, oh look at me, I'm so evil, <laughs> caricature of a human being you can imagine. What a cute little kitty. Can I break its neck? But this is about Olive. The sole reason for Mandrake's emergence is so that Olive can act all, oh my goodness, you are murdering people, that's evil. How could you do something like that? Even though she herself is purposefully serving a trio of dipshits whose sole goal at this point in time is to murder people. What do you think is gonna happen if the villains win? You catnip sniffing absolute piece of shit. Characters like this are frustrating beyond comprehension. Olive is openly a villain furthering the Triumvirate's plans, acting as their spy at the academy, but she also has this holier-than-thou attitude when it comes to actually villainous acts. That's not conflict, that's not complexity, that's just hypocrisy plain and simple. Olive is no better than Mandrake, She's just too much of a wimp to do anything about the bully, so instead she decides to be a bully as well. That's the crux of Olive's character, she is a pathetic coward. But of course, the end goal of this entire contrived villain but not really routine is so that Olive can be redeemed. At the very end, she ends up turning on her former masters, foiling Mandrake's plans, and helps the girls to save the day. There are no consequences for this betrayal, so it begs the question, how come Olive didn't turn good ages ago? This is a mockery to the entire concept of character arc. Nothing about this follows any kind of cause and effect. Nothing about Olive's experiences has changed the way she views her situation, her place in the world, or the concept of right and wrong. This is hollow. We never should have given you that tuna. Mm. Yeah. Oh, but Fime gave her tuna. That changes everything. Actually, let's compile all the times anyone has interacted with Olive prior to her emergence as the villain, back when she was still lurking around as a common house cat. Runes are read to predict future probabilities. They must be interpreted based on context. That's the wrong one. What? Your copy of runic lore and its implementations. That's the old edition. Here, use this one. Uh, we've tried everything. Pliers, a spatula, a shovel. Tridents, spells. The squirrely kid down the hall who picks locks. Intimidation tactics, hostage negotiation. Charms. Tickling. <laughs> Chumpy, down, girl. Parsley, you've got to get your cats under control. I thought they were your cats. Rosemary, have you seen my boar bristle brush? I've been using it to brush those two cats. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. Their coats have been looking fantastic. <laughs> you want to be next, cat? <laughs> there is nothing meaningful here. If the show had bothered to actually show the girl spending any decent time with Olive, Playing with her, pampering her, maybe have a mini-adventure where the girls save Olive from a rampaging beast? Anything like that, then Olive's eventual conflict of allegiance would carry some weight. It wouldn't change all the rampant idiocy, or make up for the fact that Olive has no reason to be villainous in the first place. 
but it would at least establish a reason why she turns in the end. As it stands, Olive is one of the most disastrous villains I have ever had the displeasure of witnessing. She's not intelligent, she's a pathetic fighter, most of her magical prowess is borrowed. As an antagonist, there is absolutely nothing threatening nor compelling about her. Her characterization is a mess. She likes to be sneaky and subversive to defeat her enemies. Except not really. She's a conflicted anti-villain. Except she has no reason to be evil or good. She's basically Team Rocket without the humorous irony. And the reason why Olive ends up so incompetent is clear. She cannot succeed in anything villainous. She can't severely hurt anyone. She absolutely cannot kill anyone. Because writing a redemption arc for an actual heinous person is an incredibly tough thing to do. It requires nuance, skill, effort, none of which the writers possess. They just want the payoff without putting in any of the work. Common mentality in modern writing. But she's based on the creator's cat, so that excuses everything. Can't have my fussy washy friend being a meanie now, can we? Then don't make your cat the villain, you miserable insipid twat! So, aside from first blood being drawn between incompetent villains and so-called heroes, what else does the show offer us as we attend the Festival of the Fall, parts 1 and 2? As the name would suggest, it's a time of celebration in Lingarf. This citywide jamboree is held in honor of... To celebrate... Um... Autumn time? It's Halloween, basically. Jack-o'-lanterns, everyone dressed in silly outfits, spooky attractions. Even the diegetic music has this obvious ghoulish flair to it. It's just Halloween by a different name. This here is the most obvious, immediate example of a certain amateurish world building trope, one that I've left alone so far. The all encompassing term is anachronism, which in essence refers to a juxtaposition between the time period and any specific element within that does not belong there. For example, if you were to write a story set in Victorian London, and you had a character suddenly whip out a cell phone, that would be considered a anachronistic element. Mind you, we are obviously assuming that the story in question is a realistic historic tale, and not some kind of alternate history fantasy whatever punk story. Now the emergence of anachronistic elements is not immediately a failing in the story, if it's used purposefully, a surrealistic comedy, for example, could make great use of mixing and matching all kinds of contrasting characters and situations to accentuate whatever joke they are going for. The problem with High Guardian Spice implementing clear modern day elements in its narrative is that the world itself is modeled after classic high fantasy conventions, rural architecture, low industrialization, ropes and wizard hats, stuff like that. That's the basic aesthetic. It has nothing to do with our modern day culture, so then, when the show all of a sudden introduces story elements and world building poached from our modern day society, and just dumps them in without rhyme or reason, it leaves the world as an incoherent mess. There is no purpose behind anything, no history, no culture in the world, the writers just wanna have a Halloween episode, so this world suddenly celebrates Halloween now. It feels artificial and forced, and frankly childish. Other examples of anachronism in this show include stuff like clothing and the way people talk. The fashion of this universe has no through line, absolutely zero thought is given to functionality or cohesiveness. Everyone just wears whatever the hell the character designer gave them. Time has a green tunic a la Legend of Zelda. Rosemary wears her trademark frilly pink dress everywhere, even in dangerous dungeon trips. Anise has this basic bitch too cool for school punk street look. 
And it's not like these are the clothes of certain cultures. It's not consistent. No one else dresses like Anise. No one else dresses like Rosemary. The NPCs in the streets have basic feudalistic peasant clothes. But then at the ending credits of the series, we have a totally awesome shopping trip where the girls try on far more modern, fashionable clothing. Is the reigning fashion in Lingar this? Or is it this? It can't be both at the same time. But the creators think this is cute or whatever, so now it just exists in the show. The fact that the Academy has anime-inspired school uniforms is a joke in and of itself. Though to be fair, I'm extending this particular criticism to every single light novel battle school crap fest as well. Just because your assumed audience gets their rocks off watching cute girls in short skirts is no reason to make your world building fundamentally nonsensical. It's a ye old fantasy world, the students are training to be warriors. Why are they dressed in stuffy school uniforms? Especially since the purpose of these outfits is to level the herd, to uniform everyone, literally. But the academy just lets everyone wear whatever they goddamn please on official quests, instead of some kind of specialized guardian armor. Everyone is allowed to express their individuality, so why are there uniforms in the classroom? It makes no sense. The only reason to have them is literally because anime. And that is a horrid reason to write anything. Now the single worst character sticking out like a sore thumb after too much clip diddling is Anise. Aside from the way she dresses, her speech pattern is also bewildering. She talks like a wine aunt trying to sound like a 15 year old. Or at least what she thinks 15 year olds talk like. In our world. In the 90s. I feel... Odd. What's wrong, Tiger? Sweetheart, we're so sorry. Yeah, dude. We didn't want to freak you out. We just wanted to help you with this huge, crazy shift. Your mom went through a phase where she really dug new magic. I looked up to her because of it. She was a badass. After a few years, she stopped using it and went back to her roots. <laughs> but she pretends that she never deviated, even a little. And that's not fair to you. <sighs> I know, right? Hey, hey, hey! Hey, hey, hey! <laughs> it's fun! Anise! No one else acts like this. The dialogue is all around awful, so this is not anything special. Just another specific way the show fucks up everything and anything humanly possible. Further mismatched elements include things such as technology. There are steam powered locomotives. There are apparently cameras, though we never actually see one in action. There are no telephones. Nor is there any kind of easily accessible spell equivalent of that. As we learn in a later episode. Okay, so we have an approximate idea of the technological advancement in this universe. There's plenty of room to poke and prod at this already. Especially considering the amazing feats magic can accomplish. The world should look a whole lot different. But let's leave it at that, lest I lose the rest of my waning sanity. Instead, let's take a look at this enormous fuck you to world building. This fantasy world with magic and dragons, and cobblestone streets, and crank-operated gondolas motorized with troll power, and absolutely no computers, suddenly has VR technology, used exclusively to play a shitty children's tower defense game. Ignore all the obvious extremely useful possibilities, training the guardians for serious missions in a realistic yet safe environment comes to mind. Nope. Children's games? Of course! So the logic and mechanics of this crap are utterly broken. The glasses are not hooked into any kind of device. They activate just by slapping them on your face. They somehow scan your entire body and attire to create this chipified version of you wearing the exact clothes currently on you. It scans your body through your eyes. And to play the game, you have to physically move around, walk, 
run, roam throughout the city, except the times that you don't. The show can't even keep this consistent. How the fuck is anyone supposed to play this game amidst the bustling festival? Anyone dumb enough to take part in this farce would constantly bump into people, most likely stumble into some alley, probably get kidnapped and end up on some slave ship heading for the Triumphrit's private Epstein Island. Fuck this is dumb. The game itself is a basic defense mission against this giant monster bunny. Stop it before it destroys your home base. For some reason modeled after the Guardian Academy. Simple enough. There's also a secondary objective of freeing citizens from ice. For no directly apparent reason. Points maybe? So Amaryllis and Snapdragon managed to fail at this children's game. Repeatedly, to the point of frustration. At the end, Parsley is kind enough to share the secret pro-gamer strats with the struggling duo. This game is all about teamwork. But we were... They... Were working together. <sighs> What's the secret? Two winning choices. One, work together to defrost all of the students and they'll join you in beating the monster and saving the school. Two, share the fireballs and defeat the monster with a double attack before she freezes anyone. Huh, complex for a kid's game. This is absolutely horrid game design. The whole point of class-based games is that everyone has their own role, people are different, everyone likes contributing in different ways, some like offense, some enjoy support roles. The brilliance of team mechanics is that everyone has their own part to play and everyone has to trust each other to pull their weight. When all the pieces fall into place and the team works like a well-oiled machine, that is satisfying. Forcing everyone to adopt a single role beats the whole purpose of different classes existing. The message here tries to be some after-school special shite about teamwork and sharing. But that message would already be readily implemented if the show just followed the principles widely present in most video games. I just hope that the person responsible for this backwards ass idiocy never finds a place in the gaming industry. Introducing lame Spice Legends! The fastest growing, most popular gacha shitfest this side of the Pacific. Looking for a generic fantasy world? You got it! Battles that are equal parts luck and skills pulled out of the writer's collective ass? It's fantastic! Play with characters ranging from no personality at all to absolute cunts! All of them shamelessly stolen from other properties with no cohesion whatsoever! Play it, consume it, love it! And if you don't like it, well we'll just call you a racist, sexist, pineapple on pizza phobe and never improve because fuck you! Watch it! But how do Amaryllis and Snap end up playing this children's game in the first place? Well, to answer that, we first need to talk about this meritless shit stain. Callum is introduced in episode 5, bullying Parnell, off screen, and is generally painted as obnoxious troglodyte. Why were you crying? You know, Cal? Uh, big, terrible hair, smells like onions. He's my cousin. He can be mean. I'm sorry, Parnell. He's a real jerk. This episode acts as his proper debut. He already faces an uphill battle as far as the audience opinion is concerned. But that's a silly concern, for he obviously isn't meant to be an actual character, but rather a straw man punching back. Out of my way, lizard. I'm a dragon. Mm. No, lizard, dumb lizard. Who even are you? I'm Cal. You're even cuter at second glance. Bar! You step away from the bird. <laughs> Out of the way, eh, lizard, eh, eh, dumb lizard, eh. Who talks like that? He's written like a literal caveman. This is just embarrassing. I can't imagine how anyone could lower themselves to act out this dialogue. I for one would refuse to recite this trite. Ad-lib something. Anything would be better than this. Have some fucking respect for yourself. Also, Cal apparently doesn't have the spatial awareness or motor skills to walk around Rosemary, and his attention jumps from annoyance to horniness back to annoyance in the span of two seconds. 
this depiction is not even at parody level anymore, because even satire of the traditional meathead types usually includes a thing called jokes. So why don't you make like a tree and get out of here? Anyway, later on Cal's single-minded horniness leads him to fall for the trap that is Snapdragon for the evening, and he has this ridiculous meltdown. Hey girl, you're really tipping the scales of sexy. I hope you're single. We'd be fantastic together. Uh, Cal? Wait, Snapdragon? You, dude, why are you dressed like a girl? I... That's... This is messed up. You're messed up. Funeral director, huh, Cal? <laughs> you better get out of here before the funeral becomes your own. I'm, I'm obviously dressed as a groom. Who'd want to marry that? These things happen. Most everyone makes themselves seem silly at one point or the other. There's no reason to be untactful. Just back away, laugh at yourself, and move on. Nothing is gained by making the situation into a bigger deal than it is. This applies to any and all kind of awkward situation. Best to just let it go. And I would hazard to guess that most people know better than to start foaming at the mouth if faced with this particular setup. But no, Cal is horrid in all the ways, so he just has to rave and rant and be the biggest ass a guy can possibly be. And this makes Snap the big sad, because he secretly wishes that everyone would be okay with him acting the part of a girl. Time to turtle up and play some video games. And here lies this show's biggest world building mistake. I'm serious. This is the topic the show's creators care about above all else. Snapdragon's identity crisis and diversity and acceptance as a whole. They wish to tell a story about the struggles of being a trans person, discovering oneself, the prejudice of people, all that stuff. And the show fails to back up any of the alleged drama. Snap is supposedly so insecure about himself and unable to be who he feels on the inside. Except he really shouldn't be. This entire world is remarkably accommodating. Everyone accepts everyone. There's no overt racism, sexism, any of the like, and the few people who showcase any kind of bigotry are universally condemned by the good characters. Caraway is comfortable casually revealing her past to Rosemary, and her reaction is lukewarm to say the least. This world at large clearly has no problem with the alphabet community. The lesbians are allowed to be out in the open without anyone hassling them, no one aside from Cal bats an eye at Snap's costume, his best friend, the known rich bitch and a bully, is 100% supportive of Snap every step of the way. I... I shouldn't have worn this. Snap, you're a fabulous mermaid goddess challenger and, and, and you're great. And who cares what Cal says? His costume is a suit. Let's go smash shit till you feel better. Snap, are you still upset about the whole cow thing? Rill, keep your voice down. <sighs> Lingars, lil guards? This game's for like newborns. Nobody's gonna come over here. But if it'll make you feel better. What are you doing? Making sure nobody and nothing can hear or touch us. Now talk! Take down the spell. Not until you tell me what's wrong! I don't want to! Let's just play the game. Ugh. Fine, but I'm keeping the spell up so I can curse freely. Same goes with Snap's soon-to-be girlfriend. Sage is absolutely filled with butterflies at the sight of Snap in her feminine glory. Snapdragon? Hey, Sage. It was Amaryllis' idea. You just look so pretty right now, okay, bye! The mere idea of him being a lady makes Sage scream. <laughs> Snapdragon should consider himself the luckiest person in the kingdom to have found the one girl in the entire academy as his first girlfriend 
who just so happens to be by and is prepared to stand by him come what may. Who am I kidding? Everyone in this show is gay or bi, or whatever the story demands for them to be at the moment. We wouldn't want anyone's decisions to have any kind of serious consequences now, would we? Everyone who actually matters in this universe loves Snapdragon unconditionally. Kal is the dumbest variety of ass there is, but that's the reality of life. Dumbasses will always exist. None of us can change that. Other than this outlier case, and the literal supervillains, this world is almost a utopia. Dozens of races, different types of people, all living in peace and harmony. There is no conflict, Snap's struggle is the same as if the show claimed that Parsley struggles with racism against dwarves, even though literally no one is racist against dwarves. And to underline this as fiercely as I can, because people tend to be hilariously deranged, depressingly unintelligent, unable to understand the meaning of words spoken in plain English. My criticism isn't, oh how dare you put trans people in your show. That has never been my criticism, that will never be my criticism. My problem is the fact that the show's narrative and world building are diametrically opposed. This is THE issue on the creators' minds, and they can't be arsed to put in any effort. The drama does not work, it is artificial, it is hollow. It is created because this is the author's distorted view of our world. In their mind, everyone is against them, even though they are living during the most tolerant age in human existence when it comes to their lifestyles. We live in an age where misgendering someone can earn you a prison sentence, and this same kind of tolerance from our world is mirrored in Lingarth. The fact that there is a commemorative picture prominently placed upon the Academy's wall, which reveals Caraway's past, should be a clear indication that these issues are not new, they are not special, they are normalized in this world. And yet, this identity crisis is still made up to be some kind of Herculean hurdle to cross. One jackass says mean things, and Snap is broken. This single utterly worthless creature makes fun of him, and it's as if the whole world is ending. Snap is weak in spirit. He should not be training to be a guardian. Someone who is supposed to help the helpless cannot be this brittle. I said this about Sage back in episode 5, and it's the same thing here. This kind of victim mentality should be beaten out of each and every single one of the students on their first day. Snap should work through his woes in peace before handling any kind of weapon with the pretense of protecting others from harm. Someone with so much mental burden is going to be a liability and end up hurting themselves. Or someone else. He is a stupid kid and all the teachers are criminally irresponsible. The show itself doesn't give these issues the proper gravitas, nor do they examine it from any other angle than filling their quota for representation. Also, all traditional hetero men are bigger than cavemen herder. They simply focus on the misery porn, painting their meek opposition as utter demons, rather than offering anything of actual value, a realistic story of true adversity, self-reflection and growth. This is the show's unapologetic, anachronistic agenda. And before any of you say anything about Snapdragon's background and family life, we'll get to that in due time. Oh, don't you worry. Not that Snapdragon is the only one dealing with overblown yet under season dramatic turmoil. What is it? Nothing. In case your reaction is teetering somewhere around, huh? What? How? Why? 
allow me to confirm that what you just saw was 100% correct. Time just had a PTSD episode from seeing some rando old guy dressed as a tree. She got triggered by a guy dressed as a tree. Who wrote this? Which one of you was it? Who's the Muppet who thought this was acceptable? And which of you were the ones who didn't stop this from happening? Your understanding of trauma is so laughable, I don't think there exists an adjective insulting enough to describe the absolute brain farting. I wish to remind everyone that people actually got paid for this. Also, though I said there's no racism in this world, this whole thing is clear anti-end bigotry. They are proud and magnificent creatures, and they deserve the same rights and respect as everyone else. Just because they occasionally stomp on people, doesn't mean you have to get all jumpy around them. That's just rude. Also, also, while we are on the subject of costumes, what is the context of angels in this world? Are they a religious symbol? Or do they exist as a common race like all the rest? As a counterpart for the demon kin? And if that's the case, wouldn't this count as cultural appropriation? Also, 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 we later learn that mermaids do actually exist in this world. So that would make Snap's costume the fantasy equivalent of blackface, right? I'm just trying to understand the rules here. The writers are the ones advocating for all-inclusive let's not hurt anyone's fee-fees anti-bigotry ultra-mindfulness. A bunch of ideologues tripping on their own rules. Go figure. Also, 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 the less said about Parsley's cross-species cosplay the better. Lots of weird implications there. No, 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 it's good. It's good. I just want to be as close to you as possible. I just want to burrow into you like a love tick. I want us to be one person, two hearts inside one skin. <gasps> That's it. I'm going to cut off your skin and drape it all over my body. Anyway, time is feeling guilty for lollygagging and partying with the idiot brigade when there's woodlands to be saved. So, she decides to hit the road and return home with healing water in tow. Kinda makes one question how come she didn't depart earlier? Saving her home is her sole motivation to attend the academy. And she has had the healing water for a while now. However long it has been between the cave trip and the festival. So why has she been procrastinating this long? And for some reason, Despite vocally protesting her costume, I feel like damp roadkill. She doesn't change into her normal attire before heading off. In any case, before she can depart proper, time is stopped by the emergence of a familiar face. It's the return of the mutant Garfield. Oh my god! And in case you are wondering just how the hell Neppy is back with his grotesque buffness, the short and simple answer is. The writers are lazy morons. The slightly longer answer is... Neppy knows exactly which ingredients to use, the specific ingredients are just sitting there, ready to be knocked over, and the pot is apparently filled with liquid day and night? At this point, why even bother showing the process if you are so insistent in your refusal to have any of this make sense? Neppy warns time about Olive, he spied on the villains having their staff meeting, on the subject of let's kill everyone. The utterly incompetent baddies didn't notice the obvious orange cat gawking at them. Olive knows Neppy has been stalking the rot tree. She knows Neppy has a vested interest in purifying the rot. Has she not informed her superiors about these developments? Smokeface is right there, looking directly in the direction of Neppy. 
He should command Olive to snuff the kitty. Better not have any loose ends. But if anyone used their brains, then the plot wouldn't happen. So let's work with what we have. Nice costume. You had a bit too much milk there, fella. I know very few actual words. The kissing booth is that way if you're looking for girls or guys or cats. Look, I don't judge. Stop it. Get some help. Did you see the elf one? <laughs> I must tell the elf. <laughs> hey, Parnell, I think this lunatic overdid it on, on Aloe's special cookies. Why does this 14, 15, whatever teen year old know about Aloe's special cookies? At what context would this kid and this grown ass woman ever discuss special cookies? Does Aloe pedal drugs to minors? Because that would actually make too much sense for it not to be the case. Feel free to take extra cookies. Whoa! <laughs> Nappy Cat? How did... Why are you here? The Cat Girl talked to a face of smoke! A Cat Girl? Nappy, how many of you are there? She is not a Nappy. She is... Girl! But cat also. Well, that narrows it down. Cacophony. This is a word I know. So Nepi knows the word cacophony, but he can't come up with black dress and a collar to describe Olive. Whatever, I know, dialogue is hard. Let's just try to get through this. You guys, Neppy Cat is here. He came to warn us that some cat girl is after us because we know too much. Neppy Cat told you all this? And you believe him? Neppy knew about the healing waters. We need to find the cat girl before she finds us. Listen, I trust you. All of you. I know I've been, like, off. But I need you to trust me back, okay? Well, isn't that heartfelt and humble and honest and all that good stuff? Time is really warming up to the rest of the gang, isn't she? Friendship is magic. Keep this scene in mind. I'm not done with it yet. So the girls gather up, poised to find Olive, before she finds them. Which is the most idiotic thing they could possibly do, because you know, that beats the entire fucking point. The villain is after us. Let's present ourselves to them. Did nobody honestly bother to think for a single solitary second what they were actually writing? Tell the teachers, this celebration is swarming with powerful veteran guardians. Inform the authorities that there is a terrorist running around with the stated goal of murdering children. Everyone at this festival is in danger. These four heroes are sickeningly irresponsible. So the unstoppable imbeciles meet the immovable dumb fuck. Olive has the force, and yet she somehow manages to lose in the end. Give it back! It's mine now. Anyway, enough chit chat. Please. It's the only hope I have to save my home. I don't care. Now, how about you all come with me, willingly? I'll introduce you to the Triumvirate. We'll eat some cake, have a chat, and when we're done, I'll give you back the vial. We're not going anywhere with you! No? No use clinging to false hope, then. No! No, 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 no! no, no. Time, honey, you know what this is? It's an unguarded pool of healing water. And what's this? Well, it's a hole in the mountainside, leading directly to the pool. And who's that next to you? Why, that's Sage, your classmate and confidant. And what's that Sage is holding? That is a Terrasphere, a magical device that allows their wielder to perform a variety of miraculous acts. 
For example, they could fly you down the hole so that you can collect more healing water and then fly you back out safe and sound. Quit your melodramatic whining! You are crying over spilled milk! Just stop by the convenience store on the way back home, it takes a whopping minute! Think time, think! But no, after the day is eventually saved, time simply decides to sulk some more. No reason to go back home now, now that she no longer has the miracle remedy. Which means that once again, this subplot with the healing water was completely pointless. You could remove this element from the show, the entire cave spelunking misadventure, time planning to leave, the entire concept of healing water, and nothing about the main story would change. Even if we played along and accepted the show's narrative that all the healing water in the world is suddenly gone down the drain, it wouldn't change this plotline's place in the story. It's a red herring, a narrative deception by the authors. It's included so that the story seems more complex than it actually is. Time has to have something to motivate her, and this is the method the authors chose. Nothing is gained by the inclusion of this MacGuffin, bar the lame waterworks from time. It's pathetic artificial drama. A proper script does not have these kinds of narrative dead ends. Even in situations where the characters fail in their goals, whatever those may be, the aftermath of that failure should always tie into the next story beat in some way, so that the audience doesn't feel like the author is wasting their time. To be fair, the show tries to pull off something of the like in the following episode. We'll get to it. Suffice to say that the event itself is so unfathomably dumb, and ends up circling back to nothing, that it only feels like further waste of time. Point is, don't write plot lines that lead nowhere. Every story element should yield information vital to the main narrative, bolster the world building, or at the very least offer some character development. A fantastic example of this can be found during the first half of Fullmetal Alchemist. The Elric brothers are researching advanced alchemy in order to find out how to create a Philosopher's Stone so that they can fix their bodies and get their old lives back. They get their hands on these incredibly cryptic notes left behind by this one enigmatic master of alchemy. They toil day and night for weeks on end trying to decipher the secrets, and when they eventually crack the code and find the answer, they are slapped in the face with a horrifying truth. Without going into it too deep, they have essentially hit a dead end, they had their hopes set upon these files, and they yielded unsavory answers. The brothers failed, to put it plainly, they are back to square one, and yet, this research directly leads into further truths down the line, story developments, it links to certain central characters, and lays the basis for some of the most important ethics of this saga. The failure, in this case, feels like an organic part of the story, a single step forward in a larger journey, and a part of an intricate, beautifully weaved tapestry. It's neat. It's nice. It's a good story. You should read it. My name's Olive. I'd love to chat. Parsley, sage, rosemary, thyme. Donkey! So the climax of episode 8 is an absolute clusterfuck. It is a microcosm of close to everything that's wrong with the show. Laughable dramatic dialogue, embarrassingly humorless comedic dialogue, logic thrown out the window, tone-deaf directing, continuity errors. I've already circled back a few times, so let's just get this over with and finish up shitting on it. Now this show has its fair share of animation errors. It's silly, it's distracting. What the fuck is this? But ultimately, they don't affect the plot. Except here. Here we have Sage sneakily going for her Terrasphere. Olive uses Expelliarmus and swats the trinket away. Okay, so far so good. Sage is defenseless. 
Except in the next shot, the Terra Sphere is back. Right there, dangling on Sage's neck. The drama, the tension, the ticking clock of this scene hinges on the location of the Terra Sphere. Sage has to get her magic back in time, otherwise the girls are screwed. This is the big dramatic climax, arguably the grandest moment in the entire show, considering how it's presented. It ends on a cliffhanger after all. This is supposed to be important. And yet, the director and animators can't be bothered to make sure that the location of the Terra Sphere remains consistent. As this scene currently stands, the order of events must be that Sage fetched her Terra Sphere off screen, consoled time, and then threw the trinket back under the table off screen once again. It's ridiculous. This is definitive proof that no one making this travesty gave a single fuck. This is such a simple mistake to notice and fix. In fact, I did fix it. There. See. Done. This took me no longer than a couple of minutes. And I'm working on a dirt poor ass editing software. What's the excuse of this commercial show with an actual budget? No matter how tiny. Someone was paid for this. Yet no one cares enough to double check for obvious continuity errors, directly undermining the drama. But enough of that. Time unleashes her impotent rage, seeking vengeance for the spilled milk. Olive can deflect the arrows effortlessly, and yet she somehow manages to lose in the end, and begins casting her grand magic of mass devastation. Our resident warriors Rosemary and Time have the brilliant plan of standing still with their thumbs up their ass, instead of crossing the gap between the buildings and stomping Olive before she can finish casting. But I hear you say, oh come on, that distance seems rather wide, it's not like they could clear that. Glad you brought it up, theoretical person in the audience, because I would agree under normal circumstances. However, the very next scene gifts us with this information. Rosemary's ankles and kneecaps didn't explode after several story drop, and time is practically Miles Morales. Both of them are supernaturally athletic, except when it would be inconvenient for the plot. Everything just works, however, depending on the scene. This is not dramatic storytelling, this is a farce. Points for Parsley for actually doing something and trying to rescue Neppy, sulking in the corner. Because... why is he sulking in the corner? Thanks, Neppy, for leading all four of them straight to me! Neppy Cat betrayed us! No! Because... funny? Sure, keep mutilating the tone. It's not like any of this can be taken seriously anyway. Also, this spell's design makes no sense. Yes, I'm complaining about it. It's a spell that turns everyone into stone, so why is the visual motif this lightning storm, complete with this massive magic rune that looks like a circuit board? Even the soundtrack has this sudden electronic flare while the spell is winding up? It's a design nightmare. Aside from that, its effect is absolutely devastating. Relatively quick casting time, large scale effect. The spell sweeps the entire city, through walls and everything. It can be blocked with a magical barrier, provided that it faces the correct direction, I guess? But still, if you don't have one set up, you are absolutely fucked. Begs the question how come the caster themselves survives the effect? Since the spell travels in all directions, 360 degrees from the casting point. But oh well, I guess the dramatic slam against the wall kickback effect works just as well. And thus, the entire Lingarf turns to stone. The city is dead silent. The girls are barely okay. Or at least most of them. This is the most intense situation the protagonists have ever faced. Fittingly for the show, 
This is how the episode closes. No! In case you are unsure, no, I did not edit that. That is actually how the episode ends. This dramatic silence immediately undercut with Almost broke my neck from the whiplash. If this is not self-parodying, I don't know what is. The show is utterly tone deaf. Like the opening, the ending song is pure sugar and cuteness and does not fit the show as a whole. The darker tones and intended serious dramatic twists and turns do not mesh with these happy-go-lucky themes. And this constant dissonance between the silly and the serious infects every major event in the show. Since the writers refuse to fully embrace either of them, both of them end up feeling flat. This episode should have faded away into the silence. Have the closing credits roll over the climax if you absolutely must have them. It's not some amazing unheard of trick. Many animes do something similar, playing around with their openings and endings to better fit the mood. You are already getting inspired, so this would have been the perfect place to borrow some more. The song itself is craptastic, just like the opening. The lyrics are laughable, generic nonsense about friendship and how good friends the girls are and how much fun they are gonna have as friends. If I was to say something positive, I'd say the fact that it's actually performed by Rosemary and Sage is fitting. This is a story about their friendship and all the troubles and turmoil they'll face together. The intent is clear and executed adequately, in a vacuum, mind you. It's simply a shame that I despise both of the characters, so the intended effect is hollow. And speaking of the bond between Rosemary and Sage, the two are currently at arms with one another, so much so that they waste time arguing over the obvious, allowing Olive to scamper away and hide, instead of just going after her right away. Doing? She said she'd shatter them to death. That means Parsley still alive in there. I'm going after her. Rose, wait. This isn't a game. The fight in the cave? We thought you were gonna die. You're being too reckless. Huh? No! Olive could be anywhere. Let's get down there and start searching. <gasps> 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 You numbskulls just let the villain escape with the pretense that going after her would be reckless and then you split up and go after her anyway. Everyone in this show is a moron. But in this situation, Rosemary's plan is the correct one. You do not wish to live in a reality where Rosemary is the least dumb person around. But what exactly is going on between these two? Why are these inseparable friends suddenly barking and snapping at one another? Is Sage simply worried for the safety of her best friend? She already came close to losing her once. So perhaps she lets her emotions come out less than constructive? <laughs> of course that's not the case. Because that would actually make somebody come of sense. The true reason for this quarrel is something far more petty and contrived. See, the show has decided that there must be some friction between these two to facilitate this split up. Rosemary must face Olive alone and the rest of the cast do... something in the meantime. And so, the writers have Rosemary and Sage bickering over nothing throughout the festival. You can use this guide to get around the festival. It's got a whole list of activities. Um, thanks, but I made my own guide. It's got a grid. Uh, okay, 
Remember, after circling around the town, the autumn processional ends by the bandstand. There's fireworks, revelry. You'll love it as much as I love belly rubs. <laughs> oh. But who doesn't, am I right? Here, have some more guides. Uh, have a good time. Bye-bye. <laughs> she was nice. I don't know. Something felt off about her. Uh, don't be cynical, Sage. It's a festival. Sheesh. Cynical. I was just... Sage is distrustful of Olive, even though outside of meta context, she has no reason to be suspicious of her at this point. Olive's conduct is no more peculiar than anyone else in the show. By Sage's logic, Parnell is a secret supervillain as well, so Rosemary rightfully calls her cynical. That makes her sad. Oh wow, that looks like the dauntless crest of the House of Anguis. What? Since when do you study history? Since it's about dragons, Sage! You're not the only one who knows things about things! <gasps> I was kidding. Yikes. Rosemary rightfully points out that Sage isn't the only one who likes to read, provided that the topic is interesting. That undermines Sage's status as the smart one of the duo. So that makes her sad. And all of this mild bad blood comes crashing down once Rosemary dare suggest that she has different interests to Sage. What's on the docket fun-wise? Oh, I put all our names in for the flaming axe challenge. Isn't that at the same time as the gourd carving contest? You saw me sign us up for it. It's like pumpkin carving, but using ancient tools and adhering to very specific regional guidelines. I didn't see you choose that. I thought you wanted to spend our first processional together. I do! By hurling axes that are on fire! Rosemary, we always do what you want. I was excited for this. I know, Sage, but it sounds like homework. I'm sure there's a way to do both. Throw flaming axes at gourds or, uh, pull out those festival guides. I'm sure we can find a compromise. Or... no compromises. Sage wants to do these things at the festival. Rosemary wants to do these things at the festival. And instead of both of them doing what they like on their own, and meeting up later... Uh, uh. Woohoo! Beat that, Sage! Rah! I'm good here. Are you still mad about the gourds? We ran out of time! What do you mean, still? It's been ten minutes. Oh, we can go do the next bummer thing you circled if you want. Thank you, your highness. Haha, <laughs> no need for royal address. I am but the great dragon of Chrysia. Was that dragon a jerk? If so, you're really nailing that costume. Oh. Sage, if you want me to be excited, pick something that's fun, okay? We don't need to be heroes today! For the record, none of the girls have done anything heroic throughout the series. Fixing your own shit is not heroism. Stabbing a monster in the face is not heroism. Being a hero means doing something for the good of others, possibly at the detriment to your own convenience. You know, altruism. Let's not dilute the meaning of words. But please, do continue. We can just be kids! Do you even remember what that's like? Or are you too busy being perfect for the teachers? Who, by the way, are all completely hammered right now? Of course I remember. When we were kids, you had fun just being around me. You didn't need us to go spelunking into some stupid volcano full of hot knives just to consider it a fun day. And you were never, never this annoying. You think I'm annoying? <laughs> that, fu that fucking pause. And you were never, never this annoying. Dramatic. Pause. You think I'm annoying? What a hoot! If only you knew. You think I'm annoying? Oh, one more time. You think I'm annoying? <laughs> yes, you are annoying. <laughs> Glad we are on the same page about this. Other than that, 
And this is painful to say, I'm taking Rosemary's side on this matter. Sage's reaction is nowhere near warranted, considering the fact that Rosemary has done nothing but enjoy herself. Sage has had every opportunity to do the same, and she refuses to do so. If Sage wants to do pumpkin carving or whatever, she can just go do that, and have fun doing that. Alternatively, if spending time with Rosemary is the thing that truly makes Sage happy, she should just go with the flow, and concentrate on being there for her friend. But that's not the type of person Sage is. Her idea of right, of correct, of proper, is whether she is accommodated 100%. Everything must go her way, everyone must adore her, Criticizing her, whether warranted or not, is a criminal offense. The only thing Sage cares about in this instance is that Rosemary isn't enjoying herself in the exact way she has pre-planned for them. Instead of making her friend happy, Sage is only interested in making herself happy. Her demented ownership of Rosemary is showing up once again. I've already gone over Sage's mangled morals and self-righteousness several times. But this is the most perfect, blatant example of Sage's true essence. She's not only bitchy about the large-scale issues, when there are things at stake, but about the pettiest of things as well. The true essence of a person comes out during the times of stress, and if this is all the push Sage needs to enter her Omega Cunt mode, then she has some serious devastating mental issues. She does not function like a stable human being. It is peculiar. From a certain point of view, Sage is the only character in the show that has received any kind of true character development. At the start of the show, Sage was a me companion to Rosemary, the straight man to her goofball. She was the one with her feet on the ground, relatively speaking. But as soon as she got into the academy, gained power, managed to one-up a couple of people, she became insufferable. Perhaps that side of her has always been there, imagining that her company is a god's gift to mankind. Or maybe her time studying simply made her think she is better than everyone else. Bad influences all around. All the people around her are selfish idiots. So maybe it's a can't beat them, join them kinda deal? One possibility is that the writer simply rewrote her between episodes. Because why would they care about consistency in this instance? They don't anywhere else. Whatever the case, as it currently stands, Sage is nothing but a selfish, hypocritical, narcissistic, this Pickable cunt, constantly fishing for victimhood points. She's everything that's wrong with female characters in modern mainstream fiction. These kinds of fantasies can only be spawned by pens full of venom and vitriol and smugness. The kind of special hatred for fellow men that is unique to feminist land whales and misanthrope freaks. The way they see heroism is nothing short from gut-wrenching. Sage is among the most horrendous leading ladies I've ever had the displeasure to witness in any piece of fiction. And I have no doubt that one day, someone will finally get fed up with her bullshit and shoves her magic staff so far up her fart box, she'll start gacking up magic sparks from her worthless pie hole. For as much as I despise Rosemary, and make no mistake, she is a self-centered imbecile all the same. Sage has made herself infinitely worse. The fact that the writer still views Sage as a likable, relatable, level-headed girl after this event speaks volumes of how out of touch they are with the real world. Sage is never called out for her bitch fit. The eventual making up is mutual. Implying that Sage's conduct has any merit? Mentally stable people do not act like this. Some variety of counseling is in order. Better yet, 
The Guardian Academy should vet the students beforehand for these kinds of disastrous personality disorders, before teaching them to wield lightning. This is all so frustrating, because the show already had the perfect vehicle to facilitate the split up. The cave trip, lean into it, base the conflict between the girls entirely on that. The dispute should have manifested right here. But since Sage has her bitch fit completely separate from that, this one remark fails to resonate in the way it is supposed to. It does not come from a genuine place in Sage's heart. She is not being rational, she is not worried about Rosemary, she is only being bitchy for the sake of being bitchy, and so she decides to throw Rosemary's recklessness at her face, just out of vindictiveness. Never brought up before, not before she has the desire to bash her friend. How convenient. This single dramatic gust of wind won't magically make this bullshit into anything meaningful. Piss off with this utterly laughable derivative directing, you absolute hack. These people have no clue what the fuck they are doing. The girls almost died. They should have their priorities in order. I can tell from experience that the closeness of death puts things into perspective. It adds steel to your soul. It makes you appreciate the things that you have. Everything tastes better. You stop minding this kind of petty shit. Spend an evening with your friend, by their side. Hold them close. Just be there for them. Because you never know which goodbye is the last. Fucking pumpkin carving. Okay, Olive, you can do this. Just gotta kill them one by one. Time's arrows are long range, so I should get in close and kill her first. Sage barely knows how to use her Terrasphere, so I can take her out next, no problem. And since Rosemary's unarmed, I'll save her for last. It's them or me. <coughs> Not dead, but whatever. Not dead, but whatever. Just a tiny strategic suggestion. Try giving the pumpkins the pumpkin treatment. The head is squishier than it looks. Because the brilliant tactic of slamming your weapon straight to the ground is far too much for Olive the Mastermind. Why is everyone retarded? I'm so tired of everyone being retarded in this show. Also, it is highly convenient that Rosemary just so happens to carry her massive sword on her back everywhere she goes. Don't be cynical, Sage. It's a festival. Sheesh. But all of this collective idiocy and convenience throughout this saga spread over two whole episodes has been in service of this moment, the epic duel between the prime protagonist and the major villainous presence of the show. Naturally, the hero emerges victorious. We already know this. That's just the nature of these kinds of stories. And I could not give less of a crap about either of these clown people. So there's no emotional investment. But how about the fight itself? Is the spectacle at least engaging? Short answer, no. Long answer, well, let's put it like this. It does not exactly hype up the audience when the villain of the hour, the obstacle, the alleged threat, is cowering away from the fledgling hero. Olive seems buffered, if anything, by the fact that Rosemary catches up to her, despite the fact that Olive has her exactly where she wants. It's a narrow secluded alley, she is alone, it's the perfect place to unleash her magic and destroy Rosemary effortlessly. But remember, retard, so obviously Olive refuses to do the quick and simple thing to achieve her goals. Instead we are treated to the most infantile, embarrassing, 
try hard. Look, mommy, I can do anime too. Brand of directing. What the fuck was that? What exactly made the mob topple? Are you... Are you actually a 10 year old? No adult person with adult person brain would ever think this is cool. So the fight begins, as dictated by the mob. Olive does all of these flips and leaps, not to mention pointless flourishes and suboptimal strikes. She punches Rosemary at one point, even though her weapon is a staff, a long reach melee weapon. And despite being an ineffective fighter, Olive is still so far beyond Rosemary that she effortlessly sets the pace and Rosemary can barely keep up. If your opponent is this agile, this powerful, then I hate to tell you, but you are done. You are not going to win this battle, that's not how any of this works. Yet still, the fight keeps on going for several exchanges. It's just movement for movement's sake. This is not impressive. Stuff moving quickly on the screen is not impressive. That's not what action is about. Random bullshit for the sake of lukewarm spectacle. Effective duels are all about letting the character showcase their capabilities to the fullest. Like in any other aspect of storytelling, action needs to follow logical cause and effect. If someone is established as clearly being more skilled and physically able than their opponent, then the ending should be obvious and happen fast. Olive gets in lick after lick, beating Rosemary silly, but then she remembers that No wait, I'm the protagonist, I can just use the power of bullshit second wind to instantly turn the tables. Fuck off show, just fuck off. And anyone who writes combat like this, fuck you too. These kinds of comebacks do not exist. It's stupid and lame and shatters whatever flimsy stakes the narrative had left at that point. Olive can take down time with a single jab. She barrages Rosemary with dozens of strikes. Yet Rosemary can tank all of it and just push through. Who exactly is the underdog here? Who are we supposed to root for? If Rosemary can take this kind of punishment and shirk it off, then Olive never presented any threat in the first place. If anything, Rosemary is the overpowered juggernaut here, and Olive is the helpless victim getting bullied. And what makes stuff like this even worse, in a way, is that the writers clearly acknowledge the importance of cause and effect. The show is filled with these tiny throwaway remarks, trying to excuse whatever horseshit happens to be filling the screen at any given moment. Its conjuring powers seem unlimited. I thought it was incompatible with old magic. Aloe's an elf, so her powers merged with mine. Sweetie, she'll learn about new magic and spell theory at school. Why would a trapper be evil? The well was dry. Maybe, without magic, they mutated? But none of these actually explain anything. They only make things more convoluted and contradictory. The writers know that things have to make sense. They do realize this. They are just bafflingly awful at their job. Did her spell bounce off my spell? <laughs> is this my fault? No, Olive turned the city to stone. This is war. No, fuck off, not buying it. You are trying to tell me that the effect of the spell was supposed to be localized within the balcony? Then that would make the villains even more incompetent than they already are. If the spell engulfs the entire city, then at the very least it ensures that the girls get petrified. But if the effect is precise, then what exactly would prevent the girls from simply fleeing the area of effect? Jump off the roof! We know they can! The villain's plan hinges on the heroes being just as retarded as they are. And I should hope that I don't need to tell anyone that this is not satisfying storytelling. No more mistakes. We mustn't call attention to ourselves. You don't want to draw attention? Then how about not using the obvious enormous magic techno party in the sky? How the fuck did no one notice it? 
It's not like it blends into the rest of the festivities. And furthermore, if the spell bounced from Sage's shield and apparently multiplied in effect in the process, then how come the barrier of Amaryllis only shattered instead of reflecting the spell back with even more power? Any time the show tries to explain or excuse something, they only make things worse. No matter which way you look at this, it's still retarded. It's either retarded this way or it's retarded this way. The end result is the same. Also, I don't give a shit about Sage feeling guilty for whopping two seconds about something she may or may not have caused. It doesn't lead into anything, so it's useless fake drama. Sage is a Mary Sue and I despise her with all my being. You know, this kind of looks like the work of a spark spell. A big exclusive one at that. This olive girl must be loaded. Huh. I wonder if I've ever seen her around Spooky City. Well, they just started selling them the last time I visited. There are these little high-tech sparkles with ready-made spells inside. They're super easy to cast. How do they work? You just need a Terra Sphere and a Spark. The Spark spell stays in your Terra Sphere until you deploy it. It's amazing. No, stop. Stop explaining things. You are so bad at it. Ready-made spells that anyone can use? Do I need to bring back the whole teleporting thing? Because I absolutely will. This world should look totally different at this point. Everything would be done with magic. There would be no manual labor. None. Zilch. It would not exist. Parsley's family would be on government welfare. Not to mention the more grim implications. I'm assuming that the Medusa Techno spell is a unique prototype or something like that. Not meant for the wider market. But still, it makes one wonder what kind of wars or gang violence fester in this world. Groups of casters just dubstepping each other to death. never seen anything like this. Not even when I lived in witch country. You lived in witch country? I mean, it's, it's a big island, but how did we never... Meet? You just answered your own question. Hey, you there, watching this video right now, a question for you. Do you personally know every single person from your hometown? Didn't think so. So can we just agree that this show is the black plague of dialogue? I lived in the countryside when I was young. We didn't practice new magic like everyone else. So you've always been unique. Can someone please write a single passage that won't make me reach for the bucket? It shouldn't be that hard. Stop waving that thing around. Everyone's stoned. It's too <laughs> dangerous. Put it away. That better not have been a real bird. It was decorative. I'll hold you to that. Mom. I will fix this. I'll fix you. They look so... happy. We have to save them, no matter what it takes. Shut up. Shut up. Everyone just shut the fuck up. Stop spewing this worthless dialogue. Voiceless storytelling is a thing, you know. No shit you must help them. It's all just pure pain, and we are still not done. Who's the triumvirate? Why are they after us? What? Which country's corporate big money guys? The villains of the show are celebrities. They go by their actual title. They allow their underlings to reveal who they are and do not end their existence for their pathetic bumbling. Kids, would you step outside for a second? Okay, so the heroes are gonna blow the lid on this massive scoop, right? Surely they won't keep this to themselves instead of revealing this insidious threat to the entire world to the teachers 
The veteran guardians whose literal job is to protect the world from evil forces. Why is the triumvirate after us? I know people in which country. I can ask around. No, we don't want to tip them off. We need to find Olive. She came after us and failed. She will come back. Then we should tell the triad what's happening. Or Caraway, at least. We can't. You heard her. The Academy's crawling with spies. If we tell anyone, we'll be overheard. The story would end right here if the girls just did the obvious. The villains have already shown themselves to be incompetent beyond all comprehension, so even the slightest pressure at this point would make all their plans crumble like a house of cards. But we still got three more episodes to fill with absolute retardation, so the obvious is a no-go. It's not even about mulling it over, telling everyone about this would be the gut instinct of any functional human being. Some vague threats about spies and the like is not enough to deter anyone. We hide well, and they'll keep sending us. The others won't be so nice. And that ends up being a lie anyway, so nothing is gained from this narrative intrigue-wise. It's ridiculous. Do you think Caraway is a spy? Do you think the Triad are spies? I would imagine not. Here's an idea. If you are scared of assassins, then tell literally everyone. If everyone knows, then it doesn't matter anymore. The assassins won't try to murder you, because they have nothing further to gain. The show suddenly invents this absurd reasoning for why the girls can't ask for help. Even though that has been their modus operandi for the entire series. No excuse for the mutant cat incident. No excuse for the rot. But now there suddenly has to be a reason. What the fuck was Sage trying to accomplish here? What possible use could this flashbang spell have? You can shoot lightning, you bewildering passive-aggressive bitch! Blow Olive's hand clean off! And as for the pussycat herself, she already had her hand on the Terrasphere. It was literally in her grasp. How did she manage to leave the trinket behind while escaping? Was closing her fist too much for her? Who wrote this? She's gone. We're never gonna find her now. Never gonna find her? The fuck you can't! She's still bleeding! Rosemary found her not two minutes ago by following the trail of blood! You see what I mean? The show constantly tries to justify its idiotic plot with these utter bullshit lines! In the hopes that anyone watching it has the mental capabilities of a toddler! Look! I'm not asking for anything unreasonable here. The basic assumption when engaging with any author's story is that I as the audience suspend my disbelief about all the fantastical elements. I allow the author to flex their creative muscle. I open myself up to embrace the tale they have to tell. And in return, the author doesn't treat me like an idiot at every chance they get. That's the silent deal between each author and the audience. You don't try to fuck me, and in return, I won't be so mean to you. It's that simple. Sage! Ugh. I needed to do something! Oh, and that's what you went with! I'm not perfect! Neither are you! Ugh. That's what I've been trying to tell you about myself, who does dumb stuff all the time! Guys, enough. If you are suddenly so self-aware, then perhaps you should work on fixing your character flaws. 
Instead of just continuing as the brainlet that you are and hoping things will work out, admitting problems is not fixing them, nor is it the same as taking responsibility for them. So the villain escapes, the spell gets reversed, the festival continues as if nothing happened, everyone continues being retarded, and I can feel my sanity dwindling each passing minute. I cannot believe I let that girl sleep on my feet. I can't believe how hard you smashed her terrasphere. I can't believe you won't stop simping. Apologies! Neppy must apologies to loud noises! Apologies for, from the full, Professor Slime. My mission made me break your noises. It's okay, dude. Broken instruments make good new sounds. Wanna try? You're a good cat. I can honestly say that in all my years of consuming storytelling in all its forms, I have never cared so little about anything happening on screen as I do at this very moment. The band's probably gonna start again soon. Sage, do you want to watch them with me? I'm in. We need some space. Actually, uh, never mind. I'd rather throw more money down more holes. I'll come with. No, Rose. I, um, I want to be alone right now. Alone? With Snapdragon? Yes. So Sage and Snap are a couple, I guess, and Rosemary and Sage are BFFs no more. Time to be sad. The world's always changing. But what can I do? Time just won't talk to me. And there's no Get those stubby feet moving. Make mama more money. Young girl. Can't we just start over? It might seem strange. Okay, so first of all, go dunk your head in acid, you sociopath freaks. What the fuck is this tone? You want me to be sad for Rosemary, right? Then why are you stuffing the screen full of this stupid shit? Oh haha, ha. Amaryllis killed a bird for real Z's. Isn't that quirky and funny? No. No, that is actually not quirky and funny. That's awful. You have a problem. Whoever wrote this. And whoever greenlit this. I know a place we can go. Uh-huh. Keep inserting your sexual fantasies into your creative work. That is the best way not to get mocked on the internet. Always nice to know the budget can be stretched to cover topics that truly matter. And you, you shut the fuck up, you absolute worthless wailing waste of space. Your voice is like rusty nails shot directly into my eardrums. Your music is crap, you'll never make anything worth listening to, your existence is a bad joke. People's imperfections make the world beautiful. That is the philosophy of pathetic narcissist losers. How to say you've given up without outright saying it. Here's a counter. What is truly beautiful are the people who work on themselves tirelessly, always aspiring to better themselves and to enrich the lives of those around them. The people who don't hide from their problems or deflect their imperfections, but rather decide to face their demons head on and conquer them. The metamorphosis from a flawed being to something not quite perfect, but still better than what came before. That process is the beauty of life within the grasp of anyone. Or in other words, grow the fuck up! Episodes 8 and 9 are a disaster. Every single problem in the show is escalated. The act of failing is honed into an art form of its own. 
It's as if the show itself is purposefully trying to find new ways to piss me off. And most of this frustration can be traced back to the lack of a single, simple, yet often ignored basic element of writing, consistency. That is the one thing I've been especially focusing on during this double feature of suckage. Consistency of tone, consistency of world, of themes, of characterization, of motives, everything is broken. The writers are utterly incapable of creating anything worth investment, considering the grandness of this event, and everything it ought to mean for the story that has come before, as well as going forth, the fact that the writers still continue to mess everything up to this magnitude, for my money, makes these the worst episodes yet. Not the worst overall, just the worst so far. Episode 10 has one of the weirdest cold openings I have seen. Rosemary recites a spooky tale about the triad of all people, while time plays the role of visual representation. When the triad reached their thousandth birthday, Oleander felt confident, strong, invincible. One night, when Hemlock and Foxglove were sleeping, Oleander snuck away to test her strength. She wanted to be alone, independent of her other selves. Oleander picked the hardest test she could think of, tearing a hole in the fabric of the universe, where the demon world and our world intersect. She made a friend there. A demon friend? <laughs> yes, Parnell. And I'm struggling to find the energy to care about anything on screen. The triad are over a millennia old. It's apparently common knowledge. No one has any inquiries about this. This amazing thing is treated like just another everyday occurrence. The bland ghost story is the star of the hour. It's exhausting. Nothing has any weight. The show refuses to expand on anything. Things just happen. Words are being said. And none of it matters. The story builds up to nothing other than the patented High Guardian comedy. If the circle is broken, he will feast on your bones! <laughs> Give me a break. What's next? Light as a trapper, stiff as a grog? What kind of dork tells scary stories at 2 p.m. in blinding daylight? Why are you guys even here? Marshmallows. Marshmallows. <laughs> Please clap. If anything, this would be a rather creative way to handle exposition, since time's adventure for the day mirrors Rosemary's story. Oleander saw that the demon was hungry. She snuck away from Hemlock and Fox Club, feeding the demon music boxes, rings from broken engagements. Precious things. If you bring something precious to the grotto and gift it to the lake, you can summon a demon who will give you powers. When you summon the demon, you must protect yourself with a circle of salt, which he cannot cross. Except that it's completely wasted, because time just repeats what's going on right after. You don't even know what you're doing. This plan, it might... Look, I create the salt circle. I stand in it to cast the spell, which summons the demon. I give him something precious. He opens a window for me to speak with my dad. I tell dad, the most resourceful person I've ever met, about the healing waters. He uses his knowledge to replicate the formula. We save the fairy woods. Let's do this once again, from the top. This world, with omnipowerful magic, with teleportation spells, as well as VR technology, does apparently not have telephones, nor any kind of simple spell equivalent. Instead, you have to make a deal with a literal demon in order to make a single Skype call. Why doesn't time just ask the demoness teacher to hop her over to the fairy woods lickety split? Why do this back alley deal with a random demon when you already have a trusted creature of the darkness right there at your beck and call? 
Or is that a racism? But of course, time is opposed to asking for help from anyone. Oh, you stupid son of a- Please, to everyone out there writing stories, can we just let this contrivance go the way of the dodo? Someone shadowing another person perfectly for miles on miles, and then suddenly getting found out right after reaching the destination, master of espionage one second, bumbling dumb fuck the next minute. You're lucky I didn't kill you by mistake. I do appreciate that, but I don't appreciate whatever this is. Ow, son of a broad! Stop shouting. You don't know what lives here. Time. I get that you- I can guarantee you don't get it. You want to help your dad. You want to see if you can save the fairy woods together. As partially showcased, there is nothing to get. Why exactly is time being such a bitch? I get as much of it as I can. You can't hide this from a friend. Roommate. Friend. This single exchange, as someone who appreciates solid characterization above most other things in storytelling, annoys me to no end. If the backstory from episode 7 makes time's motivation into nonsensical temper tantrum, and the climax of episode 8 makes time into a lobotomized crybaby, then this one line completely assassinates the rest of time's character. More specifically, it breaks even the slightest notion of any kind of character development. Take a look at these scenes. Thanks for telling us. Ugh, I hate it when feelings come out of my face. It's okay. We're your friends. <laughs> Listen, I trust you. All of you. I know I've been, like, off. But I need you to trust me back, okay? So, none of them know they were all just statues? The only reason I believe it is because you're the one telling me it happened. And I trust you. Hmm. <sighs> I'm just glad you're okay. You can't hide this from a friend. Roommate. One of these does not belong. Time has already warmed up to the rest of the girls. They are friends. She and Parsley in particular. Time is okay with asking for help. No matter how much you want to characterize Time as the aloof loner type, this is just blatantly going backwards in her development. Time is not a character, she is a character archetype. The Dark Elf needs to be a cunt, because that's her character. She's just being a Zundere for the sake of it. Because we need conflict. The writers are incapable of following even the simplest through line. But hey, it must be hard remembering things that you yourself wrote. Just allow me to give it a go. Here's a simple rewrite. Nothing else needs to be altered. I'll even dial myself back. Make it extra obvious, no subtext or anything, just so it fits better with the rest of this shite. I won't put my friends at risk again. I got you all mixed up in this. Because of me. You almost... <sighs> Time. You still don't get it. Whatever horrors you may feel about the future, we all have them. For as much as you care, Know that there are people who love and care about you in equal amounts. So, no more nonsense about going into the woods alone, okay? That's how ghost stories always start. In any case, time summons the demon, he rhymes, that's a personality I guess. Wait a minute, flashback. Now as the girls are panicking over Rosemary's idiocy, they are met by this goblin creature. He rhymes. That's a personality, I guess. 
is this some kind of fetish you have? Magical creatures flexing their lexicon? Moving on, the simple business exchange turns into chaos as the demon manages to rattle time to her core so that she unintentionally breaks the protective salt circle, leaving herself and parsley exposed. And what did the demon say to time to make her so upset? The time is short, the road unbends. Which country's where you meet your ends? Which country? Right. Why should I believe a demon? Which country's corporate big money guys? Ah, elf girl. Your father, Camphor, would benefit from your presence and skill, but your cynicism would get him killed. Killed? No. No, I want to help him! The demon suggested that Time's father is in danger, a fact that Time is already well aware of. Whatever, action time. What do we do? I don't have a reversal spell. <laughs> yeah, we kind of got to kill it! I didn't summon it to kill it. <laughs> I don't know how to kill mist. Make it solid! Try magic! I'm terrible at magic! We have no time for low self-esteem! I don't know, the forest bending from episode 5 seemed quite confident. Now there's an idea. Imagine if instead of whatever the fuck this was, Time and Sage had an actual talk about magic and worked on their insecurities as a twosome. You teach me and I teach you. A perfectly valid story concept just flushed down the toilet with a single throwaway line. On a more positive note, surprisingly, I think this is the best action scene in the entire show. There's some actual strategy in place, Parsley distracts the demon, while Time weaves a magical net to weaken it. The demon's smoke powers could be scrutinized, but compared to everything else on offer, this battle works a whole lot better. It's not good, but it's the least awful of the bunch. The gratuitous gore mixed with the cutesy aesthetic is still out of place, though. Wait, wait, girls. Perhaps we can work out a... No. Fatality. Ding dong, the demon is dead and his spooky visage gets immortalized on the grotto's wall. So are all of these skulls failed FaceTime calls or...? All this chaos... for nothing. <laughs> Not for nothing. At least we're still alive. You would have been alive all the same if you never ventured into the creepy woods in the first place, you obnoxiously optimistic opioid. We can figure out the blight together, but no more running off and no more secrets. We're friends, Time. So the big payoff of this story is the same payoff as episode 7, as episode 8, as episode 9. Time's character is stuck in an infinite Mobius. She grows closer to her friends time and again only to push them away in the next episode. Though to be fair, this development seems to stick this time around for the two episodes that are actually left. I can't say anything for certainty. And I owe nothing to the writers. They have soft rebooted this arc several times already. It's not the audience's job to force themselves to be invested if the writers can't keep their own shit consistent for measly 12 episodes. Time's character is frustrating to endure. Her demeanor is not dictated by her experiences. She doesn't grow, she just fills the quota of loner who learns to trust others in the most shallow way possible. Again and again. I can't be invested in this friendship, for all I know, the next chance time gets, she's gonna run off on her own again. This is not storytelling, these fictional people are not worth investment, they are just puppets for the writers to act out whatever planned derivative ideas they happen to come up with. You were right, this was a waste of time. Meanwhile, back at the academy, the rest of the gang are enjoying a cozy afternoon of free time. 
and for one day only, the entire cast has decided to shed their ridiculous fantasy attires and anime school uniforms and dress like normal human beings. Anachronism aside, these are far superior designs. The fast rule of thumb in outfit design is to dress the characters in a way that is comfortable and natural for them. And everyone does look far more organic this way. Ignore the ridiculous go fur and skittles colors. These should be the default designs. Continuing the epic breakup storyline from episode 9, Rosemary tries to make peace with Sage in her own carefree way by pretending like the whole thing never happened. So, how are those pages, Sages? Gonna call you that from now on. Sage the Page Mage. <laughs> Mandatory Activity Girl was your name for me last week, Rose Barb. I thought we were past all that. Uh-huh. You thought? At this point, Rosemary should just let Sage be. If she wants to be a spiteful, holier-than-thou little bitch, then let her. You are honestly better off without this walking, talking collection of personality disorders. There is nothing either of you said or did that justifies this kind of bad blood continuing for several days. Just say you are sorry, hug, and be done with it. Especially since you have far greater troubles to worry about. Like the end of the world, your school crawling with spies, allegedly, and the fact that time and parsley have mysteriously disappeared. But none of these things are brought up. The show has returned back to the pointless filler content, even though this is the point where the narrative should have reached maximum velocity, until the finale, two episodes away. I could not care less about these two patching things up. I dislike them both, their relationship is lame, when it's not outright toxic, there is absolutely no reason for me to root for them, this subplot has no potential to be anything meaningful. It's gonna be a mutual, I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry. There's no perspective, nothing to chew, nothing lost, nothing gained. It's a minor glitch in the status quo, forced drama, overblown to an embarrassing degree. So just get it over with. In fact, if the writers wish to do something actually daring, break the mold, evolve from this after-school special nonsense instead of getting hung up on the past and making up with a shitty friend just because, ditching this kind of toxic relationship would be an actually helpful narrative to explore. Not every story needs to have a happy ending in the traditional sense, but this is the story for the day, so we are shit out of luck. Aside from Rosemary feeling lonesome without her trusted ball and chain, Amaryllis has similar woes as well. Are Sage and Snapdragon just hanging out now? Is that a thing? Yup, that's what's happening. Gross, right? Yeah, it's a thing. Just like it was a thing at the end of the previous episode. Why are you talking about it like it's some kind of news? Instead of framing it like this, as a question, the dialogue should be, ever since the festival, those two have been inseparable. You know, equally obvious and useless, without giving each character Alzheimer's in the process. It's implied that Amaryllis and Snap have suffered a falling out as well, because... Why exactly? Please. What? Say please. You always order me around, but you never say please. <laughs> Ow! That actually hurt. This game is super realistic. Maybe we win by destroying the frozen people. Come on, help me smash them. No, that's that's just wrong. Yes, sick twist. <laughs> you can't always do things on your terms, Rill. Maybe you think I like following you around like a puppy. Uh-uh. I'm my own person. Is that really what you think? Let's just finish this round. If we lose, we quit. Snapdragon is such a whiny self-righteous piece of shit. When exactly 
Has Amaryllis ever ordered snap around? Before this one instance when getting frustrated by the shitty VR game? Never. Fiction. You made it up. It's never shown on screen. The show has constantly painted these two as equal friends. Both of them poke at one another, tease each other, and just hang around the school aimlessly, looking for bumpkins to bully. Neither of them is oppressing the other to do as they like. Snap is an arse towards Rosemary and Parsley on his own, for no reason. And Amaryllis is an arse towards everyone, on her own, for no reason. They both suffer from boredom and inflated sense of importance, and so they take it out on anyone and everyone around them. And if anything, Amaryllis has been remarkably accommodating towards Snapdragon, when he actually is struggling with something deep down inside. She's being a good friend here. The fact that Snap decides to brush off his best friend and not share his woes is on him alone. But being the victim is Snap's entire personality, so that's his battle plan through life. Honestly, Snap and Sage deserve each other. Have fun one-upping each other on the hierarchy of victimhood, once everyone else gets fed up with your shit and leaves you two alone. Anyway, the two spurned former best friends decide to team up to steal back what is rightfully theirs. Slime Boy and Parnell are also there, because the voice talent already got paid, so might as well put them to work. How'd you end up with no roommate? Please don't say murder. Nah, it was Zinnia. Couldn't hack it. Plus, my Goliath bird eater tarantula scared her or whatever. <laughs> Whoa! Whoa! Fighting against killer Parasex, facing enormous golems, Laughing maniacally while dangling for dear life on the back of a dragon. A teensy spider inside a glass box gives you the heebie-jeebies. No one is anything. Everyone is everything. Every joke just exists, regardless of who is acting as the butt. Just a reminder, character-based comedy needs to actually be character-based. And following up on that... The character of Amaryllis is an absolute mess. She's a one-dimensional bully, targeting Sage because of her heritage. She's a vapid choke dispenser, because the voice actor slash self-insert writer thinks they are a comedic genius. She's a loyal trans ally, validating Snap every step of the way, never cracking even a single jab, because that's what bullies and assholes do when it comes to trans issues, except if they are Callum, and then there's the constant edgelord act, glorification of violence, killing animals as a joke, pointing what is essentially a firearm at someone's face for mildly offending her friend, and that's all just quirky and silly, instead of alarming, because that's how the writers have decided to portray Amaryllis, because women. Let's remember the rules. Violent men are evil. Violent women are empowered. Her conduct would actually be indistinguishable from a villain, if only the show decided to give her that moniker. For the record, I find cowardice and others very attractive. <laughs> She's honestly a dumpster of writing. Aside from being nice to snap, nothing about her is likable. She is loud, vain, rude, conceited, her sociopathic tendencies are excused, she never develops, her background is brought up and dismissed as a joke, she just exists to fill the screen with idiotic hijinks and insipid dialogue, the same as the rest of the cast. And despite never apologizing for anything, or changing her conduct, she just sort of becomes lukewarm mates with the main gang. She's supposed to be the sarcastic one of the group, more so than time is. And she actually suffers the same issue as the elf. Both of them are barely tolerable. The few times they call out the rest of the cast for being imbeciles. The handful of decent moments in the show 
are entirely predicated on the writers roasting their own characters, essentially doing my job for me. Imagine, sad sage, all her embarrassing memories of wearing dumb hats and being boring and stuff, I don't know. Other than that, Amaryllis is just a tool, a narrative device, a bully for sage, someone to stand by snap as he bitches and moans, and the catalyst for this fiasco. So Amaryllis' brilliant plan to break up Snap and Sage is to conjure up a memory spell, which manifests a astral projection of the target enacting their past, and embarrass the two with their most shameful memories. Once again, this is something that just exists. The applications of this spell would be limitless, interrogations and the like as an obvious example. There would be no way for spies to hide anywhere. Never crosses anyone's mind. But fuck it, whimsy away! Also, Amaryllis bums around with books and candles and waxes about magical ingredient lizards or some bullshit. And then just whips out her Terrasphere wand to cast a spell anyway. What? Did no one proofread this? I know the answer is fuck no, but it amazes me every time just how scattershot each plotline is. Not a single event follows logically from the prior one. The spell backfires as Rosemary grows a spine and decides not to invade the privacy of the person she allegedly cares most in the entire world. Points for that. Come to think of it, why did Amaryllis need Rosemary to be her partner in crime in the first place? Her plan was to use magic from the get-go. Rosemary isn't a mage. So the only reason to invite Rosemary along was so that she could fuck up everything at the last second? Because plot... Right. The memories spring to life and start running around the school. And considering their purpose, all of these flashes from the past are super weak sauce. It's all kiddie stuff. That's not embarrassing. Kids are dumb. Who cares? Why would the spell even target those? Instead of something more recent? Or actually scandalous? The fact that none of the memories have anything to do with the struggles of teenage life is already suspect. If these are actually the most mortifying memories these characters have, then their lives are pretty great. The Bumpler Brigade hunt down the memories and trap them inside bottles. I honestly don't care anymore. Oh, hi, Leland! Parnell, if you tell anyone I vertically face planted because of how dreamy Leland is, I'll turn you into a lizard and keep you in a box in my room. Got it? <laughs> Threaten me with something that isn't one of my life goals. So the whole idea of Parnell is to be as cringy as humanly possible every time he opens his mouth? Is that it? Please... Can we just... Let it end? Sage and I once lost a chameleon in a corn maze. And it was way easier to catch than memories. Reptiles are easy. <laughs> Snapdragon got me my first lizard. Bethany. Aww. Pet or potion ingredient? <sighs> Why would I name a potion ingredient? Because murder makes you tingle? And by the by, even this one defining somewhat substantive aspect of Amaryllis, her friendship with Snap, is built on shaky ground. When did the two actually meet? How did they become friends? This is Snapdragon's hometown. That doesn't exactly look like. It's basically made of money, castles everywhere, so many lights you can't even sleep at night. When have these two met? At what circumstances? They are clearly from two different worlds. If the show refuses to give an adequate explanation, then I refuse to care about this friendship. It's not constructed with any kind of organic story flow or vision. It's fake. It's hollow. The friendship just exists, because that's what it says in the script. At least Rosemary and Sage have a reason to be mates. Even though they have little in common, they grew up as neighbors, 
limited choices, so of course they hang around together. The relationship between any two characters is supposed to blossom naturally. Friends need to have a reason for their bond, what brought them together, and what binds them together. And that bond will naturally shatter when faced with irreconcilable differences, the natural flow of life, things changing for the better or worse. That's what makes relationships feel real, that's what makes the audience care. People getting hung up on minor spats and pretending like they are life-altering events is not appealing. Write what you know, sheltered souls create sheltered stories. And while everyone else is busy wasting the fast dwindling screen time of this show, Sage and Snapdragon are having a moment. So, after hours of just relentlessly bashing this travesty, how about some actual positivity for a change? <gasps> I know. And no, I'm not memeing here, I'm not being facetious, I am 100% sincere. I'll just allow this scene to play out in its entirety, and then comment after. To get you in the right state of mind, try to imagine this out of context to the best of your ability. Ignore all that we know about the blueberry and the carrot, the fact that they are both awful characters, and even worse people. Try to view this scene as if this was someone pitching the show to you, a sneak peek at their vision, a taste of things to come, as it were. You have no idea what High Guardian Spice is, but you are open to new experiences. Everybody on board? Everyone comfy? Alright, let's watch. <sighs> we used to balance each other out. Like, I calm Rose's manic energy, and she left me out of my anxiety. But lately... She's been so... restless. She called me boring. You are not boring. You have this history with her. She thinks you're the same as you used to be, but you aren't. I'm aren't. Not. I'm not. We used to have so much fun together, but now... I don't know. It's confusing. You, uh, sure do have a lot of feelings about Rosemary. <laughs> of course I do. She's my best friend. Don't you have a lot of feelings about Amaryllis? No. She's my best friend, and she's kind. Is she? <laughs> Let me correct that. She can be kind. To me. When I imagine her in my head, she's always plowing through crowds with her elbows pointed out, shouting, That's not my problem! <laughs> so, yeah, no confusing feelings there. We've got more of a father-daughter relationship. Who's who in that scenario? Oh, uh... I have no idea. On top of everything, my parents forbid me from using new magic. And that's impossible around here. Rose doesn't get it. Oh, I understand being at odds with your folks. But think about it. All this weird heartache. I mean, I don't know. Amaryllis has this weird crush on Hickory that she keeps denying, but it doesn't bother me. Could you... Maybe have a crush on Rosemary? What? Just consider it. You talk about her a lot. Of course I don't! We're just really good friends. I could never think of Rose that way. We don't have to talk about it. Um, do you want to hear a story about the time my brother May just shoved me in front of a charging centaur to impress my dad? <laughs> <laughs> Again, in a void, ignoring all that we know about the story, completely removed from the context of the show it exists in, I honestly think that this is the best scene in the entire show. It's not fantastic dialogue, it's barely decent, half the lines are painfully exposition-y, topics are just thrown around and ignored. It's all fairly surface level stuff, but damn it, I'm trying to be nice here. It still manages to be far beyond anything else on offer. 
It's two full minutes of a pair of characters just talking, bonding, it's calm, no stupid jokes, there's even something that resembles actual wit, good humor drifting between pals, the scene manages to build an atmosphere of serenity, no one screams or whines or says something monumentally brain-meltingly stupid, even the little thing with the raindrops coming together while being corny is still rather cute. Like, oh, you tried, you actually tried. I just wanna pinch the director for being such a sweetheart and managing to drip out a speck of genuine vision onto the screen. If you showed this scene to someone who had never even heard about the rest of the spice, I bet they would at worst shrug indifferently. Or think of it like this. Imagine if this two minute stretch was the worst that the show had to offer. At that point, we would probably have a, if not outright good, then at least inoffensive animated show on our hands. And this is not even the only decent part of the episode. Time has a flashback about her father, and while the conversation is nothing exciting, it's also not utterly puke-inducing. It's basic and played out, if anything. Time had a good relationship with her father, despite being a somewhat rambunctious teen with the whole yeah yeah, responsibilities are boring, let me shoot things routine. If one wishes to read into it, Time probably regrets not appreciating her time with her father to the extent that she should have, and that in turn feeds into her pseudo-obsession about helping him. You can't see it, but I'm shrugging as hard as I can. Bottom line, this should have been the entirety of episode 10, instead of wasting time with the idiotic demon phone call, or chasing after silly phantoms, the episode should have been a calm collection of vignettes, the cast just talking, reflecting upon their experiences, having flashbacks, and fleshing them out. All of them show how Amaryllis and Snap met, tell us why we should care about their bond. Some throwaway line about a lizard is nothing. The fact that the writers pretend like it's something is insulting in itself. Show us that moment. Why does it matter? How does Amaryllis gravitate towards that memory so much, enough so that she shares it willingly? The entire cast of characters are lacking any kind of dimensions. Ten episodes, and we know next to nothing about them. Oh, apologizing to Sage is rough. She's so perfect. She puts up with a lot from her folks. Show us. What exactly does that mean? What is Sage's family life actually like? Without context, that statement is meaningless. The level of zero fucks given is actually disgusting. If you don't care to flesh out your cast, don't expect anyone to give a crap about them. All of these rainy day memories should have been bursting with meaning and revelations Showcase new sides of the characters we never even considered before. The possibilities are literally endless. You could even use the stupid memory spell as the plot device if you absolutely must have it. Force the characters to face the pain from their past, confront their own flaws, accept that they have to improve if they are ever to become guardians, whatever the hell that actually means. And by the by, since the budget is allegedly the cause of every single problem in the show, you know what's real cheap? Having the character sit still and talk. So how about fixing two issues at once and saving your money by elevating the cast of caricatures into actual characters? But instead, the show regurgitates the same sludge for the umpteenth time. The final memory phantom depicts Rosemary crying her eyes out because of her mummy. Because the main heroine truly has nothing else going for her. Why would you leave? <laughs> Rosemary, is that the day your mom left? That statement makes no sense. 
There is no way Rosemary reacted this way the day her mother left. She is a guardian, so she must have been away often on missions and such. She even told Rosemary beforehand that she was going to leave. The line Sage is going for was... Is that the day you realized your mother isn't coming back? And that is a horrendous sentence, but that is the actual factual information that should have been brought forth. Or just don't. Just shut the fuck up and stop asking retarded questions with obvious answers. And furthermore, how absolutely sickening is it that the thing that finally brings Sage to the point of wanting to make peace with Rosemary is the reminder that, oh, right, she has a missing family member, please be sad. What message is anyone supposed to gather from this? Be angry, act the part of the victim, until the other party pulls out a more powerful victim card. Fuck off, show! Just fuck off to the deepest depths of hell! Sage should have sought out Rosemary right after having her talk with Snap. She called Rosemary her best friend, casually, even after all the horrible things she supposedly said and did. At that point, anyone ought to realize that the spat is completely ridiculous and just go and fix it. <laughs> is, is mom coming back? I'm on it, kiddo. I'll keep you posted, okay? Oh, okay. <laughs> How exactly are you on it? You've done absolutely nothing to find your mom. Do you think that when you become a guardian, you are just magically going to stumble into her? What is your plan exactly? This is the first time I've seen a fictional character literally lie to themselves. Anyway, a full episode later, after nothing has changed between them, after nothing meaningful has been said to either of them to change their perspective, after the script says that we are indeed at the end of the episode, now the girls finally make up. Both of them are sorry for being dumb, neither of them will aspire to be less dumb in the future, so that's... that's just on character at this point. I'd like to place a special emphasis on this line in particular. This absolute not excuse at all excuse Sage offers for her Omega Cunt act. I didn't mean to explode at you the other day. Everything in here, it's just anxious and chaos almost always. That sounds awful. Keep this scene in mind. I'm not done with it yet. As a bonus round of limp peacemaking, Amaryllis and Snap are back to being mates as well. Are you... are you mad at me? Mad? No. But you don't have to be mean all the time. Maybe scale it back a few degrees. I am who I am. Like you. I cannot fathom the logic here. Snap has apparently been okay with Amaryllis being as vile as she wants for all her life. This is my old revenge diary. I started it when I was two and a half. But now suddenly Snap finds that objectionable? Hmm... His strange change of heart oddly began around the same time he started hovering around Sage. Eh, could be a coincidence. Just something to ponder about the utter lack of morals, standards, or just all-around spine deficiency on display. Also, Snap himself has not once apologized for being Amaryllis' accomplice, so the whole thing reeks of projection. And Amaryllis never actually utters an apology either, nor does she promise to be less mean in the future. Because she is who she is. Wonderful. Just wonderful. What a meaningful way to cap off this afternoon of nonsense. 
just when I think that I've seen every trick there is, episode 10 somehow manages to find yet another way to annoy me. The fact that the show flirts with the idea of not being horrendous all the time only serves to highlight its problems even further. Now to be clear, a single scene is not enough to save an episode, or to turn it into anything acceptable. I still think the first episode is the least offensive of the bunch, even though it's pointless filler that does nothing with the cast and ruins the world building in one fell swoop. It's just that each episode after that is progressively even worse. As for episode 10, its biggest sin is once again underlying just how worthless the cast of characters are. Charmless, selfish, selectively incompetent, idiotic, whiny, and if you were hoping for character growth, then you are not only left wanting, but the show even walks back on previous development. Amongst all the inconsistencies of this show, the one thing we can rely on is that the cast will be insufferable. Barring those brief moments, on the windowsill and the like, I guess this is simply probabilities doing their thing. Even a broken clock is correct two times a day. Now that we've seen the best the show has to offer, in a way, it's time to tackle the absolute worst. Episode 11 starts off with the heftiest concentrated heap of utter horseshit I think I've ever seen. The show just shovels shit straight to the mouth, shoves it in there, eat it, eat the shit, eat it and love it you little bitch whore, say thank you and ask for seconds. The students are being trained and tested for their first official guardian mission. There is a sea dragon running amok and it needs to be stopped. So. To train for this underwater mission, the students stand on boats and swat their weapons at this humongous octopus. How exactly do the skills present here translate into this? Also, why are these first year students sent to battle against the beast? Where are the upperclassmen, the official guardians? Where the hell is everyone? There are dozens of students graduating each year, no? And you're telling me not a single pro guardian is available for this serious life-threatening mission? Why don't the teachers handle this? The triad are standing right there! The most powerful trio of sorcery in all the land, with the ability to bend space and time! Snap your fingers and fix the problem! Why are you sending these dumbass children to die, you absolute sociopaths? And as is the norm at this point, the action is just embarrassing. Look, if you don't want to put in the effort, then just write something that doesn't entail combat. This limp nonsense garbage is just waste of screen time and budget, and makes the show look even more inept than the writing already is. Also, the punching bag octopus is not really an octopus, but rather some kind of submarine piloted by Caraway that he made using magic. He conjured an underwater octopus mecha with magic. What? You can just create complex machinery using magic? The possible applications of this spell are once again endless, and this is the one thing you decide to use it for. And apparently it still has organic parts for some sanity devoid reason? And why did you decide to pilot it yourself? Why not just make it an automaton while you're at it? Better yet, send the machine to subdue the sea dragon instead of putting lives at risk. You insane, miserable shit biscuit! And the mission is in fact a request for help from another Guardian Academy, which is just brand new fucking information to me! There are several academies for these useless D&D rejects! Why can't they handle this themselves? The crisis is happening on their turf, it's literally their speciality, in what reality do the people of the Aqua do worse handling underwater problems than a bunch of newbies, both in terms of fighting and aerial cosplaying? 
The premise of this episode gives negative fucks about anything. It wants things to happen, so they are going to happen. To hell with whether or not it makes sense, or is in any way narratively satisfying. This is the simplest thing you could ever come up with. A monster terrorizes a region and needs to be stopped, and these utter mental infants are incapable of managing even that. It's not written for children, this is written by a child. An adult child. This is the first two minutes of the episode, and my brain is already turning into nutritious breakfast. Also, the dialogue is just... Great teamwork. Nice use of violence. There is no one on this sanity forsaken planet that has ever said those words in that sequence. Look, English is not my first language. I hail from the far northern reaches of Europe. You can hear this accent. And even I can tell that this line is clunk as fuck. Redraft. Especially the dialogue, you bunch of worthless sea cucumbers. And speaking of nice use of violence, the show keeps making this one dead on arrival gag. The oh haha near death experiences are funny, ain't they? How did this cunt nugget manage to unleash his arrow at Caraway on accident? Was it an accident? How is he not expelled on the spot for assaulting a professor? How did Caraway catch the arrow? I know the reason for everything is because funny. But there is no joke. Random stuff happening is not comedy. There's a hundred factors that go into crafting functional humor. And everyone teeters at different things, but this is just lame. Without cause and effect, appropriate reaction from the participants, some kind of irony, a speck of wit, not to mention proper timing, there is no joke. This is just stupidity filling the screen, and it's indistinguishable from everything else that's happening, so there's not even shock factor. There is a time and a place for levity, but first you have to actually have something humorous to share. This is just repeat of episode 7, where the whole academy is painted as soulless murder enthusiasts, and Xenia is the only sane person around. Fuck this shit, I'm out. Also, since we are once again establishing the fact that violence and death are just quirky and funny, I hope this episode doesn't attempt anything along the lines of dramatic death scene, because that would just be conflicting tone, hypocritical, and all around incompetent. I hope. Mermaids and a sea dragon? <gasps> My dreams, they're coming true. We'll scale mountains and fight mermaids. Funny how continuity works. Anyway, the girls get picked for the mission, along some leftovers, no surprises there. So canonically, the main four of the show are each the top students of the freshman class. After a brief boat ride, the girls are met by the potion teacher waiting for the chosen champions. Again, why are you sending the kids into the maw of danger? By the time the rest of the imbecile academy is done wasting their time with all this, you yourself could have just gone. And sedated the dragon on your own. We're looking for the Cyrenia students. Oh yes. They're dead. <gasps> <laughs> Said I'm seeing you. Your baby is dead. <laughs> That's what you'd hear if your baby fell victim to the thousands of death traps lurking in the average American home. I'm not sure whether or not I've made it clear at this point, but I really, really, really hate all of these people. Let's get these magic rings on. Whoa, oh, lovely. How does this work? Just add water! Down go the girls, and out of nowhere, we are treated to this... Let's say homage to magical girl transformations. And all I can think is... Why? Why is this here? A burst of light, and poof, fins would have sufficed. This just feels like the show is informing us that 
magical girl anime are a thing that exists, and the show's creators are aware of the fact, which is just good for you. I just can't fathom the priorities of this show. Normally, these kinds of transformation scenes are used to pad out the episodes, to save money by reusing the same sequence over and over again, or perhaps to add a bit of flair and flash and hype to dramatic moments. But here, it just comes and goes. The scene is nowhere near flashy enough to count as spectacle. There's no personality, no flavor. It's just awkward, straight from the bargain bin of inspiration. Just to hammer this home once more, if you mismanage your own resources, time, money, effort, to this degree, then you have no right to claim that your shit show's failings are due to budget constraints. You can just fuck right off. <laughs> oh, oh, hi! Quiet, we're not safe here in the open water. The Scypheth is hunting. If he smells me, he'll chase us for food. Yes, the sea dragon will chase you for food, which he will put in his mouth, and then he will jump with his teeth. How the hell did you write that and not immediately commit seppuku for being such a worthless author? I have no idea. A lame chase ensues as the dragon indeed emerges to chase the girls for food. He's got an appetite for real mermaids. You go after me. Oh, no, 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 you can't say that. Real mermaids? As if someone changing themselves into something they weren't born as makes them less real? That sounds like a transphobic statement to me. Quick, cancel this show. Cancel everyone responsible for this evil, bigoted, slanderous hate speech. Or at the very least, keep your standards consistent. Whichever is easier. Should we have a signal in case anything goes wrong? Something like, uh... This is getting a bit uncomfortable. I, I don't I don't like this. Is there something you'd like to get off your chest, Rosemary? About your views concerning the merfolk? That's gibberish. You don't know our language. Oh, or was that a, um, a, a joke? Uh, yes, joke. <laughs> <laughs> Very good one. <laughs> but no more. So here we are, in the Underwater Kingdom Academy Mermaid Place, with whopping three people. No, really, we never see anyone aside from these three. Did the sea monster already eat everyone else? Or did the mermaid melody eat all the budget? I am Elodie, Coral and Kelp. Meet Parsley, Sage, Rosemary. And... Uh, time. Time. A nice name. I like it. I like things, too. <laughs> okay, I guess we know time's type now. I cannot get over how fast I am underwater. Why not stay a mermaid? We'd get to hang out more. <laughs> <laughs> Can you just feel the love? Aren't you so invested in this? Wasn't there some kind of dragon to deal with? So what exactly is the plan? What crucial part will the Spice Girls play in sedating the monster? We will bait and distract him. Rosemary, you'll sedate him. How? Bubbles Venom, it's powerful enough to knock him out. Rosemary is going to hold this electric seahorse and give the dragon a poke. That's the grand strategy. Give the dragon a poke with a seahorse. Just a tiny, teensy technical question. And don't take this the wrong way, but why the fuck couldn't you do this yourselves? Why do you need these for? Just take the Pokemon and stab the dragon. Done. This premise makes no sense. It makes negative sense. It actually takes reality and just sucks it dry of common sense. The world has turned objectively, quantifiably, 
dumber by this episode's existence. I can feel my brain, my soul, my love for storytelling, my willingness to live eroding. I fucking hate this show. Why does it exist? Bubbles, you can be my aquatic flowering thorn. Where is your blade anyway? Rosemary, I'll hold flowering thorn. You won't need her where you're going. How do you know that? How does a warrior not need her sword on an official mission? Oh, right. Because she needs to have her hands free for the critter. And it would have clashed with the mermaid designed to have her carry the sword on her back same as before? Or what? What is the logic here? The decisions this show makes are consistently baffling. My hammer cuts through the water! You mean, like a sword? But none of it matters anyway, because the plan fails, because everyone in this show is a moron. Hiya! Rose, quiet. Oh, sorry. Hiya. How did you survive this long being so retarded? Somehow, no one notices the enormous creature waddling about in the clear waters until it's already going for the fish sticks. Ow! No one tries to stab it. Rosemary refuses to do the one job she was specifically given. Parsley gently slaps it on the ass. What the fuck is this? Who wrote this? This is the lamest, fakest, limpest, most infuriating action I have ever soiled my eyes with. Sage whisks the gang to safety with her trusty bubble spell. Round two of idiocy ensues at home base. Rosemary finally tries to do her job, begs the question why these two scenes couldn't be combined, but hey, it's your time and your budget to mismanage as much as you please. And it still doesn't matter anyway, because everyone in this show is a moron. Bubble spells to trap your foe, sleeping spells to sedate them, stabbing weapons, bashing weapons, times arrows coated with napping potion, all of these tools and more at your disposal, and still the heroic guardians of the realm, the best of the best of their class, are unable to do anything to an overgrown eel. No, Rosemary! You got it! <laughs> you stupid! <laughs> you wanna give it another go? No? Alright then. I guess Rosemary read the script and realized it would be all for naught. A grand finale of sheer... That's just how it works. Stop thinking about it. And Zeus as Sage unleashes her beam of destruction, the exact same as before, except that this time she loses control of her Terrasphere and accidentally wounds the dragon fatally. It's never even hinted that this was something that could happen. Ever since episode 5, Sage has been in full control of her magic, but this is what happens. And the following drama. All the, oh no, we can't heal the dragon, it has to be put down. Oh no, what have I done? Let's all have a big cry together. All of that is the biggest insult to the audience this show could ever possibly try to pass off as serious storytelling. First of all, I don't give a single shit about the dragon. All we've ever seen it do is be a bastard. Some anecdote about how it used to be gentle and enjoy belly rubs means nothing. Oh yes, he used to love getting belly rubs. He was so gentle. As it currently stands, it's a rampaging beast with the taste for mermaid meat. At best, the situation is regrettable, but it doesn't change the fact that the safety of literally everyone else outweighs the existence of this one creature. But it's not the dragon's fault, it was driven crazy by the rot. Oh, you mean the rot which the heroes of this ridiculous clusterfuck story have repeatedly refused to do anything about, including the most obvious, 
bringing it to the attention of the authorities and revealing the identity of the people responsible for this looming calamity, which they know, lest we forget, that rot. All of this would never have happened if any of the characters were collectively in possession of two functioning brain cells. If every single character's existence is nothing but an overly complicated application for the Darwin Awards, then I have no sympathy to offer any of them. Stupidity is not tragic, stupidity is not sad, it is maddening. And even though time literally says that the rot is the cause of this, and the dragon got infected near witch country, Merfolk students were on a research mission near witch country studying changes to the reef system when they were chased by a side pit. No one does anything about it. The cat is out of the bag. There is no reason to wait for the impending doom and death of everyone. Go kick in the bad guy's door and put an end to this madness. Do your goddamn job, you worthless warrior wannabe weasels. Furthermore, the show has utterly bungled its core ethics when it comes to the sanctity of life. Magical creatures, monsters of all kinds, are treated as tools, obstacles, disposable, a source of excitement for hedonistic adventurers looking for personal glory. Killing the parasects? Fair game. Killing the golems? Fair game. Killing the dragon? Fair game. Sage murdered this infant dragon by draining its life force. You can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. Not a single tear is shed, but now, suddenly, the show has decided that this particular creature acting on instinct and threatening to murder everyone is a victim and needs to be mourned. The audience should feel bad, because this is so horrible and sad. You cannot have both at the same time. Either the lives of beasts matter, or they do not. And as for Sage and her crocodile tears, this experience won't affect her in any way. The show already tried to peddle this horseshit once, and I didn't bite then, and I sure as hell won't bite now. Until Sage takes some actual responsibility for her mistakes, she can just toss right off. I can't... I can't believe I... I killed him. I couldn't stop the spell. It's not your fault, Sage. The effectiveness of new magic conceals how unmanageable it can be. True responsibility lies with whatever is altering the balance of nature. Nothing underlines the author's blatant favoritism towards Sage more than the merfolk's reaction to the death of their beloved Bellyrap connoisseur. These people were the ones who made a big fuss about capturing the dragon alive. It was their friend, and now their reaction is just... Oh no! Anyway... If the merfolk actually got upset by the idiot brigade's mistakes, then that just might lead into some actual consequences for the Marisu and her entourage. And we cannot have that. The authors are soulless cowards, the lot of them. This is nothing but empty cry porn. Tears for the sake of them. All of them allocated to the characters at center stage. Absolutely revolting. And finally, I will once again remind everyone about portal magic and healing water. These amazing resources are readily available to anyone, easily and at infinite amounts. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. The magic of this universe can literally do anything. There are two veteran archmages standing right there and still the show is telling me that there is no way to heal the dragon even though it is still very much alive, it didn't die in an instant, it's still suffering. So, teleport into the murder cave, bring back some healing water, and save the creature. The fact that these professional hero guardians makes me sick to even say that, 
refuse to have these resources on hand at all times so that they can do their fucking job makes them criminally negligent and outright evil. Every single aspect of this story is broken. For 11 episodes, it's been one spirit-rendingly idiotic scene after the other. This one in particular has been an utter embarrassment. And still the writers have the goal to expect anyone to take their far seriously and feel alongside the characters. My answer to that is a resounding go fuck yourself. The only thing sad about this is the fact that someone wrote this, handed it in, and got paid for it, as if it was something of value. I wish for every single character in this show to die a slow, horrible, humiliating death. Their failures and sorrows mean nothing to me. I do not care about any of them. I actively despise them, much like the actual comedy in the show. Their supposed serious experiences are nothing but a flat joke without a proper punchline. Hmm? Did I miss something? Oh right, that thing! I almost forgot. Now I really don't care to talk about how adult people decide to lead their private lives. It doesn't interest me in the slightest. Every grown ass person is free to do with their life as they like. Make their own decisions, seek happiness as they please, suffer their own mistakes, unravel their own discoveries. That's your own business. But the moment you open your stupid mouth and start peddling harmful worldviews and normalizing idiocy, you make it everyone's business. So here we are. Let's get demolishing. You may have noticed that Snapdragon and Callum just disappear from the story somewhere along the boat, right? And there is a reason for that. That being the writers have decided to jam this entirely separate B-plot into this episode, starring Snapdragon's gender issues, Cal acts as the narrative tool Boogeyman, same as before, that's why he's here. But what about Snap's bestest buddy Amaryllis? Well, obviously, she can't be present to shield Snap from the mean, mean comments coming from Cal. Otherwise, the situation won't escalate as intended. So, she needs to be yeeted from the mission. To facilitate this setup, the writers nerf Amaryllis, forbidding her from using her explosive magic against the octopus mecha. Instead of following the example of the galaxy brain bestest ever, except not really, except yes, really, Sage, and just instantly blasting the target from here to eternity, Amaryllis uses the far less effective axe inherited from Snap inherited from his father. Everything just happens. Logic be damned. But that's an overused spice at this point. So I'm not all that impressed. Anyway, the whole reason for Cal and Snap coming along for the mission in the first place is so that they can have this exchange. It's peaceful being on the water. Don't you mean in the water? I know you'd rather be swimming with the other mermaids. What are you talking about? I just think you and the mermaids are gonna get along well. Why? Oh, come on. Like you don't remember gallivanting around the autumn processional? You loved making such a splash in your mermaid costume. It was just a costume. I, I know I'm not a mermaid. No, but you loved dressing like one, didn't you? All mermaid up like the frothiest queen of the sea. Shut up! Your dad must be thrilled to call you his daughter. I said shut up! <laughs> Snapdragon, stop! <laughs> Ah, freak! Ah. Whoa, what was that about? Did you see what he did to me? I'm out! I'll find my own way back to the academy! Cal states that Snap liked dressing up as a mermaid, which is true, and he insinuated that Snap has a certain feminine streak, which is also true. That's the whole narrative behind his character. So Cal tells the truth, 
and Snap flips out and turns violent. We are supposed to root for this character, right? Plus, if you unironically sit like that, you deserve to be mocked. Laying it a bit too thick there, you out of touch sexist piece of shit. The triad would want me to suspend you. I'm giving you a second chance. Okay, so there is supposed to be some kind of penalty for assaulting a fellow student? Why is Parsley still attending the academy? Oh, right, because as there is an icky toxic masculine hetero man, you can be as violent as you please, as long as the people you hurt said something mildly offensive. That also happens to be true. In 2077, what makes someone a criminal? Should have known you were stuck up. There are no consequences for Snap. Caraway turns instantly accommodating, covering his ass, looking for any and all excuse not to suspend him on the spot. Because Cal is an icky, toxic, masculine hetero man. I feel like I'm the only one being punished. Will he be in trouble for the shit he said to me? Of course. This isn't new behavior for Cal. Oh, so Cal has spoken truths coded in mild sarcasm before? What an awful human being! It would be rather hypocritical if Snapdragon ever said anything sarcastically to anyone. Sage and I were obsessed with Gorner's grunts as kids. <laughs> They're the funniest books ever. <laughs> That'll go over well. Professor, we cited a pop-up book for eight-year-olds as our primary source. I should be out there with the girls. I need you as lookout. We all serve the mission in different ways. Right. Every moment is teachable. Cut the sarcasm, Snapdragon. And if Caraway is referring to the asserted physical bullying, as is the case if Parnell is to be believed, then that begs the question how come Cal isn't already suspended? It would be more effective if we actually saw the bullies being bullies. That way we just might empathize with the plight of the oppressed. A single proper Nelson Muntz moment would at least paint the proper picture so that the narrative isn't all over the place when it comes to morality and standards. If anything, every time Cal and Violence interact on screen, Cal is on the receiving end of it, either being threatened or outright abused. The show's agenda is blatantly clear. Cal is an icky toxic masculine hetero man, so he can act as the punching bag, fuck off, and die in a ditch as far as the show cares. Snapdragon is part of the alphabet community, therefore he gets special treatment. Caraway knows this from a narrative standpoint, as in he read the script, and adjusts his own conduct accordingly. And I can prove this. Here's an interesting clip from episode 9. Cousin Anise, Allo, this is my friend Snapdragon. Nice to meet you. Look at that costume. Amazing, Snapdragon. I absolutely love it. It's nice to see you looking so happy. Thank you. That statement makes no sense without the meta-knowledge about Snapdragon's transitioning arc. These two have not exchanged a single word of dialogue prior to this moment. Happy? Compared to what? Caraway isn't even one of Snap's primary teachers. He is on the warrior track and Caraway is a magic teacher. The writing is trying to foreshadow future events. Except that this is not foreshadowing, this is jumping ahead. The authors are salivating so hard about this scene that they just can't help themselves. It would be silly and hilarious if it wasn't so forced and pathetic. Back to here and now, Snapdragon shares his sad, tragic, feel sorry for me backstory. His violent outburst is justified because his family was mean to him. Are we ever going to hear anything of the sort for Cal? What's his tragic backstory? He doesn't have one, because he doesn't matter, because every icky toxic masculine hetero man is a monster, who was simply born a monster, and can never become anything but said monster, unless they cut off that pesky icky toxic masculine hetero man dick. I take your little thing, see? I put it into this little hole here, and nip the tip. Now let's see that flashback. 
Give us your best show. Reveal all the horror Snap has gone through so that he ended up so wounded and brooding and violent and deserving of our sympathy. Yaro. Give me the river, buddy. What? <laughs> <laughs> you sound like a girl. No, 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 no. Where's the real clip? This can't be real. The show is fucking with me. Oh, you are actually serious. You actually want me to take this seriously. The mean older brother tormenting the cutesy innocent Pokemon while grinning like a supervillain and taunting the poor helpless Snap. <laughs> you sound like a girl! No, he really does not. He sounds like a boy pretending to cry. Considering that Snap has to cry not once, but twice in this episode, it would have been pertinent to give the voice actor a couple more takes, or just send them back to school. This is just embarrassing. <laughs> I wish to remind everyone that this was written, edited, greenlit, and acted out by a bunch of adult professional people and targeted to a mature audience. Get that Saturday morning nonsense off my face, you talentless retards. No, don't! What's this, sons of Hawthorne? To the show's credit, to alleviate the absolute cringe, we are introduced to Barnan, the most magnificent character of the show. Just look at that ridiculous exaggerated lumberjack physique. Look at that bush. Look at that steel in his gaze. Can you just feel how his presence triggers every insecure wimp with daddy issues daring to lay eyes on him? I took Snap's dumb pet. You let Yaro take your pet. Snapdragon, I have something you want. Take it from me. Come on, boy! <laughs> Good! If he takes what's yours, react! Boy! Spend less time with pets, and more time sparring with your brothers. We'll make a warrior out of you yet! <laughs> Are you kidding me? This baby is off the charts! But in all seriousness, the lesson Hawthorne is trying to teach his son is solid. Albeit his approach is less than ideal. He should correct the older brother for stomping on the weak. That's not sparring, that's just being a dick. That's a mistake on his part. And as for Snap himself, he clearly isn't the type of person to fully understand a common sense example. So a better approach would have been to break down the message and explain it. Allow me. Violence will always exist. There will always be bad people who wish to hurt you and your loved ones to rob away the things that are most precious to you. So, you have to be ready to fight for those things. You have to be strong, not only physically, but also mentally. You have to steal your mind and be ready to act when the call to action presents itself. Because if you just curl up and cry, and suck your thumb, and stick the other thumb up your ass, then you will end up with nothing. This is not only about physical conflict, mind you, but life in general. Strength is not just about the muscle. That's the core message. It's not the message the writers are trying to give. Their message with this scene is merely, Oh, look at that masculine man being toxic and violent and teaching his boys to be toxic and violent. But disregarding the agenda of the show, that is the actual message Hawthorne's lesson implies. And Snapdragon has learned none of it. His violence is not in service of protecting someone. His violence is him being a little bitch and throwing a hissy fit because someone dared to speak the truth at his face. It's weak, it's self-interested, it's actually toxic. 
but that is something Snap has learned on his own by misinterpreting his father's intent. Cal disrespected me. You wanted Cal's respect, but what you got was his fear. They are not the same thing. Caraway manages to drool out a single proper statement out of his agenda-driven mouth. Good on him. Except the show does not agree with him. Snap continues to shut down Cal with fear in the following episode. New magic users, draw your terror spheres. Who put you in charge? I did. You got a problem? No, no problem. I just wanted to know. Again, violence is bad unless the one oppressing others with threats of violence happens to be part of the favored group of people. That is the show's idea of justice, hypocrites, each and every single one of you. In my experience, there's more than one path to becoming a respected warrior. If you've chosen the violent, reactive path, then we're at an impasse. <laughs> it's like she's fucking five! Hey, dipshit, every single justifiable act of violence is reactive. Or do you live in some kind of minority report society where people get sentenced for crimes they haven't even committed yet? By definition, violence is reactive. It's a response to a desire, you absolute fool. Unless you wish to expand on that statement in some way, that set of words is gibberish. Every time this show tries to comment on violence in any way, it's empty nonsensical posing. But all of this talk about aggression is nothing but sophistry from the self-satisfied 100% female so stunning and brave writing room. An appetizer of absurdity, easing in towards the actual intent of this storyline. I don't think that changing course would be so easy for me. Why not? I am not like my father or my brothers. Changing course wouldn't be easy for you. Because you are unlike your family. Fuck me, could no one be bothered to revise the script so that the lines spoken back to back make some modicum of sense? Non sequitur garbage dialogue, someone was paid to do this. I hate being big. Well then it's a good thing that you aren't? My boxy shoulders and this? What are you talking about? Your shoulders and chin are the exact same as every single character in this show. Do the writers not know what their characters look like? My dad had a full beard by the time he was 12. I don't want that. I want smooth skin and smaller hands. Your hands are the exact same size as Rosemary. What the hell is this twink talking about? And if you are after smooth skin... Then I'm sorry that your genetics have dealt you with freckles. Is... Is Snapdragon a self-hating ginger? I don't know, it's like... The girls... They look so strong and beautiful as mermaids. I want... I want to be a warrior like that. The problem with you is, you're completely delusional. You heard it straight from the source. What Snap wants is literally a fantasy. Let's lay this out nice and clean. This, all of this, does not exist. I'm not talking about the mermaid part, I'm talking about the whole warrior woman who still looks like a tiny, fairy-like, feminine, cutie ball trope. That does not exist. You cannot be a warrior like that. Physical prowess takes muscle mass. I can't believe this is something that has to be explained to anyone. But apparently too much cartoons and anime and Marvel movies have completely destroyed the average person's view on reality. Sorry to break your fantasies, but if you take the average boy and the average girl, let me just underline that, there we go. If you take the average boy and the average girl, give them the same training, same equipment, and pit them against one another for a fight to the death, the boy is going to murder the girl every single time. Now, fiction is fiction, fantasy is fantasy, 
empowerment fantasy and action stories in general operate on an allegorical basis. It's not so much about literal physique, because suspension of disbelief and all that. The point of these kinds of simple shounen-esque hero stories is the idealization of fighting for the sake of others and the virtues that you believe in. That's the baseline, that's the universal core of all these stories in some capacity. It's the willingness to risk your own life for others, rather than whether or not you can realistically do it. <laughs> I'm the girl with the gall. But of course you are. And it's not just about girls versus boys, it's the same thing with children versus adults. It's just as ridiculous to pit a 14-year-old against an adult fighter and expect it to end up in any other way than a one-sided pummel fest. Yet, fiction often has differing ideas. That is why some kind of superpowers are introduced in so many action stories to even out the playing field. But at that point, the story enters the realm of allegory the messages are not literal. This is why so many stories with female leads nowadays fail so hard. The narrative tries to assert that women can literally do anything men can, except the only way they can do everything that men can is by having some variety of plot magic on their side. The message is in dissonance with the plot, and thus it doesn't function as it should. You cannot have the message of you can do anything if the way to achieve this is literal magic. And as for that altruistic hero stuff I just mentioned, stories like this, High Guardian shite included, don't give a rat's ass about any of that. The writer's idea of being powerful is doing whatever the hell you please with no accountability. To them, strength isn't something to strive for so that you can do good for others. It's about being cool, hedonistic, egotistical, hollow. And this is the point where this show absolutely fucks up its own narrative, because you cannot mix allegorical and literal messages. You can either be a warrior with boxy shoulders and strong physique, or you can be someone with more petite frame. But at that point you have to go looking for another calling. You cannot have both at the same time. And this is not locked to any kind of male-female dichotomy. As I said, averages are averages, but the potential of people is diverse. Males can be many things, while still being male, and females can be many things, while still being female. Males can be strong, males can be frail, females can be strong, females can be frail. However, you can only be one of those opposite things at once. Snapdragon wants to be frail and strong at the same time. That is an oxymoron. His desires are delusional. The writers are delusional. And if Snap wants to change himself physically in any way, he can just put on a ring, drink a potion. There is no way that any person with their cognitive functions intact could ever witness the girls turning into mermaids right before their eyes and still miss something this obvious. Transformation magic, like any other brand of sorcery, is not rare. It is readily available in multiple forms. I already went over this, but the fact that body modification and being trans is not already commonplace in this universe is an utterly ridiculous notion. The show is trying to tell a story about Snapdragon realizing he is trans, straight-faced, as it would function in our reality, 
But at the same time, the show is also doing the fucking attack helicopter meme. They told me I could become anything, so I became a mermaid. And now I'm also going to eat this tasty bowl of hot cold ice cream. It is mental. This entire storyline is a joke. The writers are so far up their own ass and sniffing their own farts. They are so high on their shite that they don't even realize what they are doing. They are turning this very serious story, which they want you to take very seriously, into a parody of itself. But you can't change what you were born into. Snapdragon, listen. You say I can change paths, but it's not like I can just stop being a guy. Oh shit, he said the magic words, you guys. Now look at Caraway instantly pounce on that like a cat that freshly caught cod. Do you know anything about transition magic? You can just sense the writing team frothing at the mouth. One of us, one of us. Let's review the facts. Snapdragon is clearly traumatized by his childhood. He hates physical masculine traits because he associates those traits to his male family members who were mean to him. Part of that is him being a dumbass and unable to realize what his father was teaching him. And part of it is the family being cartoonish meatheads, as dictated by the incompetent writers. I would actually have liked to see Snapdragon's mother at some point, just to see what her part is in the family dynamic. But that might have given complexity to the issue, so that's obviously a no-go for the show, conveniently never even mentioned. In any case, Snap is horrified by the notion of ever resembling his father or his brothers in any way, physically. Now this trauma is reinforced, as his crush hammers in that boys are emotionally stunted, and girls are so much deeper and better, making Snap hate his existence as a boy even more. Further fuel to the fire is poured as Sage screams her pants on the spot when she sees Snap dressed as a girl. Snap thirsts for Sage, and Sage gives him positive attention when he presents himself as a girl. So being a girl seems like quite the fantastic prospect, all things considered. Snapdragon? Hey, Sage. It was Amaryllis' idea. As a side note, Amaryllis was apparently the one to suggest the costume originally, not as a joke, but because Snap is fabulous. I... I shouldn't have worn this. Snap! You're a fabulous mermaid goddess challenger and, 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 and you're great! Again, important people in his life pushing him towards certain ideals. Now aside from all that, Snap also lives in an academy where every boy is either a mumbling wimpy freak and friends with all the girls or is just like his brothers and outright hated by everyone. So no wonder Snap doesn't wish to associate himself in any way with masculinity or rather the straw man version of masculinity this show is presenting. If the show is to be believed, boys are just the worst. Except if they are in fact secretly girls. Snapdragon is obviously not all there between the ears. He launches into violent fury because someone stated truths in a mocking tone that is completely unhinged behavior. Part of this is because of his experiences, but some of it is also due to the fact that he is in fact a stupid teenager. And the average teenager is already absolutely retarded. So being a stupid retard is just a whole another level of brain rot. Seriously, the reason we have certain laws in place, age limits and such, is to protect young people from their own stupidity. Snapdragon is clearly not capable of making rational decisions, 
His hormones and traumas are in full tempest mode in that developing head of his. Or as Sage would put it. Everything in here, it's just anxious and chaos almost always. So the show itself admits that teenagers are guided by their out of control emotional side instead of rationale. But at the same time, the show tells us that it is a good idea to tell a traumatized, developing person that the way to feel better about themselves is to stop being a boy and become a girl instead. How about no? Snapdragon is so stupid that he wants Sage as his girlfriend. Think about that. Snap wants to finger bang that. He does not possess the mental capacity to handle any kind of serious decision. He isn't even close to reaching that point. I wouldn't trust this person to decide which kind of vegan burger he wants from the local fantasy McDonald's. Throwing aside the ridiculous magical horseshit, because that is not how things work in reality. In reality, there are consequences for body alteration, it involves hormones and mutilation, irreversible acts upon your body. But this is the kind of conduct that this show is asserting as desirable, telling a mentally unstable child that the way to feel better about themselves is to alter their physical body. The first thing, not after referring them to appropriate counseling, not after working through their traumas, so that their ideals about the world and themselves are assuredly in perfect order. Nope. First thing, become a girl. I I had no idea that that what did you call it? Transition magic. <laughs> I didn't know that it existed. It's like you get to become yourself, your your true self. But it seems exhausting and and what would my family say? Would they still even want to be my family? Snapdragon, you have time to figure it out. There are so many paths to becoming your true self, and this one is mine. I'm not saying that it's yours. There are always more options than you think. Good. At least there's some self-awareness. Let's just put this verbal shrug here, so we don't get called groomers. Oh, you don't have to do the thing I suggested. There are so many ways to become your true self. But you should totally do the thing I suggested. Wink, wink. The events on screen suggest that Snap is casting away his boyhood to become something else. So this wishy-washiness gains you nothing. You already did what you did. Your game is clear as day. Thanks, Professor Caraway, for actually listening. Now, it's time for you to head back to the Academy. I'll summon you a boat. Uh, I'm not in trouble anymore? <laughs> well, that's up to you. Mm. Obviously, finding your true self doesn't involve any kind of soul-searching, humbleness, actually bettering yourself, admitting that your mistakes are in fact mistakes, and you can't just keep blaming the world for the fact that you yourself are a shitty person. Nope, none of that pesky responsibility. There's nothing wrong with you. You are perfect as you are. It's just the shell that's all wrong. Not your ideals, not your soul. The physical aesthetic is the thing that's wrong. The appearance is all that matters. That's what defines a person. What a petulant, self-indulgent, insane ideology. If you offer this kind of out to a pathological person, from a position of authority no less, it's going to imprint on them instantly. A person who compulsively places the fault for all their troubles on the people around them, and the universe for dealing them a shitty hand, is not looking to improve themselves, they are seeking anything that absolves them of all accountability. Admitting that you have to improve is mentally taxing. Working on oneself is a path that lasts a lifetime. 
but it has to start somewhere. The point of counseling is not to coddle the person in need of help, but to pinpoint the cause for their irrational behavior and work towards ways to shed those patterns. Immediately shifting the issue from mind to skin achieves nothing. All that this solution is going to do is embolden Snap to continue operating in the way he currently does. Every trouble he'll ever face will be someone else's fault. Nothing is on him. He doesn't have to improve. He is never wrong. Reality is wrong. Reality must change. This kind of thinking will ultimately leave him and everyone around him miserable. And cultivating someone's harmful behavior like this is irresponsible to a malicious degree. Caraway is a narcissistic sociopath. He found his happiness in a specific way, so obviously the person in front of him will also find theirs in the same manner. And since the creator is talking to us directly through their self-insert, I have no qualms about extending that description to them as well. And if anyone honestly thinks that there is nothing iffy going on here, even after I just broke down this retardation unambiguously, then I can't help you. You are a lost cause. Go stick your head back into the same blender you used to slurry up your brain. All of this is the show's crowning jewel of failure. Beyond all the other stupid crap, broken storytelling, horrible characters doing idiotic things, dialogue written by toddlers, embarrassing production, even worse than any of that, this is what seals the deal and makes this show utterly worthless. Specifically, the writers have failed in their stated goal. It's a very modern reflection of the world. Our characters are really diverse, our cast is really diverse, and that's one of the things that excited me the most about it. We are 50% female in all the creative roles, and our writer's room is 100% female. The creator's prime intent is to offer positive representation to groups of people not getting their due screen time in media, allegedly, especially women, especially alphabet people, Except that every character in the show is some variety of pathetic, selfish, idiotic, violent, hypocritical, delusional, borderline psychotic, piece of human garbage. Who the hell would ever wish to be represented by these kinds of people? The show isn't helping anyone, it's not offering positive role models. The show has done nothing but give yet another reason for anyone with half a brain to mock these whiny imbeciles for being talentless and having their entire personality consist of nothing but their victim complex. This show is reinforcing every negative stereotype people might have about the alphabet people. Half of Caraway's existence is him talking about his sex life and gender identity and the other half is him being incompetent at his job. Snapdragon is an idiotic ball of angst and rage and lust, blaming everyone else but himself for his problems. And then we have the main culprit himself crying on Twitter about getting dragged into the culture war. You pathetic weasel shit! Who do you think started all this? You were the one who made this garbage heap with the intent of selling your idiotic ideals to the audience, promoting yourself as the greatest creature who ever walked this earth, and bashing one side in the culture war while elevating the other. No one dragged you in, you placed yourself there. You and the rest of your gang of retarded inbred wolverines are doing the exact same thing as every single modern day pop culture author who is gifted a prepaid platform to speak their moronic mind. Your art is soulless, it's propaganda, with writing and production befitting such. And guess what, just like everyone else who tries this, you failed to a hilarious degree, you haven't helped your cause, you've only made the people you claim to represent look like insane clown people. You 
and people of your ilk are actively creating bigotry by normalizing the fact that alphabet representation is synonymous with incompetence. That is on you. And that is not my view, by the by, not even close. But that's the effect this kind of art is having on the world at large. How about we just move away from all this horseshit, stop focusing so much on identity, and shoving that identity down everyone's throats, and just tell stories. That's all I want, just cohesive storytelling, starring whoever the fuck you choose. Just write something that isn't 100% retarded, and it'll get far kinder reception. I can promise you that. In any case, Snap is trans, huzzah, the arc is complete, everything is sunshine and rainbows, right after one more brief snippet of laughable drama. You've been so quiet. Are you okay? My wrist feels like it's on fire. Yeah, this amount of wanking will do that. Want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? <gasps> <laughs> Snap? <laughs> I like your nails. Would you still like me if if I painted my nails? Only if you promise to stick to flattering colors. Be serious. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Snap. I'm here for you forever, no matter what. Whatever's going on, it will be okay. And you wanna know what's real funny? This sniffling is placed in between the main gang crying over the death of the dragon. The drama of a literal death is interrupted for this. Because these two things are of equal importance in the minds of the creators. Fuck this. I'm almost done. One more to go. Just one more to go. It's been a long journey, but here we are. The season, excuse me, series finale. Something like that should in and of itself carry serious hype. Every plotline comes together, all setups are paid off, one more test for the heroes, one last epic clash between the forces of justice and villainy, followed by a bittersweet farewell to the cast we've grown to adore along our shared time. That would be something to expect in a competent story, but this is high guardian shite. The one, the only, the meme, the legend. So all I'm expecting at this point is one last crescendo of absolute madness. Come on, show. Do your worst. The villains make their decisive move and launch an attack on the High Guardian Academy to wipe out anyone privy to their existence and in the know about the rot. Take care not to draw attention to yourselves or oh, which country. Leave no one to tell the tale. The top priority is not to draw attention, so the best course of action is once again to signal your existence as obviously as possible by bringing in an unhinged murder aficionado with all the restraint and subtlety of cookie monster in a biscuit buffet. Ah, but I'm getting ahead of myself. You may be wondering where Olive has been hiding for the last couple of episodes. And the answer is quite simple. At the Academy, right under the hero's noses, same as before. The villains know exactly how retarded the heroes are. They know that no one will notice the black cat sneaking around, even though that would be the one thing every single one of their enemies would be laser focused on, since that's what it says in the script. Olive is just free to camp out at the attic, move about in broad daylight, sneak inside dorms, read Rosemary's diary when she's out murdering dragons. I cannot believe how many dogs Rosemary drew in her diary. 
That makes way more sense. Swords. Hundreds of badly drawn swords. Paid and produced comedy gold. So judgy. What are you, my father? Answer me. Meow. Ah, <sighs> just checking. Wait. Kino is a cat, right? Like a cat cat. Just a cat. And Olive is someone who can shift between her cat form and human form using her Terra Sphere. But is she originally a human or a cat? She did ask if Kino fucked her mom. Or is Kino a man originally? Someone who is cursed to live as a cat or something? I honestly can't make heads or cat tails about any of this. Oh, I know it's a joke, but since the gag falls flat like all the rest, my mind immediately drifts to the logistics of the world instead. And speaking of kitty-related business, where is Neppy Cat during all this? Shouldn't he be on the lookout for suspicious feline activity around the academy, same as before? Well, that's the thing. Neppy disappears from the show outright after episode 9. The bandstand is the last we see of him. My theory is that he got caught up with the wrong kind of crowd after too much merrymaking, and some sick spinster ended up making all their fantasies into reality by turning him into a Hulk-sized sex ornament in their apartment smelling like cat piss. It rubs the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. No! Moving along. Due to Olive's incompetence as an assassin, the faction of evil sent in the tactical genius known as Mandrake. The job is simple, Olive points out everyone who knows about the rot, Mandrake sneaks up on them, shishka pops them, easy peasy, the lemonade is already in the glass. And yet, the show manages to make everything needlessly complicated. Again. For some reality mangling brain diarrhea, everyone in this show is a fucking retard reason. The villains stand up on the balcony, just observing the goings on, in clear view of anyone who happens to look outside through the enormous windows. And for some reason, the dumbass duo are wearing school uniforms. What exactly is the point of the disguise? Think about it. Use a single fraction of a second to actually process the happenings on screen. This is a highly exclusive, specialized academy with a tiny student count. New students are made into a huge deal. Everyone knows everyone by face. What are these disguises going to accomplish when anyone laying eyes on them will only have questions about who the hell they actually are? If confronted by either student or teacher, the school uniform disguise will fail instantly, since teachers know exactly who their pupils are, and the students will be intrigued by the new arrivals, ask around, and get suspicious, since no one has any idea where these two came from. Or at least that's how things would turn out in any reality where every single character doesn't use their skull as a storage room for their supply of nuts for the upcoming winter. It would actually be less conspicuous if these two dressed up as normal. That way, they could pass off as graduated guardians on a visit. Or something like that. Why is Olive standing there out in the open in her human form anyway? It's not like she needs to physically point out the girls to Mandrake. Every single target can be described with Skittles colors. There is no reason for Olive to be present for the mission. She is only a liability. If any of the girls get even a glance at her, all hell will break loose. And Mandrake has the ability to shapeshift into anyone, by the by. He could just waltz in and stab everyone disguised as a member of the Triad. Who are all out of town. Something the villain should be aware of. Since they have Olive stationed at the academy for the specific purpose of espionage. It's so obvious, so simple and clean. Mandrake's spell activates in an instant, requires no Terra Sphere, nor old magic runes. Actually, that goes for most of his spells, 
Half of the time the magic just poofs into reality and other times Mandrake whips out a Terra Sphere. So that's yet another inconsistency. They just keep coming and coming and coming and coming and start coming and they don't stop coming and they don't stop coming and they don't stop coming. Once again, the villains have a laughably simple victory just handed to them, and yet they immediately start bumbling towards their inevitable doom. Mandrake decides to troll Rosemary, masquerades her mom, and lures her into a trap. The tactical genius assassin just stands out in the open as THE High Guardian Lavender, the most famous person in all the academy. Does the Triumvirate hire every single one of their underlings from some kind of special needs program? And of course none of the teens notice the fully armor clad celebrity guardian, except for Rosemary, the specific target. Because everyone in this school is either blind, or moron, or that's just what it says in the script. I... I knew you were alive! Where were you? Are you okay? I want to tell you everything, but later. There are enemies in the school. And you can't tell anyone that I'm back. Well, not even my friends. I tell them everything. I tell them... Not even them. Now. Tell me what you and your friends know about the rot. Was that what your mission was about? Ours, too. Well, unofficially. Do you know what's causing it? No. <gasps> Do you know? It's my mission to find out. Wait, so have you been on this mission the whole time? Or other missions, too? Later, Rosemary. Who else knows about it? Well, Sage. Oh, she's gonna want to see you. Oh, and Time and Parsley. You have to meet them. I look forward to it. Go on. Uh, Snapdragon and Amaryllis, well, maybe our enemies in Witch Country, and something called the Triumvirate. They're after us. For some reason, Mandrake starts grilling Rosemary about who else knows about the rot. Why? Olive should already know everyone who knows. That's the whole reason to have her around. If Mandrake is going to do Olive's job for her, then there was never any reason to keep her alive after her first failure back at the festival. But basically, the plot reason for this conversation, instead of instant stabity stab, is to build up tension. Oh my goodness, is the villain who was introduced five whole minutes ago seriously going to kill the protagonist? We can always hope. But I know in my heart of hearts that's not going to happen. Oh, Professor Caraway. Professor Caraway? Yeah, your best friend Caraway. I saw him writing about it in his journal. And, well, who knows who else he told? You should ask him. Mom? Mom! Where'd you go? Somehow this is new information. Olive has been reading Rosemary's diary. Has she not written anything about the dragon incident? About who was involved? How Caraway did all that he could, which was basically fuck all, and that she was forced to end the creature's suffering? Nothing? Is the diary just about shit doodles and hundreds of badly drawn swords? Yes, that. Anyway, how convenient is it? That Mandrake just so happened to postpone the stabbing just long enough that Rosemary could share this vital info with him. First the tactical genius grills all the info he can get out of the target, then he goes in for the kill, then the target suddenly remembers new information, and instead of grilling them some more... Are you sure that this is the last person on the list? No one else knows? Are you absolutely sure? There's not an entire community of merfolk who got their beloved friend killed because of the rot. Nothing silly like that. He just vanishes to trails unknown and leaves the current job unfinished. The point was to keep low profile. And now one of the targets is left very much alive and on high alert because of your obviously suspicious behavior. Or at least they would be on high alert, if this was anyone except Rosemary, the densest heroine I've ever witnessed. All of this is so utterly contrived that it actually hurts my soul. 
I don't believe for a second that Rosemary wouldn't recognize her mom for a fake. This woman is her obsession. It's the one thing that defines her. Her alleged bond to her mother. The rewrite is obvious. Rosemary figures out the deception right away. Something Lavender says is off. She misremembers conversations between her and Rosemary. The way she acts is iffy. The contrast would of course require Lavender to actually have a personality, beyond woman with a sword, but you get what I mean. If Rosemary saw through the ruse, played it cool, and managed to escape from Mandrake, thus foiling his initial plan, that would actually work as a satisfactory payoff for the constant mentions about Lavender. Of course the heroine recognizes the fake mom in front of her, are you kidding? In a perfect world, a moment like that could even be quite sweet, or badass, depending which way the writer decides to have it play out. As it currently is, the scene only further portrays the main heroine as a worthless airhead. Nothing about this is suspicious. Suddenly your mom is back, suddenly she disappears. She herself told you that there are enemies on the school grounds. Excellent tactical choice there by the way, you goddamn idiot. And still she abandons you. None of this makes you the least bit concerned. For fuck's sake, your mom reacted to the mention of Professor Caraway as if she'd never even heard the name before. Are you actually this retarded? But it doesn't matter anyway, because Rosemary immediately tells the rest of the girls that her mom is back. Even though she specifically told her not to. Where have you been? Oh, I... I'm not allowed to tell you. You have my full attention. Since when do you keep secrets? Since my... Rose? I can't tell you. Rose! I cannot Rose. listen to this all day. Parsley, gospel, or gauntlet? Gauntlet! Okay. Tickle Rose until she spills the beans. <laughs> I saw my mom! Wait, you did? Are you joking? Where is she? I, I don't know. I mentioned Caraway. She disappeared. <gasps> Caraway's office! Think about it. The villain assumes that the heroine respects their parents enough to be able to keep an important secret. But this is Rosemary. And she is... She is a special kind of hero. The girls head to Caraway's office, where Mandrake meets them in the guise of Professor Tex-Mex. And as one might guess, the tactical genius forgets the number one rule of shapeshifter infiltration. Always make sure that the original is dealt with, so that they don't just suddenly walk in, and you end up with this hackneyed Mexican standoff. And just to underline how first drafted this script is, these two scenes happen right after the other. Absolutely nothing is gained by the first scene, except for the entire cast once again coming off as morons. Nothing transpires between Rosemary not realizing Mandrake's ruse and him getting found out anyway, so there is no reason why these two events couldn't be combined. Just have the girls walk in the office on whatever pretense, homework or something, build the tension with the fake caraway instead of lavender, and the rest of the scene can unfold exactly the same. That way, what little shreds of authenticity Rosemary's character has left will remain intact, and the villains won't seem quite so incompetent. Streamlining is good whenever your story can afford it. But when your show is 70% filler anyway, I guess proper use of screen time never was a priority. Who is the real Caraway? Sage, fire on the first one of us that moves. He's trying to manipulate you. Be cautious. Pop quiz, what epic monster were you fighting when Flowering Thorn broke? <laughs> nice. See, he doesn't know. Disarm him. Answer the question. I don't know, a dragon. Yeah! This is a concussive blast. Why would the assassin, whose goal is to assassinate everyone, ever use a concussive blast when his primary method of attack are sharp, 
Lethal Magical Blades. Plot armor doesn't cut it at this point. This is a plot wall. Anyway, the villain is exposed. It's done. The evil forces have failed. Again. Unless Mandrake kills everyone in this room. Right now, which is highly unlikely. There is absolutely no way this farce can continue. Go after him. Go after him. Go after him. Why aren't you going after him? Stop him. Go after the villain. Stop talking and chase him. Stop talking, you idiots. There is a murderous villain on the loose. He is literally going to kill everyone. Why are you still talking? Stop. Stop it. Shut the fuck up and go after the villain. I can't believe you are still talking. Who wrote this? You all deserve to die horribly. At this point, the heroes and villains are just competing for the title of Apex Retard. Stop talking, you useless cunts, and do your job. Don't alert the other students. I'll gather the teachers. You girls, stay together. Don't engage and don't alert the other students. Don't alert the students. Everyone just saw you mega lasering some rando through the window. And you utter muppet actually believe that the entire school isn't going to be alarmed whether you want it or not. Not to mention that this crisis would already be over if you had just done your job. And Caraway sends the girls away to do fuck all while he alone organizes the teachers to catch Mandrake. No, you endless tempest of brain farts. The girls are the only ones you can trust at this point. You can be sure that none of them are the enemy. Anyone else might be the shapeshifter at this point. You have to move as a group. Keep taps on one another so that you maintain your advantage and make sure the enemy won't get the drop on you. Splitting up is the dumbest thing you could possibly do. You don't have to be a genius to figure this stuff out. This is so simple even a toddler could handle it. The dumb just won't stop coming and coming and coming and coming and After all this time, I'm still struggling to accept that this is the actual standard of writing we are dealing with. It honestly feels like a fever dream. No one stopped this from happening. No one thought this needed fixing. Every single person working on this story is an insane moron. Your head must be filled with sewage to look at this fuckness and notice nothing wrong with it. Absolutely no event leads logically to the next. And every single hero is a despicable, negligent, glue-sniffing, lollygagging, infuriating nincompoop. I'm unironically rooting for the villains to murder everyone. The protagonist, her extended gaggle of fools, and this whole ludicrous academy are too stupid to exist. They do not deserve the air flowing through their lungs. If you manage to write characters that bring out this amount of loathing from the audience, you know you've created something truly special. So what happens next? Now that the villains are allowed to escape, yet again, exactly what you think. Everything goes to shit. Caraway called the poker game early this week, huh? There is zero reason for anyone to say this at this point. The teachers have clearly been gathered up for some time already. This is the first comment anyone would make. No one would wait till the cards are dealt to state this fact. This is not how people interact. This is yet again, as you know, writing, and it's the quickest way to pinpoint whether the writer respects their audience. Never allow these kinds of lines to slip into the final draft. Exposition can be made engaging with skillful dialogue. Must be because the triad is away on their secret mission. Well, at least it gives me the opportunity to clean you out, Red Bud. Bring it on, honey. You'll be going home wearing a potato sack tonight. Sorry for keeping you all waiting. I've brought a special brew to toast the end of the term. Uh -huh. Shots, no, everyone? Say no to that. It's been a good run. 
I thought I asked for poison. We're not supposed to draw attention. If you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. Do not trust Olive for anything. She is a pussy in both senses of the word. And would you look at that? Caraway gets captured and dragged all the way to the basement somehow without anyone noticing. The show doesn't even bother to show how the villains managed to defeat him. Olive glares at him in the office. And now they are here. Offensively lazy storytelling. Attention students of High Guardian Academy. Your attendance is required at the Forge for a mandatory assembly. Any students who are absent will risk failing the term. The school has an intercom system. Or there is some kind of spell equivalent. That might have been useful for alerting the teachers. There is a shape-shifting assassin on the loose. Stop drinking and gambling on school grounds, you useless pint brains. And help me catch them. Do not trust anyone. Why would he call students to the- It's not, Caraway. Let's get our weapons. No, 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 no! <coughs> I'm... I'm doing my best to remain calm. If you know that it's a trap, because it is obviously a trap, then why are you letting all of your friends and fellow students walk straight into the trap? You have no way of knowing that Mandrake is going to pull a Bond villain moment and lock everyone inside a slow cooking death trap. For all you know, he will instantly vaporize everyone, as well as he should. You allow everyone to walk into their deaths while you go get your weapons. And that's all well and good. Except you also change your attire. You waste precious time getting changed. These costumes give you no advantage in a fight, you senseless paint guzzlers. These are the heroes of our tale. The future guardians of this realm. Looking cool for the final fight is more important than warning everyone about their impending death. This is absolutely abhorrent. These four are disgusting. Their souls are empty. Any normal person would simply follow their instinct and alert everyone about the danger. You wouldn't even think. You would do it as a reflex. Tell us a lot about the people making this crap now, doesn't it? The girls... the girls aren't in there. What? Why? They didn't follow your orders. Boss. How the fuck do you not know that? You stood at the doorway, you can see the entire room from the door. What the hell is this nonsense? Why must every single line uttered by these morons be utterly devoid of logic? Fine, we'll lure them to the library. Cats first. Why? Why the library? Your most effective method of attack are your magical blades. Lure the girls into the open courtyard. That way, you can just snipe them with your magic and end this in an instant. Why would you ever pick a location that is the one place in this whole entire school that gives your enemies the maximum amount of shelter from your projectiles? Tactical genius! No one in, no one out. Because you can just do that, apparently. How about shielding yourself from all attacks coming your way while you're at it? And you know what this sudden suspicious bubble around the academy is going to do? It's going to alert the entire Lingarth. You buffoon! There goes all your secrecy! You are going to have an audience for this mess gathering around the school in minutes. Or at least it would alert everyone. 
If this universe wasn't populated 100% by uncaring imbeciles. The final battle ensues. Rosemary and Time engage Mandrake, while Sage and Parsley try to put out the fires. And I will give this episode a single compliment. These gauntlets are neat. It's a creative idea, like a fantasy version of a fire extinguisher. Just ignore the fact that many times water is the last thing you wish to splash on open flames. As is the case with oil fires and chemical fires and stuff like that. Simplistic cartoon logic. And it's also stupid that the library has this, but the one place in the academy where students work with open flames constantly, the forge, doesn't have them. But still, this concept is interesting. It actually takes something that's been established before and expands on it. I assume the gauntlets work on spark spells, since Parsley is able to use them no problem. I bet that the official fire department also has these, since they are powerful and nimble to use and are you fucking kidding me? Never mind. Not much to say about the battle itself. It's action, this is High Guardian shite. That equals random sweating, and absolutely no one using their abilities to their full extent. Surprise, motherfucker! You already had her, just get in close before attacking, moron. And spam that Giga Blade, you have no reason not to, just slice up everything until your enemies are mincemeat. And just to inform anyone out there interested in writing cohesive action, do not give anyone the reflexes to deflect arrows. If someone is actually that fast and agile, they are superhuman and they are going to win every single battle they are in. Stylized action is one thing, but this is just ridiculous tryhard edgelord bullshit. It's laughably lame and impossible to take seriously. Where are you? Where are you? Come find me! <laughs> Time, that wasn't me! My first crush, meet by the books that start with the first letter of his dumb name. Clever, Rose. Well... A for Aster. Nice plan. Except that this is not how libraries organize their books. They are organized by category. There are several shelves with books that start with the letter A. Subtle self-reporting from the writer. Maybe browse some actual books once in your life before putting your own pen to the paper, is all I'm saying. You keep him talking. I'll track his voice. So, shapeshifter, what's your favorite color? Uh, do you like cheesecake? What's your name, anyway? Nothing personal, kid. <laughs> For Mandrake. Not as dumb as A for Aster. I'm sorry, kid. I read your diary. Oh, and by the way, you draw swords like dogs. Hey! Always make callbacks to strong material. The fight turns in the girl's favor for good once Olive finally decides to betray Mandrake. <laughs> Mandrake, let me do it. Really? Why the change of heart? You were right about me. I've been a mess to attach to these four. It's time to free myself. Ah, okay. Use my knife. You actually believe that? You said before that all you need is for us to go with you to witch country. I'll do it. There's no need to kill anyone. Mandrake, my plan can still work. If we put out the fires, take the girls, nobody has to die. Don't be so naive. Maybe take your own advice. Olive has been cross with you this entire time, constantly whining how killing people is evil, aiding people looking to spread destruction and kill people on the other hand is fine and dandy, but whatever. Fine, but this is grog shit and you know be a good little kitty, and do what I tell you to do. Can't wait to kill him. Ugh, oh, what is wrong with you? What's wrong with you? This is my job. You can't! You can't! And why can't I, huh? She is obviously going to betray you. And why isn't time dead already? 
Why is she a hostage? You are going to kill everyone anyway. Seriously, the only way for these incompetent heroes to win is for the villains to be utterly brain deficient. I also love the fact that Rosemary just stands back and does absolutely nothing while her friend is about to get gutted. <coughs> The fight escalates as the newly reformed heroic quintet combine their strength to take down the enemy. Mandrake is no match for the power of friendship and plot armor, so he is forced to retreat outside, with a broom he apparently pulled out of his ass. The primary bestest ever duo take to the skies along with Olive, and leave the secondary duo to sit on the bench for the rest of the match. Lots of flash, not a lot of substance. There's nothing to be excited about. I don't care about any of these characters. I know the heroes are safe. I know the villain is going to lose. So just get it over with. As a desperation move, Mandrake unleashes this massive blast, which once again doesn't kill anyone, just pushes them away. It's powerful enough to crush a brick chimney, but all the girls are fine. And somehow it doesn't affect the caster themselves? From that distance? That is not how explosions work. This is so lame. If the action doesn't follow any kind of consistent laws of physics, heightened or realistic, then the entire thing is just going to look silly. Random stuff happening is not exciting or cool or epic or anything of the sort. This kind of combat is the writing equivalent of slamming action figures together. It's childish and frankly embarrassing. Grown ass people made this. And there are actually grown ass people who enjoy this kind of stuff. Sage! I need help! Bruce! Sage! Gravity means nothing in this show. This episode already reinforced that fact. No one is in danger. There are no stakes. This drama is ridiculous. And by the by, cutting your hair is not character development. It's not meaningful. It's a fucking meme. You know what your problem is. You're weak, Olive. Time to die. You know it was him. Uh, lucky guess. Rosemary, don't do this, sweetheart. I love you. This is so boring. What else is on? Now then, Greed. How many times am I going to have to kill you before you stay dead? Count again. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Rushing or dragging? Rushing. So you do know the difference! We've all had bad days. But we learn, and we stick together. If any of you are Pinterested, uh, you can follow my fucking asshole on Twitter. This isn't funny. I'm claustrophobic. Yeah, Cal, my strongest magic glass couldn't open the door. But I'm sure your crying will do the trick. Hey, real. Didn't Caraway close the door on us? Yeah. Olive? Where are the inseparables? Not here. Hello, darkness, my old friend. 
took you this long to notice the second caraway? Really? Do all the characters eyes only see what the camera sees? And how nice of you to go out of your way to mention that the explosion spell is useless here. Now if only you had kept that mindset for the rest of the show. Anyway, the secondary gang of idiots escape from the burning murder room. Amaryllis takes charge. Everyone, shut up! Snap does... something. This might actually work, guys! Alright, Snap, you're up! Okay, everyone, let's move them out! <laughs> In Firing? Also this. Old magics, you have a sigil spell for a protective shield, right? Good. All of you keep the smoke and fire at bay. You got it. Okay. So there is an entire sect of students using old magic. But I thought that Sage was the only one using old magic. And everyone made fun of her for that. Everything this show tells you is a lie. Okay, whoa. You used uh. old and new magic together. A solid foundation in old magic gives one the potential to merge their strengths. A skill you'll learn in time. What am I supposed to say? What is anyone supposed to gather from that? Sage pulled a brand new mega laser out of her ass. Good on her? She already could unleash beams of death. What exactly makes this non-lethal blast so special? There is no consistency when it comes to magic, yet the show makes the dichotomy between the two brands of sorcery into a huge deal. New magic can do anything, it has no drawbacks, until it's suddenly chaotic and hard to master when the plot needs it to be. Old magics are ostracized, even by the teachers, until the show suddenly invents this ridiculous concept that new and old work best together. Why would they? What's the benefit? What does it even mean? There is no actual reasoning behind any of this. No philosophy, it's just muddled horseshit happening without rhyme or reason. Everything just works in whatever way the author wishes at that moment. It is impossible to be invested in anything on screen when the story flow is constantly just and then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens. It's boring garbage sludge. Sage can do something amazing and unique and super smart and only reserved for select few. Who gives a shit? Random anime power-ups? Gotta collect all those tropes and cliches. You know what would have been nice? Had Sage practiced this particular skill throughout the series? Struggle, improvement, success, basic functional storytelling. The potential was set up in the very first episode. Can I hold your Terrasphere? Go ahead. This is gorgeous. Its conjuring powers seem unlimited. I thought it was incompatible with old magic. Aloe's an elf, so her powers merged with mine. Sweetie, she'll learn about new magic and spell theory at school. Let's let them go to bed. The concept is forgotten. Sage never asks about it. And then it's suddenly reintroduced in the finale given no explanation, and the show acts like this is some kind of culmination of Sage's growth as a sorceress. But all this amounts to is empty spectacle. Unspectacular. In the aftermath of the chaos, everything unfolds exactly as you think. No one is hurt, everyone is fine after breathing Noxus gas, no consequences, 
everything is just peachy. And Drake manages to escape. Because of course he does. He was unconscious. Parsley and Time were standing right there at the courtyard. But the writers just want him to escape so badly. And thus reality bends to their whim. The tactical genius sneaks off in the guise of one of the firemen. He was laying right there, close to the forest, practically off the school grounds. So he decided to sneak back towards the school, through the yard, murder one of the firemen, steal their uniform, and then sneak back through the yard to escape. What was Mandrake's trademark magic trick again? Oh yeah, shape-shifting. I couldn't make this shit up even if I tried. Oh, and yes, there is a murdered fireman somewhere. I refuse to accept anything else. Good job, Caraway. Good job, Rosemary. Good job, the rest of you. Your incompetence got some innocent soul killed. But there's no time to mull on that. We got to feel sad for the poor academy going up in flames. This wonderful place where hedonism, callousness, and victimhood are virtues, where the teachers try to actively kill their students on daily basis whenever they aren't coaching the next generation of psychopaths. What a tragic moment this is. And then we have the aftermath of the aftermath. Hold very still. Do you even know how great you are? Rose. You mixed old magic and new magic perfectly. Combining them felt so... right. You know, you're pretty great too. <laughs> nah. Careful! I'm wielding a weapon. Which you do with great competency. I'm serious. You fought out there like a true warrior. You're a natural leader. I... I just wanted to protect the people I love. Rose. We will find her. Together. We will. You are so cool. No, you are so cool. We are both so cool. Yeah, I bet the audience just loves us at this point. We are going to do so much awesome stuff next semester. Winter break starting early. We can use the vacation. Yeah, but I kind of want to get back. I want to learn more, grow stronger, and I think I want to hug my mom. Oh. What? She was stoned last time. I'm gonna hug a plate of Aunt Allo's food. The whole break. <laughs> Cousin, you found time for a haircut? I mean, I value fashion as much as the next woman, and I love how you're looking right now, but... <laughs> it looks great. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, so do your nails. Okay, time to go, Snap. Let's do a quick recap. Rosemary set out to find her mother, never took any steps to find her mother, and has come no closer to finding her mother. Sage set out to learn magic, achieved everything with no trouble, and manifested rare Ultima level skills by simply deciding that she can do that now. Parsley started out by existing, and continues to exist. Time started as a loner, learned that friendship is magic, became a loner once again, and learned that friendship is magic. Again. She also hated her mom, until she didn't. Amaryllis started out as a loud bully, then settled on just loud. Snapdragon used to be angsty, then he painted his nails, and now he's fine. What part of that sounds like a story you would ever wish to see play out in the span of dozen episodes? Absolutely nothing of substance has happened. This entire four hours of animated content has been a waste. To an offensive degree. This barely qualifies as a story. And just as a one final example of this show's philosophy on writing, take a look at this. Daydreaming about cake again? Uh, is class over? Mm-hmm. 
It's the Saipeth, isn't it? He's all I could think about. <sighs> Me too. Him and Olive. Sometimes I miss being a kid when we didn't have to deal with all this stuff. Yeah, but at least we're dealing with it together. Always have, always will. Saying that things are happening is not the same as things actually happening. You can claim that events around you impact you in any number of ways, but if it affects nothing in your character or your view on life, if it does not manifest in you evolving as a person, then it is a lie. Take this to heart, all of you who write, all of you who enjoy stories. Do not accept this deception, do not let any author claim they've offered you something meaningful, when in actuality it's nothing but lame nonsense. Sad piano music is not a substitute for cohesive narrative. The fact that something this utterly empty exists as a fully funded, produced, advertised, commercially distributed product is an insult to anyone looking for entertainment or meaningful storycraft. It is a bad product and a worse story. It is a worthless creation. We had some sick moves yesterday, High Guardian Spice. Because of our names. That's perfect. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Do I have to say it? Okay. Parsley, sage, rosemary and thyme are herbs, not spices. Isn't this the perfect way to cap off this entire journey? One final dose of dumb. Except not quite, because we still have a post credit scene. No story is complete without a post credit scene. The evil club of evil see if after their airtight plan somehow managed to fail. And the authorities are no doubt banging on your door any minute now, since Olive is in the custody of the guardians, and she will obviously spill all the beans. FBI, open up! You and your plans are done, whatever those were exactly, undone by pesky kids. Please. Show me mercy! This is Olive's fault! If you give me another chance, I'll kill her and every person in Lingard! Silence! What do you recommend? <laughs> Execution. Honestly thought you were going to get a second season? The utter smugness. After mucking up absolutely everything possible, you still believe that this pathetic sequel bait would buy you another round of this crap. One final insult to the audience, no reason to progress the core narrative in season 1, just wank around with your shit oses for dozen episodes, and save all that intrigue for season 2. No thanks, I think we are all quite done here. It feels surreal. I'm done. I'm actually done! Now, I don't see any reason for an overly long, overly indulgent epilogue. The hours upon hours of content speak for themselves. What I will do is give out an enormous thanks to each of you for sticking around for this long. The support, the comments, the likes, the conversation, it's made all of this worth the effort. And of course, a special thanks goes out to the supporters on Patreon. Thank you, Sir Saltsalot. Cyrus Karloff, Crazy Cat, Lone Red Soul, 
and Katobe. As well as an extra special thanks to my 10 euro supporters, Wyland, Jesaja Vanderwatt, and Six Stars. If any of you would like to join these fine people, or check out any of my other creative stuff, all the links are in the description. And... One last thing before I go. What comes next? Now that I'm done with this behemoth project. From the start, my main goal has been to extract some value from this colossal failure. For entertainment, naturally. But also to exemplify what not to do when crafting a story. And as a vehicle to talk about storytelling as a whole. It is important to understand why something works or doesn't work. Rather than just listing out flaws and praises. So, for next year, I'm gonna flip this around. And instead take a look at something actually enjoyable. And extract all the positive lessons I can find. Are we... still sisters? Nothing is ever going to change that. I'm going to break down the entirety of Arcane with the same format I used for High Guardian Spice. This is one of the most competent pop culture products we've had in recent years, so there is plenty of solid storycraft to discuss. Something to mention is that I am not a League player, so I'll be approaching this from pure storytelling angle, rather than adaptation standpoint. Also, to be clear, I am not aiming for blind kudos. It's a critique, same as with the Spice. If High Guardian Spice does everything wrong, then Arcane does everything mostly correct. One journey ends, another one begins. I hope you'll join me once more. That'll be my main project for the upcoming year. Maybe I'll work an extra thing or two into the mix, but we'll see. Anyway, until then, I'll end things as I always do. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.